Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in 10 minutes.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in five minutes.
Ladies and gentlemen, please silence all mobile devices. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage TechCrunch Editor-in-Chief, Matthew Panzerino. I'd pay all of you if I knew that's the response I would get. Welcome to uh, TechCrunch Disrupt, our European show for the year. Um, we're happy to be here in Berlin again. Uh, it's a wonderful city. We're actually super excited about the, the breadth of the show that we've got this year. Uh, we've got a, a wonderful set of uh, companies and interesting people from across a bunch of different sectors. So we think you'll be very pleased at the programming. Uh, today, some of the highlights, we're going to start off with Robo Race. You can see the car right over here. You should check this thing out. It's insane. Um, it's a, an automated uh, uh, vehicle that runs on AI and cameras and um, working together with pilots and, and AR and XR to do some really cool things. Um, later on, we've got Marcus Villig from Taxify to talk about how they're expanding. Um, we have uh, Via as well, uh, and then also Local Globe. Saul Klein will be here to talk to us uh, from Local Globe, so that's excellent. And then, of course, in the afternoon, we have our Battlefield session. So we spent a lot of time, months and months and months, uh, gathering some of the most amazing companies, young, uh, interesting, uh, completely fresh companies from Europe and from the surrounding area uh, that will get on stage. They'll be grilled by judges, uh, and hopefully you'll get to see that process uh, as you would in the pitching room. Uh, and then we will choose some finalists, and tomorrow they'll battle it out for our grand prize. So thank you once again for being here. We're happy to have you. Uh, enjoy the show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage TechCrunch editor and Disrupt MC, Jordan Crook. Yo, what's up? How are we doing? So much energy. You guys win, by the way, today for being here at the start. So everyone who is currently seated in their seat, just go ahead and check underneath. There is a puppy under there for you. Thank you for that one laugh, front row. Appreciate it. Um, we've got a great show, like Matthew said, and he covered the highlights, so I'm not going to do that, but a couple housekeeping notes. There's going to be um, some next stage stuff and some extra programming all around, uh, so make sure you're paying attention to the agenda, and I'll be sure to call out some of the, the highlights that might not be happening on this stage so you know where to go. Um, another thing, if you want to participate in the conversation on social media, the best way to do that is to use the hashtag TCDisrupt. You can also tweet directly to me with any constructive compliments. I'll be sure to pass those along to the right people. And with that, let's just jump into the show. Please welcome to the stage from Robo Race, Lucas Degrassi and your moderator, Matt Burns. <laughs> Lucas, thanks for joining us. Good morning. Uh, I would have to say your picture on the screen is a lot more handsome than my picture. That's, <laughs> well, uh, I guess that, that depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, thanks, Anthony. So, Lucas, you're a race car driver. Why do you want driverless race cars? <laughs> That's the question they get me every time. Uh, what are you trying to do? You try to kill your own sport? Yeah, are, are you trying to kill your own sport? No, that's not true. What we're doing with RoboRace is basically try to integrate something which the automotive industry will take it, will, it will happen anyway. So autonomous cars, it will be cheaper, greener, safer. So, and all the money from motorsport 
comes from the automotive industry. So what we're trying to do is to anticipate the future mm -hmm. and keep motorsport relevant somehow when most of the cars are driverless in the future. Sure, well with cars, like the one we have over here, you brought one with you. With that, I think it's going to be relevant for a long time to come. That's a, that's a great looking car. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it took me quite a, a lot of work to put on British Airways uh, luggage compartment. <laughs> Did it? Um, the, that car is actually a, a real size version. It's the running car. That car has uh, four electric motors, has 1,000 horsepower, 1,000 kilos, goes over 300 kilometers per hour, and it's fully autonomous. So very clear, it's not remote controlled some, anyhow. It has LIDARs, GPS, camera, um, ultrasonic radars that by uh, understanding the road in front, mm -hmm. either by GPS or computer vision or a combination of both, make all the decisions and um, just drive like a race car driver. Well, that car will be available on the show floor so everybody can see it after the first break, but you brought a video with you. Exactly, so that, that car exactly, we did an event um, July this year. We set up the first ever record of an autonomous hill climb in Goodwood, England. Uh, and it was um, uh, the first ever autonomous car to do it without GPS, so purely based on computer vision um, and uh, path planning. And well, let's go ahead and roll that video. We'll, I will talk you through. So what, what are we looking at right here? So basically, this is the, the, the uphill uh, track. It's a very famous uh, ev motorsport event. It's a one mile and a half stretch through very complex uh, scenarios like walls, grass, and uh, basically you have to put the car on the start line, sure. press play, or let's say go, and the car has to do all the, the uphill by itself. And of course, in traditional motorsport, they compete against each other, see who does the best time in normal cars, and we were the first one to do that with an autonomous vehicle. That's great, but you have a second car now. Exactly. So let's what? roll the video for the second card <laughs> and you can explain what yes. we're looking at. Yeah. If maybe. So a Robo Race consists on, of two different vehicles. So we have a fully autonomous car, which is this one. And we have a car, which is this one on the video, which does exactly the same as this one, but also fits a driver inside. So we can feed the system with driver inputs and we can compare straight away a racing driver driving it or the car driving by itself. So this is the test we did uh, two months ago, uh, one month ago in Spain with uh, this uh, prototype bodywork. Actually, I was, I, I was comparing myself with the car to see uh, how good the system was. Are you faster than the car? That's what we call the, we're gonna call a singularity event when an autonomous uh, racing car is faster than any racing driver. So, uh, for example, I raced my whole career with Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel. We, are, we race go-karts, Formula 3, Formula mm -hmm. 1 together. Um, they are the best drivers of the world today. And we want to see a car which is quicker than them. So. Sure. Still, still we, are, we started the year, we were 20% slower. Mm -hmm. Now we are about 6% slower. So the car is catching up. The autonomous system is catching up. There's still a lot of work to do. But we think when the car reaches a level which is better than any human, this will create a huge impact in trust on people using autonomous vehicles on the roads. That's one of the purpose of RoboRace. You know, that's interesting that you've done all these races. You are a champion racer. People are fans of people. Yes. Will people be fans of autonomous systems? <laughs> so it, it, that's a very interesting question. We don't have the answer, although um, even uh, esports are not sports and they are hugely successful. So, what we are trying to do with RoboRace is combine human and computer for the first time in a sport. So, this car that you're seeing now, the image, um, this will be the races which start next year already, 
there will be a combination of drivers racing for the first part of the race, real drivers. Then in the pit stop, the driver jumps out of the car. And then in the second part of the race, the autonomous system takes over sure. and drives the car to the end. So it's, it's almost like a combination of the, the, the human uh, and the machine merging together, le learning from each other to combine a best result. So we want to create this, uh, imp the, not impression, but this reality that the human and the machine, they are, they are at the moment working together for a better outcome. How do you ensure to fans that the autonomous system is not rigged or pre-scripted? Um, there, are, there are many ways of doing it, but even if we would like to um, um, pre-program uh, pre already set data for the car to behave, uh, it will not be efficient, will not be quick. So we already have, uh, so even if you leave it open, people will not pre-program. We have to be um, a machine learning system that the car has to adapt, because for motorsport, the adaptation is very important to understand which line is the best, to understand mm -hmm. uh, what is the breaking point. So uh, pre-programmed, so pretty much every autonomous records you've seen on the internet, they are pre-programmed data. So you have a driver driving around the track, you collect GPS points, you have a set amount of data, the car repeats that program. We are building, we want to build a platform that is uh, self-improving. So using neural, m neural networks, machine learning, to make the car um, behave as a human, uh, learning from inputs and developing better software as it uh, collects more data. One of the things that's obvious is that the human life is going to be put at less of a risk with, with this system, right? Yes. So with, with that, you have people enjoy watching stories, right? And there's going to be less crashes involved. People remember when there's crashes. Like when yes. you crashed your, your Audi R8 in that 2017 race. And I would love to ask you, tell, me, tell us that story. <laughs> what <laughs> happened in that race? So yeah, um, crashes are a big part of motorsport. Of course, we try to avoid it, try to make motorsport safer and safer all the time. But um, motorsport is dangerous. I had mm -hmm. many crashes in my career. Uh, I flipped over, I got uh, knocked out in a couple of crashes. I, uh, I never hurt myself, thankfully, but um, uh, I had a, pretty al a lot of crashes. But with autonomous systems, we, we can take, if we take the human factor out, you can even push technology further. So imagine that you're developing a tire that needs to go to 400 kilometers per hour. It's difficult with a human inside because if the tire is blown away, you're going to have a massive crash and put the life of the driver at risk. Without, with autonomous cars, if there is a huge crash, mm -hmm. okay, there is, will be a lot of uh, material damage, but not any lo loss of lives. So you could imagine a, a different entertainment experience that has never thought of in motorsport. So we could imagine like an eight-figure race that the car has to communicate and cross each other at 300 kilometers per hour in the future without the necessity of putting human lives in danger. What data do you have that shows that people want to have that entertainment? We don't. We don't know. So uh, I, I, I have to ask you, how much runway do you have in this program before sponsors or funding pulls out? We have um, uh, um, the, the business model of RoboRace is, is based on R&D, is not based on entertainment. Of course, we're going to try to engage. We're going to try to get uh, different forms of engagement. This new generation, they don't want to watch. Even motorsport is declining a lot. They don't want to watch. They want to right. interact. So we are, have already planned augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, well, mixed reality sure. overall uh, to be implemented in the race. So we see, for example, uh, we are working towards this path that people in the standings, they could throw uh, augmented reality objects into the track that the car needs to avoid. Right. So you can throw like uh, orbs or I don't know, you can be even a person walking in the track controlling sure. and the car needs to race and at the same time avoid. So we think this interaction is very important. Plus, we are creating an open source platform uh, in virtual reality. So we're creating a virtual twin of the car um, that you can download the software for free, the stack. You can run the race uh, you can download the track, you can download the model of the car, you can run it on simulated environments, 
and the winner of these races in simulated environments will, give, will be given access to the car uh, for free in our open source program. So it, we that, want to create an open source stack. Sure, that's interesting. But what you said at the beginning about the customer is interesting. A lot of these people out here are startup founders and acquiring customers yes. is a challenge. Who is your customer in this situation? Is it autom automakers yes. or, or fans? Uh, at this stage, automakers. So pretty much the whole ecosystem. Because autonomous cars, they are uh, a combination of a lot of different uh, technology segments, like robotics, mm -hmm. like data connectivity, like uh, sensors, electric motors, batteries. You have pretty much the automotive ecosystem plus everything else. Sure. So our customers now are uh, sensor uh, Processing company, processing processors companies like right. Nvidia, Qualcomm, Intel. Uh, um, are they partners? Qualcomm, Intel, and Nvidia? Nvidia was Nvidia is our partner. We okay. are using uh, Nvidia inside the car right now. Of course, we're looking for different partners. We even want to see different teams with different types of uh, hardware, in terms of processing power and competing to see which one is the most efficient one. Sure. So, for these companies, for sensor companies like uh, Sony with computer vision cameras. Um, even for automotive segment, tires, right. smart tires, um, electric motors, batteries. So there is a huge potential, um, actually bigger than motorsport, much bigger than motorsport, in to, to develop technologies for the autonomous driving segment. How many automakers have you signed up as partners? How At many? the moment, none. Okay. They are all afraid. Why are they afraid? The automakers are afraid because the software is not ready. Are they so afraid they, they because the software is not ready or because they don't have the money to invest into uh, racing? Money, money is not a problem. I the amount know. of investment in, in autonomous driving segment is huge. Sure. And our le uh, we made sure that we got a very comprehensive total cost of operations. So we are much cheaper to operate than any autonomous uh, developing systems that there is in the market. But they are afraid that first um, the software's they haven't been developed to, to reach the level of uh, racing cars. So they all, most of the autonomous, uh, autonomous car industry goes up to um, 50, 60 kilometers per hour. It's made for dense urban environments, which is where autonomous will go first. Um, so um, the, nobody's using um, the uh, high precision vehicle model like drifting or sliding. And these situations will be very real when you have snow or ice on the track. So there is a whole different segment that we can develop faster through competition and in a controlled environment. So even crashes will never cause a, well, we hope crashes will never cause sure. a fatality. So a lot of automakers and tech companies already have extensive R&D facilities for autonomous vehicles. Yes. What is your sales pitch to these companies to come develop on your platform? First, to compete against each other, so you develop the technology first or faster. Uh, second, you create the exposure and the trust, like we discussed in the beginning. So if people are watching the car going at 300 kilometers per hour in a very, very precise way and fighting each other on track, this will give trust to people to jump in an autonomous taxi in the future. They did a research re very recently, and most of the people, even if the technology is ready, they will not jump in an autonomous taxi or put their kids. We think with RoboRace, you can help to create this trust Okay. Um, and these uh, technologies that are not developed in the, in the normal um, commercial roads, we can develop on the, on the racetracks. So vague, very precise vehicle controls, very precise sensors, um, very fast acting uh, systems, and for example, ABS, torque vectoring, all the vehicle controls, these are not being developed for the autonomous industry. There, there's a lot of companies out there doing autonomous vehicles. Yes. And in fact, yesterday, Amazon announced an autonomous vehicle program that you can buy into. Yes, yes, right. a, small, a small car, yes. Sure, so, but their car is $400, and they, they have a lot of the same capabilities that you do, not the high speed. Yeah, we, our car is a little bit more expensive. It's just over a million. Right, so that's the question. Why would somebody spend a million dollars on there when they can do it $400 through Amazon? <laughs> well, they can, they can have the, the Amazon, no problem. It's, of course, a completely different segment. Again, we are not developing the software ourselves. Yeah? We, of course, we are developing the base layer sure. because nobody has ever done that. So we needed to create the chicken so the chicken couldn't put an egg. 
Right. Yeah. There was this uh, nobody who ever developed an autonomous racing car, so we have to do everything. But we don't want to develop and own the IP of the of the software. We want companies and engineers and universities to join us use our platform as a base development tool and then develop their own IP from there onwards. So all these companies that are investing hundreds of millions of dollars, they can come to RoboRace and further develop their software and keep their own IP. We are not the, the we, are an, we are an event uh, producer for autonomous. We, are not, we, are, we, we had to develop the technology, but sure. long term, we want the teams to own the technology. Lucas, you're really passionate about this. But you're a race car driver. What makes you right to run a tech company? Um, it doesn't. Um, the well, it's a serious question. The Here, here's the follow-up, right? A lot of these companies out here have passionate founders. When does it make sense for a company to keep a passionate founder on as a CEO rather than hiring an MBA? That's a, a, that's a good question. Actually, we should have asked Dennis. Dennis uh, Zverdlov is the founder of RoboRace, is not me. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the idea, and he has the cash to support RoboRace, so he's funding it himself, the company. The company, uh, he basically threw, the, uh, threw a big fund um, that invested in RoboRace, but he's the genius behind it. Um, and I was his advisor for a year. Sure. Um, and then he decided to, uh, to give me this role as a, a CEO to further develop into the automotive industry. Um, and I don't have the qualities of uh, yet of a full-run CEO. We are a small startup. I have a lot of good people around me that can support me in the decisions and can support me on the anything from financial planning, marketing, everything. So I think the important is, that, of course, the, the long-term vision and the idea is mine, especially to adapt the driver, to develop the car in this way, to cut costs, to do this and that. But without a team around me, I would not be able to run the company by myself. When are you going to run for the presidency of the FIA? <laughs> um, not soon, I guess. Uh, I'm not in this position yet. What, what um, if global race fails? Do you think that would diminish your chance to be the president? Um, to be honest, I haven't thought about global race failing yet. Um, if global race fails, for me, it has been an incredible journey so far. But I think that the at the moment, the way things are going for RoboRace, the chance of fail is, I think, below 20, 15 percent. We have every week that we that goes through, more people are joining, more people are interested. They want to see what's happening. The sure. OEMs are calling us. The big companies are calling us to to discuss how they can do a partnership. So I think RoboRace, if RoboRace does not succeed, is not because the idea is wrong, but because our uh, management of the companies was not correct. So or maybe the timing was not correct. So it would be your fault. So it would be my fault, yeah, of course. Right. Uh, but I take the risks. I think it's important that we, we see a future that is common not only in our vision, in the industry vision, that the future is autonomous, the future is electric. This technology, if we help anyhow the industry to push autonomous cars forward, we're going to be saving lives. We're gonna make we're gonna make the transporting cities safer, cheaper for everyone. So it's worth trying. Um, we have a crazy guy behind it, which is Dennis, um, putting all his efforts, all his ideas, and all uh, and also his passion behind the, the company. We have a great team. So we truly believe we can really help the automotive segment and motorsport at the same time. When's your first race? The first race would be um, uh, around April, May, 2019 with the car that you saw that has the driver inside, which is called DevBot, uh, DevBot 2.0. And uh, we expect uh, a new tool to be called Season Alpha because it's a preliminary way of putting sure. Robo Race into the market. We're going to start small. We're going to start with a controlled environment, controlled races, and the tendency is to grow. Every year we have a, a plan to grow up to 12 teams uh, in the future uh, and have a proper series. What I mean a proper series like uh, we would like to have OEMs, right. uh, big companies, uh, putting a lot of resources in 2021. How long has doesn't Dennis given you to get the partners, to get that proper series in place? Dennis is uh, it's even more crazy than I am. So he's, uh, he's a true visionary. Uh, RoboRace is part of a, a bigger picture of R&D. So even if RoboRace does not succeed, all the technology that we developed to create this program 
was already worth the investment. Right. And I appreciate you sticking around. You're going to do a question and answer session as well. And yes, we do later on a Q&A. Right. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thanks, guys. That was great. Uh, yeah, like they said, at 11.30, Lucas is going to be taking questions uh, from you guys, so you can go ahead and check that out. Uh, let's see. We also have Otter AI uh, in the house today. Anybody familiar? The TechCrunch staff. That's fantastic. Um, Otter AI is a real-time transcription service. So if you go to otter.ai slash disrupt Berlin, you can get transcripts of all the panels. It's happening in real time, super exciting. And with that, we will hop into our next panel. Please welcome to the stage from the Ready School of Digital Integration, Anne Care Ricard, and from Not A Column, Aline Sarah, and your moderator, Mike Butcher. Good morning, everybody. How are you getting on? You OK? <laughs> Hello, Berlin. Right. We're going to get into this. Um, it's, uh, over the last few years, we're all very familiar with uh, what has been described as the refugee crisis. I think of it more like a, an opportunity to really to, to engage and create <coughs> fantastic new stories around um, integration and technology. Um, and we have two fantastic guests here who are really right in the epicenter of this story. Aline Sara from uh, Natakalam. Um, we'll hear about that in a moment. Teaching refugees, uh, sorry, allowing refugees to work remotely. And uh, uh, N. K. Reichardt, who is with Ready School of Information, uh, of, of Integration, sorry, uh, with, uh, in Berlin. Um, let's hear a little bit, first of all, your founding stories, because I know that that you both have really fascinating stories about how you created uh, what you're working on. Um, and, uh, and sorry, let's hear yours first, because you were really in Berlin during that crucial moment in uh, 2015, really, I guess. Was it 2015? When things really started to kick off with the refugee crisis in Europe. So. Two generations ago, my family had to leave Germany because they were pacifists and had a printing business. And I grew up with a legacy of hearing that you have to stand up for what you believe in, the values that you have. So in 2015, when I saw that there was a lot of young people coming to Germany, I had to ask myself the question, what do I do now? Mm. And I thought, let's gather all the stakeholders um, we did a big brainstorming, took a critical look around the room and realized that there's no refugees here. Who are we to think that we know what they actually need? So we started going out into refugee camps, having conversation with the people who had arrived. And that's how I met Mohammed, who was a programmer, who was telling me that he was going to the local library, trying to teach himself how to code. And that for me was when the penny dropped and it's like, wow, we can create a win-win here. The German industry desperately needs um, programmers. There's 55,000 available jobs in Germany right now in the IT sector. On the other hand side, refugees need jobs. They need the dignity that comes with earning your own money. And voila, that became Ready School. Fantastic. And, and the, the initial, initial idea was to teach refugees to code, correct? Correct. And uh, how is it? Um, evolved since then, briefly? So we did a number of pilot projects to really test out does this idea actually work. Um, we then started in February 2016. Two weeks after founding, we had Mark Zuckerberg come and visit the school, so that was very nice. Mm -hmm. Definitely helped us a lot. Um, and now, th almost three years later, we have grown and we are 500 students, 250 volunteers, and some amazing companies who are supporting us. So yeah, more than 10x growth in three years. Amazing. Fantastic. I think it deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Aline, Aline, your uh, story is equally in fascinating in the sense that you were a journalist during the Arab Spring, weren't you? Yes. Yep. In, in uh, Lebanon? In Beirut. In yep. Beirut. I was based in, in Lebanon. So I, I'm originally Lebanese, born and raised in New York. 
uh, with a background mostly in human rights, uh, conflict resolution, and journalism. And so, you know, we hear about the refugee crisis in, in Europe, but actually the truth is that 80% of refugees are located in developing countries, and Lebanon is the country with the highest density of refugees in the world. So we hear about a million, a million and a half refugees in Germany. There's about that same amount in Lebanon, and, and we're a country of four million. So one out of four people is a Syrian refugee. And also what we don't realize is that these refugees who've just immediately crossed borders from the conflict zones, they're actually not given work permits. So they really don't have an opportunity to see a future and, and restart their lives. So um, the idea with Netakellam, which means we speak in Arabic, um, is to actually leverage the freelance economy and this concept of digital nomadism for refugees, because they're, they're forced digital nomads. And so if they can't get hired locally mm. through the freelance economy, we hire them as online tutors and translators. So, Mike, if you wanted to work on your Arabic, you could sign up to Natakalam, and we'd connect you with a, a, a refugee language partner. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's a really crucial point, isn't it? Because refugees, generally speaking, globally, are not allowed to actually work, aren't they? Well, uh, uh, and what is the situation in Germany for refugees? Actually, Can they really, work? It, it has changed a lot here. So in 2015, when you arrived as an asylum seeker, you were not allowed to work before you would be, become a refugee. But that has actually changed now. And I think that's amazing that the German government actually listened. So now you can work in Germany after just three months if you're able to find a job yourself. It takes a little bit of convincing sometimes at the job centers, but it is possible. And I think it's amazing that the German government actually made this work. And have you, have you received sometimes that the, the whole issue has been quite controversial and political. Have you received pushback about um, you know, teaching refugees to code versus unemployed German citizens? We have, and I think that's important as well because it also keeps pushing us forward. So we are now starting to open up. We will also have Germans in the course. And then for us, that's super positive because integration means people who are locals, meeting people who are foreigners, actually talk together, work together, learn to live together. So yes, we started with only teaching refugees, but for now, let's get all the Germans in there as well who are also yeah. needing access to education and, and let's build the tech world together. So integrating underprivileged Germans who need to learn new high skills and refugees who want to work. What a, what a great story. I hope so, let's see. What a fantastic <laughs> story. Um, but also, there's, I think from a technology point of view, I think we're all fascinated about whether or not technology can do real things. And obviously, there are going to be fascinating individual stories. But often, especially on the TechCrunch stage, we're always talking about scaling and uh, how do we make these products and these solutions scale globally. I know uh, Netkalam has um, managed, obviously, to, to scale globally. But you originally came up with the concept of sort of matchmaking people who wanted to learn languages with refugees uh, and uh, you know, put them together. It's like a marketplace model. But now you're developing, you're actually developing a, a scalable platform to make that happen, originally using Skype and introductions, but now you're looking right. at a real platform, right? Yeah, so I mean, we are, our core team is actually more from the humanitarian sector. So yeah. we're really leveraging technology. Technology is an enabler in, in our context to actually connect humans, right? We're still very human about what we do. We're actually not entirely a marketplace. We do look at different aspects to match make people because. So there's quite a lot of curation. There is curation because our goal is actually um, more about impact. So we want to make sure that it's not just the same refugee. People will go click because they got five stars and keep going to the same one. We actually want to spread the opportunity. And our goal is to give refugees the equivalent of the minimum wage, uh, monthly minimum wage in mm -hmm. their host country. And yes, yeah, so I mean, we, we were advised by, by you know, people in the tech sector to do everything manually for now and really learn and use Skype and Google Forms, et cetera. But we're going to be launching a beta version of our platform, which will really enable us uh, to scale up. And, and so we, we started with Syrian refugees in the Middle East. Now we're working with Persian and Afghan refugees, um, Iranian and Afghan who are teaching Persian. And we most recently launched Spanish with Venezuelan refugees. So, yep. Well, obviously, yes, because Venezuela has its own crisis going on at the moment. Yep. And that's, uh, that's worth remembering. 
Um, I want to get onto actually that sort of more global issue in a, in a sec. Uh, and what, do you, what about you? I mean, um, you know, code schools have been around for a while. You aim specifically at refugees. But how do you make what you'll do scale? Um, do you move to other cities? Do you, how do you go, you know, scaling up? So we actually decided to have a nail it before you scale it strategy in the beginning and really make sure that we have the right business model before we scale something that is unsustainable. Um, so we're pretty good at saying no in the beginning and saying, you know, let's wait, let's make sure that we do this right and then we can scale it. But I think we're at that point now, we've received several quality certifications in Germany, very important. Um, and we have now scaled to Munich. We wanted to teach 50 students in the first year, and we've now almost gotten close to 250 students. So the model is scalable in 2019. If all goes well and we find the right partners, we'll also start in Hamburg as well. From there, the long-term vision is really to create a social franchise, let's call it that, and really see, can this be something that would work um, all around the world, probably starting in Europe. But we can see that we have people in Brazil, we have people in South Korea, we have people in Australia wanting to start ready schools there. I'm still holding off a little bit. I want to do it right. Um, but I think we'll see a lot more ready schools in the future. When you've, when you've both um, built out your, your, uh, your organizations, do you feel, is there sometimes a question about, do people say, is there something different about dealing with refugees versus the average citizen, I suppose. Um, it, do you have to tailor things, or are we talking basically the same thing, but just aimed in a different way? Well, I mean, you know, I think, uh, first of all, the, the word refugee is, is a bit limiting and, and sometimes destructive, right? Refugees are not a monolithic people. They're mm -hmm. refugees from all uh, classes and backgrounds. Um, so, you know, even when we talk about it, we try to be um, careful. And so I would say that, um, we treat refugees as, as, as normal individuals. I mean, they apply, they, sh they share their CV, they go through an interview process. What is important to realize is that they're just in kind of abnormal circumstances. It's not themselves who are different. It's just the circumstances in which they are living or what they've had to deal with. So mm. we try to focus on, on refugees who we know are cut off from the labor market to give them that opportunity. So. It's, it's an interesting balance, right? Because you don't also, you don't want to stigmatize them or, you know, y being a refugee is, is not a, a permanent status. It's not a socioeconomic status. It's, it's just circumstances that you're, you're dealing with. So it's, it's important to kind of keep that in mind. But, but yes, I mean, uh, the, the vast majority of people on the go, and, and today we're facing, you know, the largest, uh, you know, refugee crisis since World War II with over 65 million people who are forced to flee their homes. Um, and the vast majority, again, are, are, are struggling. They're waiting at border crossings. They're waiting in host countries to get resettled. And, you know, a, a, a terrifying fact is that only 1% of the global refugee population will get resettled to third countries like in Europe or in, in the U.S. and Canada where they can actually restart their lives legally. Otherwise, they're, they're mostly stuck at border crossings um, and, like, in countries that are just immediately fleeing the conflict zone. Yep. And, and uh, do you, have you found also that you have to tailor things in a certain way or that you're, you're just dealing, as uh, Aline says, with people in different circumstances? Well, we largely apply positive psychology and if you treat people like victims, they will start acting like victims. If you treat them as tech talent or if you treat them as, let's call it transformation experts, Transformation is a huge word. These are young, talented people who have been through major disruption in their life. And now they have to rebuild it. And the skills that they're getting now in their early 20s is building so incredible resilience that I think in the next five years, if they get the support that are necessary, we'll see them hopefully becoming startup entrepreneurs. They'll go into the tech industry and they'll think like, yeah, of course this business is changing, so what? Like, we're used to this, we can handle it, and I think this is really the kind of talent that the industry needs. And that makes me really excited. It also, when I'm having a shit day, like, I look at my students and say, okay, I can work a little bit harder because I know what they're going through. They're still smiling, they're still curious. Um, and that's super exciting. I, I want to uh, dig into this because you s mentioned, that, you know, that in a way we always, always have to flip that argument about uh, refugees into uh, talking about entrepreneurs. 
And I know that, for instance, that you uh, worked with a group that uh, became Bureau Crazy. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's a, a super exciting um, startup that came out of one of the first classes at Ready School. Um, we had a group of three students who were looking at what are the challenges I'm facing in my daily life in Berlin um, and wanted to create an application that would help. Um, and they realized German bureaucracy is incredibly hard to navigate when you come as an outsider. Um, so they wanted to create almost like an Amazon version um, of the German bureaucracy where you know exactly where are my papers at a certain given point in time and um, how long do I have to wait before my papers are through. Um, they, are, they haven't launched that. They keep telling me they're about to launch. Um, but it turns out the German bureaucracy is uh, way more bureaucratic than ev we ever thought. Um, there's a lot to, to change in e-governance in, in Germany, I would say. Um, but I think it's amazing the, the group has been contacted by many Germans who are also saying, hey, that app that you're developing for refugees, could you do something similar? Um, if you are unemployed in Germany, navigating the bureaucratic system is not easy either. And, and for us, it's all about the inspiration might come from the refugee community, but hopefully it's building solutions that is helping everyone and moving the needle forward. And Alina, um, sometimes we talk about um, platform-based businesses um, actually become creating entrepreneurs off the back of it. We, I think some of us are familiar with the story about how uh, Uber created such a platform that um, some Uber drivers became like mini Ubers in their own, own sense, you know, organizing teams themselves on the Uber platform. Have you found um, more entrepreneurially minded um, clients, I guess, uh, of your platform um, starting to build their own sort of language learning, that little language learning startups with Natakalam? We have a few of, of our tutors who also have their own little, um, you know, um, setup for, for teaching. Yeah. I would say um, what we really see is um, Netakelem is serving as a stepping stone for, for them to pursue other opportunities and other careers, which is really critical because um, there is a severe risk of losing such incredible human capital due to what's going on in these countries and, and these mm. young populations who really had their, their futures ahead of them. I mean, the Syrian population was highly educated. Mm -hmm. Uh, Syria pre-war had the highest literacy rate. It's in, something in that actually not people know about. Not a lot of people know about. Do well, they? unfortunately, the media and our political leaders aren't uh, being the, the best uh, spokespeople for the refugee community. So we're, we're talking about really, a, a, you know, educated middle class, absolutely large middle yeah. class society in yeah. Syria, and the whole thing just implodes. Absolutely, uh, and they're completely stuck and, and cut off, and they're discriminated against. Doctors, also. lawyers, professionals, yeah. developers, engineers, absolutely. startups, entrepreneurs. Yeah, and and they're like. Like us, you know, we had one of our students who wrote to us the other day and said he was amazed because he found out his, his Syrian language partner likes Pink Floyd. You know, so really part of what we feel is important in the work we do is also changing the narrative and, and raising awareness around who these displaced people are. So. I want to come back to something you said earlier about the sort of scale of the problem, 65 million refugees around, around the planet, and that number has tacked up in the last mm -hmm. few years. And you mentioned also uh, what's going on in Venezuela. So this is not just a Middle Eastern issue. It's not just, uh, it's also in Africa. It's mm -hmm. in South America. Um, there are other, you know, Asia as well, of course. Um, zooming out and thinking more big picture, um, we just had the White House report that came out recently uh, the White House apparently doing some research for a change um, about climate and climate change now obviously clearly impacting the world. We've seen the forest fires in, uh, in Northern California. Um, this is creating refugees in developed countries, let alone uh, emerging countries. Um, is there going to become a point where Refugee is really a much more common term than we think, and climate refugee is going to be a very, very common issue. And so, you know, some of the solutions that we're talking about aren't just being applied to, you know, war zones, but people all over the world. I mean, what are some of the technological ways that we can address these issues? I mean, you are obviously doing it right now. 
I mean, I think we are uh, in a, a scary time in history, and I, I think you know you can read all kinds of figures, but some some are estimating about another 200 million uh, refugees by you know I forget 2025 or something due to climate change. So. It is something we can't ignore, and I think what technology enables and the startup mindset, right? It's, you know, the humanitarian sector is broken. Um, the nonprofit sector, you know, so much time is spent fundraising rather than focusing on your work and your mission. And I, I think that personally, coming from more of the NGO background, what I've seen in the, in the tech sector and in the startup mindset is a lot more nimbleness and a lot more uh, kind of practicality in the mindset, jumping in and, and being more free and not um, kind of barred, because barred of freedom to, to move and change your plans because of four-year uh, funding plans that you might get in, in more traditional nonprofit sectors. Mm. So I think, you know, the startup mindset and the tech sector has a lot to offer, and it would be, it, it'd be great to really keep merging these two fields because the severity of the situation is, is so massive that we really do need innovation and we need a change in the mindset. Um, and of course, technology is what enables scalability. Mm. So, um, and what's your view on this? Well, I'm very excited that we this year launched a collaboration with Bundesblock and we're doing a blockchain course. And we're still experimenting to figure out how will this work out. Um, but for me, the whole blockchain, it, it's incredibly exciting. And, and what we are experimenting with is to try to understand when the people sitting in the classroom come from dictatorships and they eventually have to rebuild their countries. Who will rebuild it and how are we going to rebuild it? And I think it is true. We'll see a lot more climate refugees, internally displaced people in the future. And we have to think about economy and how do people have access to goods and I think blockchain is creating a lot of potential solutions so that for me is exciting I also think on the other hand side the whole issue about identity how do you prove that you are you and you have the skills when you had to leave everything behind maybe your university has been bombed you can't get the papers out so how do you prove that you can actually do some things and I think blockchain is one way that we can also help with identity Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, the phrase in tech is often, you know, skating to where the puck's going to be next, etc. I mean, how do we pr prep for these, these next waves, these next moments? What are the conversations that are happening at the highest levels about this kind of thing? I, I know that you deal a lot with uh, big, the big international agencies. What do they see happening in the future? Well, I, th I do think that the UN and other large uh, agencies are, are really looking to innovation and looking to the tech sector to kind of be able to foresee and pr prevent uh, more damage. I mean, I think we're in, in, a, in a moment of damage control, right? We've kind of crossed that threshold where cl climate change is irreversible right now. So, I mean, climate change is not my expertise, but I, I do believe that people are more in the preventative uh, and damage control stage. And, and I think that... I mean, of course, new technologies have a role to play. And I'd also say that technology isn't the solution on its own, right? It's always important right. to bring the human aspect in as well. And really, yeah. yeah. To co-create. Exactly, as it were. yes. Um, both of you, and beginning with you, what are, the, what are the things that you would like to get out of the technology community? I know that you're, uh, you need people to, to help and to get involved. Starting with you, what are the things that, that this community could bring to you, what you're doing? So really right now, we have two very concrete asks. Um, from January, we're looking for 150 mentors. So meaning that you would work for six months, only meeting once per month with one of our students to give them a little bit of advice on how to improve their career. So only six hours over six months. That's not really a lot, but it can change a life in, um, for a refugee here in Germany. So really do reach out. We're also looking for 150 internships for our students from June. So if you would like to have somebody in your company, you don't even have to pay for them. In the beginning, the German Job Center will pay. So yeah, reach out to us. We need mentors and we need internships. Anybody want to uh, get involved? Who wants to get involved Come with on. that? Let's, let's get some people. <laughs> okay. We've got some TechCrunch people down here. <laughs> Um, and how about you? What are you doing? You're building a platform. Yes, so, so we'll have a, a beta version of that, but um, with technology uh, changing so rapidly, we're already ready to, to, to change it and, and refresh it. So we are looking for um, tech, 
companies or developers to support us. Uh, we consider that our strength is more on the humanitarian side of things, and, and we you know, want to collaborate. And um, you know, if, if you're looking to study a language, uh, check us out. And uh, also, we have programs in, in universities and, and classrooms where children are Skyping with refugees as well. And, and so we, we think that's really important to change the narrative because we can talk about wanting to help refugees because we're already, we know about it. But until we actually change the wider reputation of refugees and, and unfortunately, it, until we counter what you know, the political discourse is on refugees, it will be hard to rally up uh, the masses to work on this. So. And, and finally, just very, very quickly, <laughs> what some of the, what's, a, what's an example of a sort of the, one of those sort of life-changing moments that you've seen as a result of your, your work? Well, I think one of my students, Rami, who was the guy who's most well known for meeting Mark Zuckerberg and Angela Merkel, um, for me, he's just an amazing talent. And when we met him, he was sort of a little bit of a shy guy sitting in a corner. And now he has a full-time job. He's studying at TU Berlin, and he's running to e-commerce shops online. He's actually thinking about quitting his university just to become an e-commerce entrepreneur. Let's see about that. But mm. it just shows how, what incredible talent is there. And this guy's only 24. Like, imagine what he'll do in mm. 10 years. Aline? Well, I have 14 seconds left, so I'll give a, a quick story um, of, you know, just a really heartwarming story of when we had a session in a New York City, um, you know, uh, middle school with, uh, you know, f I guess it's fourth graders who had a session with one of their uh, language partners who's, who's a refugee in Iraq living in a camp who um, is stuck there. And really, we, we don't think she'll ever get resettled. And at the end of their one-hour classroom session, they decided to give their classroom gift, because in the US they do that, to a refugee uh, cause. So really just changing the mindset and um, you know, raising awareness at, at such a young age through this program that also gives an income to refugees. You know, we're, we're excited about that. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your stories today at uh, TechCrunch Disrupt Berlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You. <laughs>Thank you. How's everyone feeling? Quiet. Yeah? You guys don't find me funny. Is it like a language barrier or just me? We're getting there. All right. Thank you. Appreciate the pity laugh. Um, <laughs> all right. So let's, uh, let's get moving on to our next panel. Our next guest. Uh, is a little bit larger than life uh, here in the European tech scene, uh, was at Index Venture Partners, uh, was the mastermind behind uh, the global meetup concept Open Coffee and the uh, YC of Europe, which is uh, Seed Camp. And uh, we're going to bring him on stage to have a little chit chat. So with that, please welcome to the stage Saul Klein and your moderator, Connie Loizos. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, so, as Jordan said, Saul has been making an outsized impact on the uh, European tech scene for years as a founder, operator, investor, behind Seed Camp, the accelerator turned seed stage, behind uh, Open uh, Coffee, the global um, meetup concept. Um, today, I'm hoping to talk to you about a number of um, trends that are sort of impacting some of you founders here in the audience. Um, Brexit, of course, SoftBank's massive $100 billion vision fund, um, and even uh, tensions between US uh, and China, which Saul seems to think uh, could actually benefit some of you here, which I think is interesting. But before we get into that, Saul, since we do have an audience here of founders. I thought we could talk for a few minutes about your trajectory. Um, you sort of made your biggest mark as an investor, initially uh, at Index Ventures, where you spent many years. And then you decided to sort of spin out and do this um, seed stage fund with your father, Robin. Why do that? Why leave Index? Um, look, I mean, Index, I, I, think, I, I think Index is one of the great tech startups to come out of Europe in the last 20 years. A lot of people don't think of venture uh, as a business. They think of venture as you know, being just about the investing. And I think you know, the, the business that, that Neil 
uh, and you know the partnership at Index has built, uh, I think has been one of Europe's great entrepreneurial success stories. Um, and you know, I had an amazing time there. I was at Index for eight years. Um, you know, during that time, we raised, I think, four venture funds, three growth funds, one life science fund, um, some of the amazing new partners or newer partners at Index, like Jan Hammer, who led the uh, seed round of Robinhood and the Series A of, of Adyen, joined during that time. Martin, who uh, did the Series A of, uh, of Deliveroo, joined during that time. Uh, and, and I think you know, what I've observed, not just at Index, but also you know, when I co-founded Seedcamp with Reshma, is that you know, the entrepreneurial urge to sort of create businesses. I mean, it's an amazing thing to do in an operating sense. Uh, you know, I was a, a co-founder of Love Film, which was the Netflix of Europe. I was part of the senior team at Skype uh, before we sold to eBay. And there's a real rush, you know, being part of a, a fast-growing business. But I find, you know, the business of venture capital to be very entrepreneurial as well. And so, you know, when I had a chance to work with my dad, uh, you know, and we'd been working together on and off for around 15 years or so. He was a venture partner at Index. Um, when we had the chance to really do a couple of things, one, to focus on seed, mm -hmm. which, you know, I'm really passionate about, that sort of very early stages of business formation. Two, to sort of really direct our focus to the UK. 85% of local globes investing is in the UK, and we can talk about why I think that's economically rational, if you like. Uh, but you know, the chance to really start again with a blank piece of paper, take the learnings from Seedcam, take the learnings from Index, and you know, I think uh, at Index, you know, we were trying to always be students of the best venture funds in the world, the benchmarks, the sequoias of this world. And, you know, I, I just think venture is, is a business. And I think there's a lot still to do in venture. Uh, you mentioned that 85% of your investments are in the UK. I did want to ask, I, I realize Index is an amazing fund. I think it's had something like nine IPOs in the last year. 12 months, 12 months or so, yeah. Um, it, it does seem like the center of gravity has moved a little bit to the US. Do you, do you think that's true of the firm? At Index? Yeah, no. No, not at all. I mean, I, I would say, and you know, obviously I left Index three years ago, so I can't speak for the firm or I'm not on the inside track, but I think if you look at, at, the, at the partnership, you know, what happened is when, when Index opened up in San Francisco, there's no point going to San Francisco and dipping your toe in the water. So, you know, Index uh, launched in San Francisco with two amazing partners, with Danny Reimer, Mike Volpe, both of whom had spent a lot of their formative professional years in the Valley, backed up by some amazing sort of next generation partners like Shadul. And you, I mean, you know the Index office in San Francisco. It's like, it's a, it's a big office. You don't feel like Index is a tourist there. And if you look at the investments that Index has made in the US, and some of which have started to exit, like Sonos, like Zuora, like Arista, like Dropbox. You know, you can see that this is not, you know, a European fund in the valley. This is a fund that like holds its own in the valley. Absolutely. But at the same time, in Europe, you know, the Index franchise I think has continued to grow. So I'd say, you know, when Index launched in in the U.S., it was a startup. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's established in the US and it's established in Europe and there's real balance. And, you know, to the degree that, you know, uh, Danny, my old partner, he's now back in London. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, but you look at the London team and, you know, they're just amazing partners there. Neil this year had, uh, you know, Funding Circle IPO a year or two ago, you know, uh, Supercell was sold for eight billion, I think, you know, uh, uh, Farfetch, Just Eat, mm -hmm. Deliveroo, Adyen, I, I think, you know, it's <laughs> pretty balanced. <laughs> right, right, right. So would you say that it's been uh, easier or harder than you anticipated to get Local Globe off the ground? It seems from the outside that it's doing quite well, but... Well, I mean, Local Globe is sort of, 
it, on some level, it's three years, three, three and a bit years old, because my dad and I moved on from Index in May 2015. Mm -hmm. But you know, the local globe as, a, as an investor, as an angel investor, as a seed investor, is actually goes back to 2002. Um, and you know, we did our first kind of institutional fund in 2008. So it probably from the outside looks very new, but from the inside was you know, 15 years in the making. Sure. What is new in the last three years, obviously, is that you know, it's uh, now not me and my dad. You know, it's an investment team of eight, uh, which me and my dad are part of. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an operations team of four. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a fully fledged, you know, standalone fund, which isn't just about the two of us. It's really about the team and, you know, the role that we're trying to play in the UK marketplace. Sure, sure. Which is, again, seed stage startups. I did want to ask you, um, you know, when you're dealing with very um, new teams and first-time founders, there's not a lot to go on. I mean, obviously, a lot of venture capitalists rely on social proof. Someone introduces someone else to them who they respect. What else, what other tools do you have? I mean, are you, like, pouring over s social media feeds? <laughs> Look, I, I think, you know, we've been investing in, in seed stage companies for 15, 20 years now. We've made over 200 investments, you know, at Index. Uh, you know, we probably sat through 500 investment committees. We've been founders ourselves. I, I think, you know, something I believe very strongly is investors don't make businesses. Obviously, founders and teams make businesses. But, you know, the, the value uh, that investors can bring is a lot of pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, having seen a lot of different things. Now, it doesn't mean you're not wrong most of the time. But it does mean that I think you start to see and detect certain attributes that you say, you know, this is the kind of founder, this is the kind of team that may be capable of building a billion dollar or multi-billion dollar business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and again, you're wrong most of the time, but I think, you know, there are certain things that you, that you, that you look for. And one of the things we try and do as a team is really get under the skin of what those founder attributes are and what some of those team attributes are. And as we get to know teams better and then obviously make the initial investment, we really try and test and probe some of those areas. You've been involved with a lot of sort of the hottest startups here, TransferWise, Revolut. Um, do you think those companies could have been founded in the US by American founders? Or, uh, are there, is there a difference between the founders that you see here and the founders that you are? Well, I think the two examples you picked are sort of in the fintech financial services space. And, you know, we've been involved with Revolut, uh, sorry, with TransferWise since, since inception, although Revolut is not something we invested in. It's something that Seedcamp Seed was an investor in. So I know the Revolut story less well, but, you know, from a TransferWise perspective, Tarvitz was a former colleague of mine at Skype. He was employee number one at Skype. I mean, quite frankly, you know, you would have backed Tarvitz to sort of chop lettuce, <laughs> you know. But I, I think one of the things that both those companies have, have been able to do, and you see this with Funding Circle, you see this with, uh, with Adyen, you see this with a lot of European companies, is that FinTech is, is an area where I think, you know, Europe is a global leader, and I think it's an area where London and the UK is a global leader, partly because the regulatory environment is a lot more forgiving in the UK. In fact, the regulator in the UK, the FCA, has a regulatory sandbox. So if you want to build a blockchain business, you can do it in partnership with the regulator in their regulatory sandbox. I'm not aware you can do that anywhere else. So I think that combined with the fact that London, along with New York, is sort of one of the main centers of capital markets in the world and the financial services industry makes, makes it possible for these companies to get born in London and the UK or, or in, in Europe. The second thing is that, you know, while you can build a very big standalone business with the UK as your only market, and we've seen companies like Ocado, Rightmove, Zoopla, money supermarket build multi-billion dollar companies just in the UK. You know, most UK and European companies have to think international from day one. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, TransferWise has to think international from day one. Revolut does. And I think, you know, those are some, some things that um, European companies have that's because the U.S. market is so big in and of itself. You know, in the U.S. and China, you can get enormous just by focusing on your own market. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be international from day one. Although I think the thinking now everywhere is that you have to be international from day one. But obviously, you're a huge proponent of the U.K. You're talking about regulations, so let's talk about Brexit. Um, it seems inevitable at this point. You're leaving the block in March. Hopefully, I mean, not hopefully, but... Yeah, I don't know what... Um, inevitable changes from day to day, but right. th that's, that's what the calendar says. So who is impacted the most by this? Look, I, I think, you know, I'm, I, I'm, not, a, I'm not a student of, of politics or economics. I can just talk from the point of view of, of, of the uh, sort of the, the, the tech ecosystem and the data. So, you know, the Brexit vote was 23rd of June, 2016, I think it's etched in most of our memories. It was a big surprise on a personal level to, to most of us. Um, but the reality is, you know, when, when the vote happened, the clock started, mm -hmm. and startups need to think about what it, what it means for them. All of the research that's been done, and, you know, we did a, 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 a survey uh, over the summer um, with, with a lot of other people in the ecosystem. I think 9% of companies surveyed were thinking of moving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people so. weren't really going to change their behavior. Do you think that's because there's been so much uncertainty about whether this is going to happen? I uh, don't think so. I think, you know, because when you look at the fundamentals, you know, the UK uh, in 2016 had about three and a half, four billion dollars of venture capital. That was the year Brexit happened. The year after, it had about seven or eight billion. So it almost doubled or more. 2018 looks on track to be the same. So venture is a 10 to 12 year bet. Mm -hmm. So anyone investing in the UK in 2017, in 2018, had heard of Brexit. They'd priced that in, number one. Number two, there are 2.1 million people working in the digital sector in the UK. So, you know, access to talent is, is significant. 40% of Europe and Israel's unicorns come from the UK. So there's like a real wealth of, you know, scaled up successful companies, you know, that are, that are role models that people can recruit from. And then finally, seven out of 10 of Europe's top investors, and these are investors based on the number of unicorns they've invested in over the last 10 years, are UK-based. So I think if you look at where is the capital, where are the unicorns, where, are the t where is the talent, where are the developers? Mm -hmm. You know, Oxford and Cambridge are two of the five best universities in the world, not in Europe, in the world. You know, the UK is very, very strong. But when you talk about talent, a lot of that talent is, I'm assuming, coming from outside the UK. And it, obviously, part of Brexit is immigration is going to be sort of... Look, I think, I think you know, the Prime Minister uh, said pretty clearly last week that the way that the UK is thinking about immigration in the future is how do we get more highly skilled talents to the UK, not less. The UK is the first uh, country in the G8 mm -hmm. to have an entrepreneur's visa. Uh, we have a, a tier one exceptional talent visa. So if you're you know, a product manager in Mountain View and you don't like the fact that Donald Trump is running your country, um, you, know, you can get a visa to the UK to come and work for five years that's not tied to a company and that your spouse can work alongside you. So I, I think, you know, um, again, I can't comment, I don't feel qualified to comment on the broader kind of political uh, or sort of, you know, geopolitical situation, but when it comes to tech, um, you know, obviously Brexit will have an impact, but the fundamentals are so strong the role that tech plays within the UK economy is so fundamental and so uh, well supported, not just by this government, but all shades of the political spectrum that I think, you know, I'm 
very, very long on the UK. And, you know, obviously, while the relationship with the EU is fundamental, you know, as you mentioned, there are trading partners that aren't the EU mm. that are also important. Mm. You know, the US and China and India being just three. We're almost out of time suddenly, but I did want to ask you about SoftBank. Yeah. Uh, in part because you've benefited in part by the fact that it's entered onto the scene. You were an early investor in Improbable Worlds, which raised 500 million from SoftBank last year. Um, when we were talking um, backstage, you were mentioning that, you know, so you've got Improbable Worlds, which raised this huge fund, and you can sort of compared it to DeepMind, which so sold to Google for roughly the same amount. And you said, look, you know, Improbable Worlds still owns its company. It's got so much farther to go. Um, I don't know if the things are s quite so binary. I'm just wondering, you know, what do you think of this sort of broader trend of companies raising so much more money and not going public? I mean, you've b been a beneficiary as well of lots of companies that have gone public and haven't needed to raise billions of dollars before um, getting out to do that. So what do you think of sort of the implications here? Look, I, th I think it depends on what you're trying to do as a business. But if you're trying to do what DeepMind is and was trying to do, which is to sort of create a platform for general purpose artificial intelligence. That's not like a two year sort of, you know, CAC to LTV smiling cohorts kind of job. That's like, we may not even have a product for five years. Mm -hmm. In fact, our product is to build a platform that beats, you know, a South Korean Go player. You know, what VC is gonna give that half a billion dollars five years ago? I think what's really interesting about the Vision Fund is that all of a sudden in the last two or three years, founders who are trying to build transformational, long-term, deep tech um, businesses like DeepMind, you know, is, was, um, and how, and what Improbable is trying to do, all of a sudden have access to that kind of capital. Um, and I think what it means is, you know, instead of companies selling early because they don't have the, the fuel to spend 100 million a year that DeepMind would have had to spend on, on hosting and infrastructure, which you know, Google has that in spades, all of a sudden you, know, you can have long-term, you know, no pun intended, visionary investors who say, okay, I see what you're trying to do here. Maybe it's gonna work, maybe it's not gonna work, but if it's gonna work, this could be the next oracle and I'm prepared to take a half a billion dollar bet because this could be a $300 billion company. Right. Can I ask, did you sell into that round? Into the SoftBank round? Yes. No. Okay. Is that, I'm just wondering if that's happening here, people selling into secondary. I think it's possible, but you know, when I met Herman mm -hmm. uh, at, at the seed round, you know, you know, whether I was crazy or not, I believe he is trying to build a $300 billion company. And you know, when he said to me, you know, we're gonna do this round with SoftBank and here's how much uh, they're gonna invest and here's what the valuation is gonna be and I still think I can do 100X from now, I believe him. That's great, that takes a lot of uh, fortitude <laughs> to turn down something like that. In any case, Saul, thank you so much, we're out of time, but I really loved sitting with you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you guys. Okay, we are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we are going to get to our first flight of the startup battlefield. Please be back in your seats by 10.45. See you soon. Tell me about NEMA, it's a peanut sensor. How yeah. did you land on this idea? Yeah, so this is a portable sensor that detects peanut in your food. You can carry it with you anywhere you go. It's really accessible. Um, started off with gluten. Uh, or, yeah, I have had a lot, bunch of food sensitivities, allergies, thought it was really hard to eat outside of the home. I wanted to empower people with one extra data point before they're about to take the bite. So gluten's been on the market for about a year and now we have peanut. And what's the, the science behind it? How does it detect? if there's a peanut in the food? So it's a chemistry-based test, and what you do is you have a one-time use capsule. 
Okay. You put a sample of food in the capsule and then put the capsule in the sensor. And then you wait a few minutes and then it'll tell you if that sample contains a very trace amount of peanut. And how accurate is this? So the accuracy, we've done a lot of internal and third party lab testing, which will all be available when we launch. Um, we found that if there's a, a trace amount, 10 parts per million of peanut in that sample, we have a 98.8% chance of picking it up with the device. So yeah, as I mentioned, I'm deathly allergic to nuts. It's like been a whole thing my entire life. Yeah. And oftentimes I'll read labels, you know, on the back of the labels say like, may contain traces right. of peanuts. Do you think um, Nemo would be able to pick up those traces if they are in there? In one of our beta testing that we did, you know, with the peanut sensor, we found a lot of people were testing those packaged foods with mm -hmm. that mislabeled or unclear labeling. Yeah, right. And they did, they were able to pick it up in some of the the samples. It totally depends on the sample you're putting in. So if you're not going to, it's not going to obviously guarantee that everything you're about to eat is going to be peanut free, but at least it gives you that one additional data point. So the point is, if there's 10 parts per million in that sample, there's a re really, really good chance, close to 99% that we're going to pick mm -hmm. it up. So it's a connected device. Um, okay. So it's Bluetooth connected on your phone. You can actually record what you tested, where you tested, whether it's a packaged food or restaurant food, so you can mm -hmm. get access to this huge community of other NEMA users that are testing all the time. Okay, so, so are you saying that maybe if I'm at a restaurant, I might, there's a, there's a NEMA app? Yes. So I might open the app and then see, oh, someone tested this dish exactly. like, last week or something? Yeah, someone tested this dish, it seemed okay, it seemed to check out. We find most people want to test themselves anyways just to be yeah, sure. You never, you never know, know what know would happen. Conditions yeah. could change in the, in the kitchen. Exactly. We see a lot of people using it for packaged foods too. So they go to Trader Joe's. A lot of people have tested a ton of packaged foods at Trader Joe's mm -hmm. um, and use that to make a more informed purchasing decision. Nice. This is awesome. Well, yeah, can we, uh, can we get a demo? Definitely, yeah. So what you do is you have like this sample of food. Okay. Um, you take a little, you know, pea size amount here. Yeah. So really, really small amount. Okay. Um, put it in here, this is a capsule, and then the action of closing the capsule grinds the food, mm. and then you close it all the way, and you hear that pop, that sort of initiates the chemistry in there. Okay. Test strip right here is coated with these antibodies, um, so we base, there's a whole little lab in here. Okay. You pop that right in here, you turn it on, I'm gonna just turn it on there, and then you should start to hear it processing, it testing should say for testing peanut. for yeah. peanut, yeah. And then it's okay. gonna start processing and starting to make a little bit of a noise, that noise is basically mixing, and then you'll hear some mechanical action, and it's, evalu it's basically releasing the sample to the test strip, and then we're gonna see whether or not that sample contains peanut. Okay, All right. cool. And it takes about, it takes less than five minutes, but yeah. Yeah, if, if, it's, if there's no peanut, it takes longer. If peanut's there, it'll, it'll detect it faster. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh. <gasps> Wow, we've never Granted, tested they that. They did say there's probably a million nuts in here. And actually, I should mention, I, I <laughs> they did say, and I didn't. I also had some, you know, nuts potential on your remnants, hands. so that yeah. could have pick, been picked. Right. But it's super sensitive. And then, how much does this cost? So the sensor itself is uh, two twenty nine, okay. and the capsules, if you subscribe, they come out to about five dollars per capsule. So when can I get this? This year. This year. Yeah. Okay. It's coming out soon. Cool. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I, I think this could be yeah, this could be really awesome to use. Awesome. Cool. Thanks cool. for coming in. Thank you. Oh my God! Look at that sausage. It looks so good. Covered with onion, jalapeno, cheese, and a pickle on top. Mm. <laughs> but guess what? These dogs are 100% vegan. Vegan? All right. There are 7.3 billion people in this world, and that number is projected to jump to 9.7 billion by 2050. How are we gonna feed all these people? Is a question a lot of smart folks are starting to ask. Good? All right, don't be nervous. <laughs> so tell me, what is the problem that Beyond Meat is trying to solve? Human health, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, climate change, natural resource use, things like how much water we use, and then animal welfare. 
all four of those things converge around the protein choice that you make at the center of the plate. You know, if you make a choice to put plant-based source of meat at the center of the plate, you can affect all those positively. This is an alternative meat. It's not created the traditional way that most meat is created, right. from what my mom told me. How is Beyond Sausage created? So we start at the same place that animal protein starts, and that's in the field. So we're basically planting legumes. So we then separate the protein from the fiber, take the protein, apply heating, cooling, and pressure to the proteins. And that restitches the protein in the form of muscle. I mean, creating the texture of meat, that process seems kind of insane. It's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Because when I eat like a, a burger, yeah. a hot dog, you know, a steak, like I know what I'm getting. That's the one. We want to get to the final goal, which is to perfectly replicate animal protein, but do it with, with plants. So the whole emphasis is on continual improvement, and texture is a big one, right? Because when you bite into a piece of meat, you just know what it is when you have it. We've been consuming it for you know, three million years prior to the point where we're, we're, we're actually homo sapiens, right? It's a very intimate thing, and that texture has to be exactly right. And you know, to be honest, well, we're really close. We're not exactly there yet, right? And, and so we have some room we have to, to go, but I don't see any material obstacles to getting it there. Oh, yeah. Since working with Beyond Meat, how's the customer response been? We sold out. We're getting more in today, fortunately. I guess it tells me that people have been waiting for this product to come out. Hey, can we do a quick test? One of our crew members, the worst eater I've ever met in my life, only eats like cheese pizza, bland taste buds, right? Joe, he's right behind the camera. Could we do like a little blind taste test of just regular meat and beyond meat? Taste all right, all right, so you have two meats here. Okay. It's probably the meat one. <laughs> all right, now try that one. It's also really good. The flavor is like very similar actually. The texture is a little bit softer, but they're definitely comparable. Yeah. And I agree with you. It does it does feel a little bit softer. Uh, the the veggie the beyond meat. I'm not even called veggie. It's still really good though. But it's I really mean, good. Yeah, I hate most like vegan, you know, vegetarian options, but it's good. Now talking about the meat industry, I read that you guys actually have like a big player as an investor. You have yeah. like Tyson yeah. Meat yeah. Foods, Tyson foods yeah. as as an investor. Yeah. How is it having? Are they considered a competitor to you? Uh, how is yeah. it having them as an investor? What's happening now with the meat industry is some of the more forward-thinking companies are investing in this space because you know, they're trying to serve protein to the world sustainably. And I think I believe Tyson in that mission. Right? They want to do it sustainably. Um, they see this as a path to doing that, and they've been actually an amazing partner. Um, oh. Yeah, it, it was not a popular uh, move, I think, on either side. I think they got a lot of flack from their shareholder base, and we got a lot of flack from our consumers. But it was the right thing to do. I mean, they touched two out of five plates in the United States. So if we can impact that, that's a pretty neat thing. But you're creating it in a lab, or wherever you're creating it. And the health industry says to avoid processed foods. Yeah. Is this considered a processed yeah. food to avoid? It's a terrific question. and so. The way I think about it is a tale of two processes. While there is a process step to this, I wouldn't say that it's processed in the same way that, for example, processed meat is. We have this unique challenge, which is to use science to try to accomplish the goal we want to accomplish, which is to enable people to continue to eat what they love, places like this, right? But to do it in a way that maybe is less harmful to their body and the earth, et cetera. The red that you see in our products, that's not some crazy chemical, it's beet juice. You know, uh, if we need to make it a little bit darker, we don't go find some artificial flavor, or, or, or colorant rather, we uh, you know, use purple carrot. You know, so we're very careful to try to use things that people understand. So what did we learn today? Two things. Joe still hates vegetables, but he enjoyed Beyond Sausage. Let me tell you, it's pretty tasty. And second of all, with over $250 million in disclosed investments in the alternative meat space, I mean, this thing is huge, and you're going to see a lot more different companies entering the space and creating alternative meats. Uh, alternative ribeye, anybody? All right, so I hope you enjoyed that. Hit that like or love button, and see you next time. All right, so what did we learn today? <laughs> Investment category. <laughs> but he enjoyed Beyond Meat, the Beyond Sausage. One more.
I am excited for exoskeletons to become ubiquitous. Think of the first mobile phone, the brick with the cord and the heavy battery you carried. In 10 years, the exoskeletons are gonna be analogous to the smartphone today. One of the things that distinguishes Exo from all the other exoskeleton companies is we know how to wrap a robot around a human and we do it better than anybody else. Originally, the company was about helping soldiers carry heavy weight in the field. One of the founder's brother, it was a Navy SEAL, injured himself, became a quadriplegic. That sort of pivoted, how do I build cool things for my brother? Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. ...to get up and walking again with that same technology and have then developed the business to where we are today with 300 patents issued around the world. I'm a physical therapist by degree and I've spent about 20 years in spinal cord injury rehab. And one of the main barriers is the, the strength deficit prevents them from even getting started walking often. The ExoGT helps provide the strength and then we're able to get them upright at a much earlier state than they would be able to do if they just waited for their natural recovery. Every assembly worker should have a vest. They're prone to injuries, lifting their arms up a million times a year. Why subject them to that injury when they don't need to? And you know what? All of that is happening very, very fast. Materials become lighter and stronger. We're going to benefit. Electronics and battery power is becoming better and better. Sensors and actuators are becoming smaller. Oh, and a big change, the cloud. To monitor device in real time, be able to scan the area where I'm walking, not have me trip over a root on the ground. All of that is going to benefit exoskeletons and make them ubiquitous. Since uh, the initial IVO announcement in 1999, it's been 20 years, and uh, a lot of technology have evolved, right? So sensors, actuators, robotics, and AI itself evolved so much. On top of that, there's the spread of wireless connectivity also create an environment where IVO can connect to the internet uh, perpetually. So all of that, IVO can really connect with the owner create the bond and uh, keep learning and developing its own uh, personality. Ivo can recognize up to 100 different faces, but also uh, the more you interact with someone, he remembers and he stores the information and uh, the more friendship he will form. Depending on the everyday interaction, each Ivo develops its own personality. I think Ivo could be a fun companion for anybody who is looking for, for companionship. It could be someone who really fascinated by AI and robotics too. This is a, a really showcase piece from Sony, what we can do with the latest technology. The pricing is $28.99 and it's the first uh, limited uh, edition specifically for the US market and it includes Ivo, a three-year AI cloud plan. Ivo's favorite toys like iBones and Pink Ball and the special dog tag. Available for sale in September and available to ship probably around holiday time frame.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage TechCrunch Senior Writer and your Battlefield host, Anthony Ha. Hello! Welcome to the first session of the Startup Battlefield. Now, if you're here at Disrupt, I assume you more or less know what Startup Battlefield is and, and how it works, but for those of you who don't, don't worry. I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know very, very quickly. So what you're gonna see over the course of three sessions today are 13 different startups taking the stage. They've been chosen from hundreds of different applications that we've received here at TechCrunch. They're gonna be presenting for six minutes each. Now there are a few things you should know about these presentations. First of all, these are companies that are probably launching the company itself or new products for the very first time. They've been writing, revising, and practicing constantly for the last few weeks, so they've really got it down. But they're gonna be live demos, which means that anything could happen here on stage, and they're gonna be really, really nervous. So my one favor that I ask of all of you is just that you be supportive. And when I say be supportive, I mean cheer really loudly. You don't have to do it now. I don't want you to get exhausted yet. We'll get there. Uh, but please just make the companies really excited to be here on stage and really glad they came out. After the presentations, there are going to be six minutes of Q&A with the expert judges. The judges can ask any questions they want. Um, it can get you know a little combative once in a while. But again, the point is, none of this has been cleared with the startups. Like Anything, once again, could happen. Now, after all the startups have presented, the judges are going to help us choose the finalists who will compete tomorrow. And what they're competing for is $50,000 and the Disrupt Cup. And that's all you need to know. So that means it's time to bring out our judges. First up, we have Bindi Korea, founder of the boutique advisory firm Bindi Ventures. She's passionate about connecting the dots between investors, founders, corporates, and governments. Yeah. That one right there? Yeah. <laughs> Next, we have Saul Klein, who you just saw on this stage. He's the founding partner at a new London seed fund, Local Globe. 
He was previously a partner at Index Ventures from 2007 to 2015. There you go. <laughs> Next, we have Simon Levine, co-founder and partner at London's Mosaic Ventures. He made early bets on Etsy and Squarespace. <laughs> Next, we have Antoine Nussbaum, partner and member of the founding team at Felix Capital. He sits on the boards of Travel Perk, Papier, Fritchie, Heach, and Urban Massage. And last but not least, we have Andreas Weisskamm, a managing director at Sapphire Ventures. He's a board director or observer at Currency Cloud, Iovation, Matillion, and others. So let's give it up for all of our judges. And that means it is time to bring out our first startup. That startup is Wireframe. Presenting for Wireframe are Jeremiah Alexander and Shai Lacombia. The web has revolutionized every aspect of our lives. And now, we can't imagine a world without it. But it wasn't always this way. You remember the web before designers, when only engineers could create for it? It wasn't until we built tools to empower design that we unlocked its potential, and we unleashed a wave of creativity that makes our lives so rich today. History tends to repeat itself. Augmented reality is the next wave. There are almost a billion AR devices in our pockets. But like the early web, they lack content, because only people with deep technical knowledge can design for them. At Wireframe, we're building tools to empower design and deliver the AR future. Berlin is home to some of the world's most iconic street art. Unfortunately, much of this is lost over time. But imagine a future where augmented reality allows us to see behind the current artwork on a wall, looking back in time to see how it's evolved. With Wireframe, we can start designing experiences like this today. Let's go to a live demo. In our web-based editor, we click to create a new object. We're going to create a 2D panel type, and we're going to give it a suitable name. We drag to reposition and resize, and we can also adjust these properties from our inspector. Next, we select an image to represent this panel. Now, the fun part. We bring it to life with interactions. We drag to create an interactive area on the bottom right corner of the timeline. And then we set up this interaction. So when the user focuses their gaze on that area, it's going to transform this panel into a new state, a state that we're going to call one year ago. Now, in that new state, what we're going to do is we're going to change that artwork for an older graphic. Let's add one more interaction. So we'll drag to create an interactive area on the bottom left corner of that timeline. And now, when the user focuses their gaze on that area, we're going to transform this image back to its original state. So we created this in our web-based editor. Let's see how this looks in AR. At any point, we can load up our mobile app and preview our creations. Our mobile app synchronizes with our web app in real time. It's using ARKit and ARCore for the surface detection. So our environment loads our, our visual here. And if we focus on the bottom right corner, we'll notice that that transforms to show us what that looked like one year ago. And now, if we focus on the bottom left corner, then it's going to transform it back to the current artwork on the wall. So in less than two minutes, we've created our first interactive AR prototype that allows us to look into the past. With Wireframe, AR design is as easy as web design. A responsive web-based editor allows you to create from your 27-inch desktop at work or your laptop at the coffee shop. And when you're ready to preview your creations, you can do so in real time on either our iOS or Android mobile apps. And our unique community focus means that users can experience 
learn from, and even remix the works of others. I started my career building tools for creators at Atari. I learned how to build products that people loved, running my own digital agency. And as a lead instructor for General Assembly, I learned how to simplify complex topics so that anyone could learn them. Let's talk about the competition. Developer tools like Unity or Sumerian are powerful, but require complex coding, making them unapproachable for designers. Camera platforms like Spark from Facebook or Lens Studio from Snap are dedicated to AR, but only if you're building for their closed platforms. XR drawing tools like Sketchbox or Moment are design focused, but require VR headsets. And then we have mobile apps like Aero from Adobe and Torch, which are more approachable, but designing exclusively on a small screen is just too clunky. Wireframe, by contrast, is a powerful tool dedicated to AR experience design without specialist equipment or clunky workflows. And we have a unique community focus as well. In less than two years, AR is going to be worth almost $100 billion. In fact, 88% of mid-market companies are already using some form of XR in their business. Our initial focus on the creator tools market gives us a TAM of over $500 million. <laughs> in a year, we've attracted almost 1,000 designers worldwide, leading creative agencies like Huge, and immediate giants like Comcast, as well as top education institutions like the School of Visual Arts in New York. Delivered software as a service will soon roll out per user monthly subscriptions as well as bespoke solutions for enterprise. So we used to design for paper, and then we designed for screens. Now it's time to design for reality. Go to wireframe.com to learn more. Thank you. All right, judges, who has questions? Surely the Squarespace investor must have a question. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a question, but I, I, I do have a question. Uh, can you tell us kind of, uh, you know, an archetypal use case, whether it's some of the design students, just if you can elaborate on some of the ideas that have already been built with the uh, early customers that you have? Yeah, absolutely. So it varies. It's quite ra ranged. Um, anything from looking at how you might provide customer support using AR, through to education tools. So um, we had a user who was looking at making a, an interactive educational storybook for their children. And so quite varied. I think what they all have in common is it's very experimental. And actually, that's where we're focusing our platform, is this is as much about ideation as it is about prototyping. So we're trying to be the place where AR's killer apps are conceived. Um, question around your go-to-market and the audience that you're targeting. Um, just can you tell me a little bit more about your go to market? It sounds like you said you mentioned 1,000 designers. So, what have you done to acquire those designers to date? What are you doing to scale that? And then, are you targeting designers in agencies and brands? Like, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, that whole plan, please? So, the great thing about that is we've not done anything so far. So, we've done no marketing. Um, I've written a couple of blog posts about what we're working on, and that's just attracted a lot of attention. Um, so we'll continue to do that. We're finding content marketing is working really well. There are a number of designers who are genuinely interested in what AR has to offer and are looking for easy ways to get into this. So that's proving very successful. In addition to that, we're looking at education partnerships where we deliver workshops. Um, so for instance, we're the only company delivering an AR prototyping workshop at South by Southwest. You mentioned Unity and some other potential competitors. What, do you, what would you say, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but if you double click on that, what would you say is your competitive advantage there? You said prototyping, but then at some point, would I have to integrate <coughs> with somebody like that? Or is your solution standalone? So we focused in on prototyping. So our app itself is actually built in Unity. 
So it's very easy, easy for us to plan a developer handover process, which is something we're working on at the moment, which would integrate very well into the developer workflow. So that is something that we're looking to support in the future. Um, go on. Uh, you, you, you just mentioned very briefly during your speech that you had a very specific play around community. Uh, can you elaborate on this? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we learned quite early on during our beta testing is that actually loads of people still don't know what's possible in AR. And so one of the most common questions I got asked is, well, what can I build in wireframe or what can we do with AR? And so the way that we interpreted that is that actually this is a problem that we need to solve together. It's a co-design problem. And so we took inspiration from platforms like GitHub, where developers can share their source code. Other people can remix, um, fork that and use it as a starting point for their own creations. And that's something that we've now integrated into Wireframe. Um, was, was I correct in seeing that you guys are based in Singapore? Oh, yes, so uh, so what, what, my question is like, how big's the team? Where are you based? And how much capital have you raised so far? And what do you think the next sort of capital raise looks like for you guys? So we're an incredibly lean team. So initially, it was just me. So I'm based in Singapore. I started working on this in October last year. Um, locked myself away and worked on it intensely, built the first version, and then Shai joined me in July. So we're actually remote at the moment. I'm based in Singapore. Shai's over in the UK. Um, the company is registered in the US. Um, we just graduated from a Techstars Accelerator program in partnership with Comcast over in Philadelphia. And that's the only um, outside investment that we've had to date. And where are you thinking of building the business? So I think we're flexible in that. We believe that it, remote has been working quite well. We've worked together in the past. For, we've known each other for six years and worked together on a number of projects. We have a strong network of other developers around the world who we've worked with. So actually, it'd be very easy for us to expand and build a strong team that was entirely remote. But if we need to focus in on a location, then we will. Who, who is your next strategic hire? Besides the two of you, who's next to fill that gap in the team? So excluding the technical hires, um, our next focus would be on a learning-focused um, content manager. So that's an area that we're finding is getting a lot of traction, and we really want to expand that offering. So I mentioned earlier how delivering workshops is proving to be one of our really interesting routes to market. And so having someone who focuses on learning and focuses on content. Is there a particular AR platform that you're targeting or kind of most suited, suited to? Because there are a number of competing ones that are emerging, and <coughs> not all of them are sort of open or the easiest to build for. Answer quickly. OK. Um, so we're focused, we're focused on mobile AR at right. this point. So leveraging Apple's uh, ARK SDK right. and Google's AR Core SDK. And so we expect that there's going to be huge innovation in mobile AR over the next couple of years. And we're looking to grow with that market. Super. Thank you. All right. One more round of applause for well Wireframe. <laughs> Let's bring out our next startup. That startup is Calypso. Presenting for Calypso are Georgios De Pastas and Georgios Calaris. <coughs> Hello. Canadian. I'm Georgios, and I love quizzes. So what do Facebook, Equifax, and Uber all have in common? Apart from containing even number of vowels, it's the recent data breaches. More than 150 million records were breached by Equifax. And these are records of people like you and me. More than 60% of companies have already got breached so it's no longer a question as to whether a company will be breached, but rather what the impact and the cost of this breach will be. Encryption is the most efficient measure, technical measure, in order to mitigate this cost. And that's also stipulated by a lot of organizations and by regulation like <laughs> GDPR. And that's why we started Calypso. Calypso is the first never decrypt cloud database system. The data storage remains encrypted at rest 
in transit and in memory at the database level. While the data is encrypted, someone can run queries without decrypting them, fetch them back to the application, and only there the data gets decrypted. The key remains uh, invisible to the storage server, and at the same time, no up changes are required. So imagine that you have your gold mine of data stored in a cave. Alibaba finds your secret phrase to it. Sesame Open, he says, walks in. But what he finds is just coal hiding this wealth of data. Because Calypso conceals the data from any database attack. Switch to demo. Here we're going to see a use case we have been running together with one of the top US banks. They're pulling together IoT data in order to run analytics on the cloud. So whatever you see on your screen is IoT data for particular incidents that contain sensitive transaction and customer information, all of them preloaded on AWS. Let's look now how any, anyone with the unauthorized user with root access to the database storage would view <coughs> the data right into the data storage, even if the data has at rest encryption. This is what you can see. So effectively, the data appears in plain. Now, what we're going to see is what happens with Calypso. Our Docker intercepts the data stream and encrypts the data before the storage. So any unauthorized user with access to this particular server would see this, which is actually rubbish, right? So anyone unauthorized, like cloud provider, any hacker, or even system admin cannot view the data. The interesting bit here, though, is that while the data is encrypted, someone can run SQL queries on top of them. So in this scenario, a data analyst wants to figure which category has the highest spend in terms of fraudulent activity. So what you can see here, for example, is that travel is this category. And most importantly, because we fired this new query, the data was dynamically re-encrypted. So we're going to go back. This is how the record looked like. So you can see the first three digits of zero, record zero, SK5. Now let's refresh. So after the query, it changed. So you can see how our solution actually re-encrypts the data. Switch back to the presentation, please. The question is, how do we do it? So at the lower level, we use uh, AES for individual record encryption. And on top of that, we combine Oblivious RAM, a cryptographic method, and differential privacy in order to ensure the secure and optimized way of indexing these encrypted records. This is a technology, a proprietary technology developed by my co-founder, co yet another Georgios. So yes, this is the most common name in Greece. But luckily enough, it wasn't just our names that brought us together. So my background is actually from Barclays. I used to head the real-time big data analytics portfolio for the bank, try to move the data to the cloud, and quickly realize our compliance couldn't get happy about the existing solutions. If you look, for example, on one end, Oracle's transparent data encryption, high usability, but uh, revealing a lot of information, so low security. And at the other end, we have competitors like Microsoft's Always Encrypted or Unveil. Very robust security, but then they cannot support a lot of queries, and they are super slow. So we are the first one that combined those two at scale. We're talking about a huge market, 1.6 billion by 2022. And our current model is based on B2B direct engagements. We have already raised our pre-seed. We have announced a pilot with the National Bank of Greece starting early 2019. And we have finished an evaluation with a MariaDB expert firm. Thousands of years ago, there was Calypso, a Greek goddess whose name meant she who keeps things secret. Today, we are here in order to pass your superpowers onto you in order to help you differentiate your products based on true security. Thank you very much. All right, judges. Um, sorry, just, just a uh, question on deployment. So, you know, how easy is your technology to deploy? I mean, obviously it's very early stage and, you know, you haven't ironed out all of all of the issues, but you know when when you think about deployments, how how do customers think about it? 
you know, how complex is it on-premise versus, I guess, private clouds? I think, can you talk through that a little bit? Great question. Deployment has been shown as one of the top concerns of customers we're talking to. Uh, so we have developed a Docker approach so that it's very easy to drag and drop. We have two modes of deployment. One is through our native API for new applications. For existing applications, we connect to drivers like ODBC, JDBC, and supporting immediately databases like MariaDB and MySQL. And that ensures there are no changes needed for existing applications. OK. A um, couple of questions. First one, are you billing yourselves as a FinTech and you're targeting financial services? Uh, secondly, um, can you give me an example of a really practical use case for the technology so that we can really bring it to earth for us as judges? Absolutely. So um, first of all, we have started focusing on financial institutions because we have seen there are a couple of things. So there is a high impact on a potential data breach and a very stringent regulation, but also the level of sophistication. Because encryption is a niche field, right? You need to talk to people, and they should understand it. So we're starting from there, but obviously, we are seeing applications in healthcare, in government and defense, and other fields. And then can you give me a really yeah, practical the, use case? In terms case. of the use case, I'll explain to you very briefly what we saw in the demo as well, in terms of the actual use case, because it's something we are working on right now. So this very large bank is pulling together on-prem different IoT data. And they want to be able to push them all and pull them on the cloud in order to be able to run analytics on the back of it. There are particular requirements there, because we're talking about sensitive data, about address <coughs> encryption, about in-transit encryption, about finding the best way to secure this data and also consume it. Right? So in our case, what happens is that our Docker sits where their runtime environment is. So at the first step, once the data goes into the cloud, and then we broke this stream of data before it gets stored. Now, what it means, it's twofold. Like, w one thing is about the robustness of the security. So we don't only secure the data at rest. We replace the need for in, in transit, but also we secure it in memory. But something else which is of interest to them is the fact that <coughs> while the data is encrypted on an object storage in uh, this particular cloud provider, it can be directly consumed through SQL uh, queries. So they don't need to move it to another staging environment in order to do it. So it's a combination of both the security and the functionality in terms of our product offering. Exactly. Okay, thank you. You um, mentioned Maria and MySQL. Do you work with other databases as well? I mean, that space is big, obviously, and yeah. it's also quite yeah. fragmented. And databases so become more and more specialized, right? Yeah, so uh, right now uh, we are working in uh, MongoDB and Postgres integration. OK. Uh, with closed source uh, databases, though, it's not possible to work directly. We would need to collaborate with Microsoft or, or Oracle in order to have access to their closed source drivers. Yeah. And you mentioned that you focus on, on FinTech because of the severity of breaches, obviously. Um, do you feel that this is also a go-to-market opportunity for you to actually work with these databases and become an add-on to their, to their sale? That's a great question. It gives me a good pass, too, because I skipped a little bit that part. So yes, uh, we see as the, the big opportunity is the financial services. Obviously, the feedback loops are quite long, and the, uh, the time to market there. So ob obviously, we have some early interest that we talked about, and we are proceeding with it. But we are opening up more uh, in this first stage to more medium-sized companies of general interest there, right? So because that, will, that enables us to get faster feedback loops. But again, as I said, we see the biggest opportunity in the next three years in the financial services sector altogether. Now, on the second part of your question, um, we see a wave of financial services, big, even big financial services, moving to the cloud, <coughs> to different databases, MariaDB, MySQL, Postgre, Mongo, et cetera. A lot of their systems is still mainframe, so it will take some time. It's an evolving market. How, how do you price this, given it's being bundled with open source databases in some cases? And how, how, do you, how does the customer think about paying for this? So, so far, we're, we still haven't crystallized the final model for pricing, so we're working on it right now. Uh, in most cases, they are happy with our approach in terms of volumes of data that we help them store with. So, yeah, that's the question. <coughs> uh, 
Yeah, m maybe to follow up again on, on this point on, on the go-to-market, because it sounds um, very ambitious. Uh, it's a sensitive topic, um, and you're going after a very large enterprise very, with very, very long sales cycle, where actually you could iter iterate potentially more by uh, focusing more on digital savvy type of businesses with a lot of data. Um, so you're mentioning now that maybe you're going to go to mid-sized company, but thinking about the plan ahead, the real focus is going to be really the next two or three years to focus on this big financial institution only? Or so, Answer okay, let, let's, yeah, short term, uh, we are talking with uh, also smaller sized companies, so we're talking with a B2B e-commerce online platform, and we're talking with the MariaDB expert house, so we're talking to these smaller providers to get a few iterations of our product going, and in parallel we have the stream with financial services. I would say this is a longer term kind of game, so it takes far longer, but Let's say that the shorter, the shorter time plan is focusing on medium, small sized businesses. And what you mentioned, some native, cloud native companies seem to be faster in terms of moving ahead with this. All right, give it up for Calypso. <laughs> Next up, we have Apollo One. Presenting for Apollo One are Dan Genduso and Genevieve Lawson. In 2018, we will likely see education institutions start taking a student-centered uh, design thinking approach with a focus on meeting the expectations of today's students, helping institutions to optimize and modernize with that student journey in mind. Folks, they were talking about today. Introducing you by Apollo One. You is a combination of schools, e-learning platforms, corporate training, and more. Students create a global report card as they move in and out of each institution within a single education uh, platform. Your U identity, your global education identity, that's the glue that's pulling all those courses that you're taking together to create a single school that is optimized and modernized to meet the needs and expectations of a single student at the center of it all, you. Cut to demo. As Dan enters into you, he goes through an onboarding process to understand the benefits of using the software. He can get started, and he will start a self-assessment where he starts putting in things like learning preferences, learning styles, behavioral traits, and personality styles. Once Dan has done that, he can go into the analytics dashboard and start drilling in to become more self-aware of where he stands. I will likely have to, uh, <laughs> I will likely have to start practicing some public speaking according to that. <laughs> <laughs> Dan can start to request a peer assessment from somebody he's worked with, perhaps on a marketing project. He goes into the platform, chooses whether he wants to be reviewed on communication skills or project management skills, and sends out the requests within the, within the decentralized ecosystem. Dan can also receive requests from other students within the ecosystem. Once he opens it up, he will say whether he will recommend that person as a future teammate and then start drilling into that uh, and assessing that person's skills as well. Back to presentation. What we just saw is a decentralized CRM system for one person. Um, it's pulling together, it has a task manager to manage your incoming tasks. It has an analytics section to uh, do personal insights and look into your data. But most importantly, as you're answering those questions, What's happening is we're pulling that data in and putting it, uh, organizing it into a profile, a profile that is used to personalize education within each stop of the education ecosystem. So any learning platform in the ecosystem can, in, can read off that data and personalize learning to you. Uh, most importantly, the data that is in that, uh, the data that is in there is not owned by you, it's owned by you. <laughs> uh, 
A uh, professor at Harvard Business School mentioned that uh, uni uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, 50% of US universities are going to go bankrupt. Uh, universities are losing their relevance. They're no longer preparing students for the workforce. Um, luckily, universities are not the only player in, a, in, a, in the higher education uh, industry that uh, 2U is valued at $1.8 trillion. Um, in that industry, classrooms, like the one on this picture, are going by the wayside, and people are moving online in masses. In the next two years, it's expected that 50% of learning will take place online. Uh, and as that's happening, uh, the e-learning e industry is expected to reach $325 billion by the year 2025. Our software is free software. It will eventually be open source. The reason is because our mission is to provide open and equal access to education across the globe. U is, a non U is part of a nonprofit subsidiary of Apollo One, similar to the Linux Foundation. We do have uh, other product that we're working on that that is a paid, <laughs> that is not a nonprofit, but this is the first part that is critical to making that piece work. Um, it relies on membership donations, similar to Linux Foundation again, from ed tech companies, individuals, and education institutions that want to take place, that want to be involved in a platform and personalized to all their students. The U.S. Department of Education recently selected us uh, as a winner in their search for companies reimagining the future of higher education. USC Adventures has incubated us on a campus with 50,000 potential students as a pilot, and we are working with Teacher to uh, potentially pilot some blockchain use cases by transferring, uh, um, by transferring, sorry, by transferring your uh, diplomas or degrees uh, to your decentralized profile. Our team is made up of Andrin, who's an MIT engineer, Genevieve, who is a, uh, in charge of our community and operations, <coughs> Skylar, who's a software engineer, and myself, who's a CRM architect and a decentralized autonomous organization expert. Um, if, you or, uh, if you are an individual, ed tech company, or an education institution interested in personalizing to all of your students within a single ecosystem, please visit Apollo1.com and reach out to me, and I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> Judges. I, I have to ask about the name. So <laughs> um, Apollo 1, I, you know. It's APOL01. It's just simple swiping left and right for every answer I need to build out your database. OK, so nothing to do with the rocket that Well, it does, up. because uh, eventually <laughs> I'm hoping we're, we're, in, we're part of that pilot with a teacher was to start testing out blockchain integrations to transfer degrees and credentials to profiles. Um, so they do say that blockchain will take you to the moon, and that's what we're going to do. <laughs> One more question, if I, if I may. Um, it's a big idea, big vision, but what's kind of the pain point, would you say? What's kind of the main pain point? <coughs> you mentioned universities, right, have issues, yep. then, you know. I, I'll say the main pain point is that in the next 10 to 15 years, 30 to 40% of the people uh, in the world, especially at least in the United States, I would imagine everywhere else, are going to be out of work from automation. And in that same time, I gave a statistic that at that exact same time, 50% of universities will go bankrupt. So if there's not something to catch all those students, we're going to be in a lot of trouble because when you lose your job, the only place you can turn is education. I guess my question is a follow-on from yours. Um, <laughs> I'm struggling to see the incentive or benefit for students to use the platform, because agreed it's a big idea, but why would I put my data uh, immutably um, in a CRM platform? It's, What's the benefit for me uh, if I'm a it's, student? It's actually not. You own your own data. I don't own any of it. You own and manage it yourself. Um, and so it is actually a way for you to start uh, further down the road. You can license your data yourself. I, I, you aren't putting it anywhere but on your own device or in your own cloud storage. But what am I going to use that data for? Can you well, give me a I'm really practical example? Sure. I mean, uh, sure. 
So for instance, I'm going to use it to personalize your education experience. The same way that you can get advertising or products personalized to you when you're shopping or on Facebook, I'm going to do that to present you with work opportunities and with education opportunities that meet the way that you want to be learning and in the way you're capable of learning. OK, thank you. Which uh, blockchain protocol have you chosen to work with and why? <laughs> um, I, I use Hyperledger because I believe every individual is their own business and it is the most private and secure way uh, to, ke to, to keep privacy, in my opinion. Um, you know, the, the sort of the, the vision of a, of a digital identity that can be sort of open and freely used across a decentralized system, I mean, it's, you know, it's a 25-year-old plus idea. We've sort of seen that, uh, you know, without having a, a dominant um, use case like Facebook um, or Twitter, um, you know, identity is, is a very hard thing to, to bootstrap. When you think about like the four or five early adopters of your sort of open source technology, I mean, who do you need to yep. be working with to make this work? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think some of the biggest potential users are in places like Africa and India, actually. Um, I think in India, uh, you have a lot of problems right now where there's a lot of students who want to come out um, and they want to be uh, in the AI space, for instance, and they're going to school and they're getting a degree, but there's about five or six of these courses out there on Coursera and other places that they need to take in order to get hired by a place like Google for AI. And so that's a big <coughs> potential market to be able to pull that together into a verified and validated source where they can say, I completed this degree and I completed all these courses and here it is in one spot. But that means you, you got to work with Coursera. Uh, that, my question is oh, like, who do you have to work with? Oh. Yeah. bootstrap yeah. the, the network effect. Right, so in the early stages, I think I have to go through the institutions, and that's why I've been working with the Department of Education and USC on this. Um, I think it's going, they're going to be needed at first to get this rolling. Um, it's going to be, take a lot of kind of, uh, and Coursera is another one. It's, I think you have to go through the institutions at first as much as I would like for it to be a ground up from the individual level. Um, I think it's going to have to start like that, and then eventually I do want I do expect to be able to spread it out, though, to where the people are individual at the individual level it's operating. Um, but I kind of see all those institutions. I think there's a lot of value in being able to personalize. I know that uh, education institutions, especially universities um, who are struggling right now, want to be able to compete with some of those online schools. So the ability to have that information about every student coming in is highly valuable to them. You Final question? Yeah, you mentioned that it's going to be for free for the, obviously for the students, I assume, but also for the, for the schools. Yeah. Um, wh what, what's the thinking behind that? Is the, is the thinking that this takes away the, the barrier of having to buy something? And, and how yeah. do you envision adoption? Yeah, the software is free because I believe that education needs to be open. And I think that's a big problem where every time we keep starting something in education, it starts closed and not open access. And that creates a problem. Um, what I am creating is a decentralized autonomous accelerator, though, that goes alongside of this, where I, um, as I plug those people and match them into work, um, and they're all working together within a single platform, I'm able to, that's where I'm able to capture fees. All right, let's have one more round of applause for Apollo One. We have one final startup in this round. That startup is V2X. Network presenting for V2X Network are Asan Shamin and Holger Gok. Thank you guys. This is my first car, a Golf from 1998. The most error you could get out of it was basically a check engine light, that's it. And now look at this Tesla, a car full of sensors producing a lot of data. And we know from our hands on experience that each autonomous and smart car will produce up to four terabytes of data per day. And now what does this data consist of? It consists of driving conditions, road conditions, charging locations, LADARs, radars, sensors, you name it. So basically our cars have become rolling data servers. But the question is, how can we make use of this data? Or can we make use of this data? Absolutely, yes. 
we can provide it to the people who can improve our travel experience, who can build better cities, and who can build better cars for us. But that's why we have developed V2X Network, the first incentivizing car data platform providing access to the car data. V2X Network is a decentralized platform providing real-time access to the car data. This means unlocking a huge potential of many connected car services. Let me show you how it works. We basically have a hybrid connectivity solution. On one hand, we work with the car manufacturers to connect the cars directly to our network from their backbones. And on the other side, we have an OBD dongle solution to connect the older cars to our network. This is a V2X network dongle prototype, a blockchain node that you can insert in any car anywhere in the world and start sharing the data live with us. Move to the demo, please. So this is the web interface for V2X network. Uh, uh, and if we log in, we just go to the dashboard. There's, there's a couple of things you can do the on the dashboard, including the constant management. But let's go to the most interesting thing, trips. In the trips, we can actually see the cars live connected to our network right now. So there's, you can see there is one active trip. That's basically our colleague Sami driving live in Munich right now. But to show you that this thing actually works, I'm going to hand this dongle to my colleague Holger, who is going to plug it into an emulator, and we will see the second car connected to the network right now live. Thank you. Uh, since we are inside the room, unfortunately, we won't be able to show the GPS data, and there is a, there is a limitation in terms of what we can collect from the emulator. But the point with what we are trying to show you is that how easy it is for, uh, for, uh, it is for us to collect the data, and what is it that we can make use of this data. So now that we have, yeah. Well, it no demo is a live demo if it doesn't, if it, if, if it always works. So is it connected now? It is connected, but it seems to have a little lag. OK, anyways, let's go to the trip that Sami is mm -hmm. doing right now. <laughs> OK, so as you can see, that we are collecting the devda live from, from Munich right now. These, this is maps from Munich. Sami is driving around. He's changing the speed. But the, the most important thing to see here is that the, the, the kind of the data that we are collecting and the way we are analyzing it is exactly the kind of the data an insurance provider would need to provide you pay as your drive service. A smart fleet management company would need to improve the fleet cost. So that's what we do. But that's not the old data that we see. That's only the visualization. At the back end, we collect a lot of data, as we mentioned, you know, like from different sensors. Move back to the presentation, please. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, back to the demo. One important thing I forgot to mention, now that we are collecting the data from Sami, the question is, why would Sami give this data to us for free? And that is exactly why we have implemented an automatic incentive mechanism which contributes or which actually pays you back the amount, you know, something that we earn from your data, we pay you back. And that's why when we end the trip, it's a blockchain entity, we give you back something, and you can actually verify the transactions on our network. So Sami has actually already received something back in his wallet. And you can actually okay. verify the transactions in our, in our web, web interface. Completed. Back to the presentation, please. Yeah. So what's unique about our solution is the way we have architectured it. We have created a decentralized, trustless environment between the car owners and the data consumers. And, and it's, it's as compared to our comparators, uh, we ensure the undistorted data distribution by design. And we believe that this is very important to promote the innovation and to promote the, the competition. And the, the market for, for, the, for, the, for the connected car services is huge. Only in EU in 2021, it's going to be up to 31 billion US dollars. So that's a huge market. We at V2X Network, we have a very well-defined strategy of how we want to grow. Last week, we got the great news that two of the major European car manufacturers would like to try our solution. So they have confirmed it. And this gives us even higher confidence that we can achieve our goals. So uh, meet the team, please. That's, uh, that's us, all of us. Uh, we have uh, a couple of years of automotive experience. We have worked with, uh, with different car manufacturers. And whatever we are doing right now, it's our hands-on experience. And the most important thing is that we are really passionate about what we do. So take the control back of your data. 
get incentivized for what you contribute to us, and please help us build a new, whole new ecosystem for the mobility to improve the, the system. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, judges. So I just, just wanted to clarify, who acquires this device? Is it the car manufacturer and it's pre-installed during manufacturing? Is it the insurance company or is it mm -hmm. the individual consumer? And, so and why? So. For the new cars, by default, every car is already connected to the network, all the new cars being produced. So we don't need to insert this dongle there. We get the car connected live from the ECU. So but it's a retroactive build. This is for yeah, the old okay. cars in the market. You can insert it in an OBD port and it gets connected. And what was your second question? It was, it's sort of, I really wanted to understand, are you selling this to <coughs> the car manufacturers, to the individual consumer, or to the insurance companies? We are mm -hmm. in active discussion with different insurance providers. They would like to subsidize this thing so that they can, they can distribute it amongst their existing customer base. And the same for the fleet managers, they would distribute it amongst their fleet. Mm -hmm. And do you see the end market on the demand side being only the insurance company? Oh, uh, no, it has a huge potential. That's what we believe. Like insurance, smart cities, whatever, like, you know, like smart cities would also need the data live from the cars to, to do the urban planning accordingly. Insurance is one thing, smart fleet management. Also, a live video stream could be used to simulate or the, the autonomous cars, test them. So there's a lot of use cases for, for, the, for this data and mapping updates, real-time traffic information. We can name a couple of more. Yeah. Um, just in full disclosure, we're seed investors in Autonomo, based in Israel, who you know, yeah. provide a data infrastructure yeah. for connected cars yeah. that insurance companies and app developers can use, and OEMs and the automotive supply chain have adopted, and they've got quite a lot of follow-on funding. So how, how would you sort of differentiate yourself from those guys and who else in the market do you see? I mean, it's, as you say, it's a huge market. I mean, I think your solution's really mm -hmm. elegant, but how do you sort of see the competitive landscape? Mm -hmm. So, Autonomy is definitely one of our competitors, and uh, when we see ourselves, uh, and if we speak with two insurance providers and we tell them that when you get the data from us, you can always be sure that it's undistorted. And at the same time, there's a black box solution, uh, which is differently architectured. You can never be sure what you get out. It can mm. be manipulated. Not that we say that they will, but the buyers would prefer our solution because they can always be sure. This is <coughs> one thing, and, and also we provide the incentive mechanism, which we think is, is very unique because we pay back to, to you because we get the data from you, so we share the revenue with you, and we understand mm. that you also know the value of data now. So. I'm buying a new car that's collecting all the data. How, how do you create awareness for me that there is actually this opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, do you rely on the insurance or the, you know, because what you do is you create a marketplace for this data, yeah. but I have to know that I have this data and then what drives me towards that? So it, in our platform, no one can access your data without your consent. Every time a new application would like to, to request your data, we will give you a pop-up message on your car screen that this application would like to access your data. Only if you allow, we will also tell you in a pop-up message that what is it that you can earn out of it, because the incentives would differ from application to application. Yeah. Sorry, my question was a different one. Um, my question was, I buy a new car, the car collects data, how do I know about this? Are you going to tell me this? Or is the mm. BMW telling me your, your car is collecting data? Go to this app and you know, sell your data mm. when, or trade it. Or when you I buy a new car, basically you sign a contract with the car manufacturer that the sensor data is something that they will collect for the sake of improvement of different systems. Mm. Yep. And when we want to acquire it from them, we take your consent, definitely. But just to add to your question to complete this, um, it is a highly, let's say, individualized approach for each OEM wants to have a different strategy when it comes to do they want to get an interaction with us on their user interface, on their infotainment interface, or do they not want that? So for some car companies, they differentiate themselves through these kind of services, others do it through these kind of services. So uh, it's not a standardized approach, so we have to look into each car manufacturer that basically how do they want to do it. So you work with the car manufacturer? 
we talk to car manufacturers, yes. Uh, also, disclosure, we have a bet adjacent to this called Nexar, but what, one of the um, questions I had was around your choice of architecture and specifically why you chose a, a blockchain decentralized approach yep. for this. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very valid question. A lot of people have this concern. We only use blockchain as a, oops, as a part of our network. It's, it's not that our core architecture is. Our core architecture is also centralized. We got the concept from the blockchain architecture, but we do not rely on blockchain. However, we take certain advantages from blockchain that we add the data integrity and incentive mechanism on blockchain. So even if we take the blockchain off, our network would still work the same. Thank you. Uh, OK, give it up for V2X Network. Thank you. Thank you. And that wraps up our first round of the Startup <laughs> Battlefield. The judges are going to follow me backstage, and they're going to help us choose some finalists. Before they do that, though, let's hear it one more time for our awesome judges. <laughs> I like that guy. <laughs>
always to make sure they can sort of have a long-term relationship and to bring some of the knowledge that we've had by being in those 130 plus markets. And our objective is to have a conversation where we're not only sharing data practically, but we're talking about how can we use that data for urban planning and really building into a larger vision of these smart cities. So hopefully I'm there as a catalyzer and then we have the long-term team that can really build the relationship for us to win succeed. So back in 2014, I was living in Shanghai and there were a ton of electric scooters yeah. everywhere already. That was four years ago. Why do you think it took so long to see electric scooters in the US? Yeah, that's interesting. Even now, there's actually not shared systems of electric scooters that have disseminated throughout China. I think it's a kind of combination of maybe a perfect, st perfect storm of a number of factors. There's IoT, there's the ability to really scale out a system, there's the understanding on the fundraising side of this really is an opportunity to scale globally. So I think it's kind of been a place where now that we've seen sort of the first traction on people understand the scalability of this and you've sort of seen the growth from that. But in China, most people own their scooters. Mm. Uh, do you think the same thing is going to happen in the US? Let's say, for instance, that somebody is a very heavy Lime user. They spend hundreds of dollars per year on Lime. It's more or less the same thing as buying a scooter. Sure, but you also, when you have a scooter, you have to think about maintenance, people stealing it. Sometimes you don't want a scooter when you go from your place to an office and an office back to somewhere else, but you have to bring it with you. So really what we're selling is not only just the actual trip, but the convenience of you living in truly empowered life and making the most of your urban environment. Okay, so let's be serious now. Okay. I'm sure you've seen the bird graveyard Instagram account mm. uh, showing a bunch of electric scooters scattered all over the streets of San Francisco. Why do you think people hate scooters so much? I mean, going back to the graveyard, it comes down to how do you create your scooters and what's your priority? So we focus day one on creating a vertically integrated supply chain, which means that our scooters have always been customized for the shared environment. When you're instead just buying scooters that are for personal mobility, slapping a sticker on them, yeah, they're not made for the wear and tear that you see every day. So we made sure we've always created the best, safest, and ultimately sort of long-lasting product we can. And then we have recycling programs so that we can always reuse parts. We actually melt down the metal, reuse that as well. So we've really invested in creating a life cycle with our product. It's part of why we have our Lime Green initiative, for instance. Here in Berlin, we actually pick up and sort of do a number of things with green methodologies, have e-bikes that are, have trailers that are going around and collecting these things. So we really try and look at the entire life cycle and try and make ourselves as green as possible. But you say the best and safest scooters? Yeah, we just put a version 3.0 out, uh, which is the most durable. It's actually customized for the space, deals with any of the other issues that many of the other providers have had. And we were even transparent about saying, look, when there were some issues about other providers, we came out and we gave a notice of, we told all of our sort of users, we collected all of the scooters, we actually created an algorithm on top of what the other manufacturers had created to further justify and figure out what was the issue, and we only put out those that passed that algorithm, and then we even changed the way that we even were charging some of those. Yeah, for those in the room not following, you had to recall some scooters. Yeah, I mean, uh, the industry did how it. Many, how many scooters did you have to recall? I don't have a number for you, unfortunately. Is it more like 10, 1,000? I mean, it's 10,000 for us. We brought most of our scooters back in to do testing, right? So it's more a question of how many were put back out. And it was definitely something that we put out many of our scooters afterwards because they did meet the testing. Do you plan to use technology to make sure that people park their scooters, um, you know, on the on the sidewalk when they're not blocking the way? that they're using the scooters properly? No, it's a, a great note. I mean, ultimately, this space is so nascent that the technology is just catching up to the potential of the product market fit. And I think one of the reasons that you're going to see this space continue to get more and more potent over time is that the ability to use technology around 3D imaging and other things to really figure out sidewalk detection are all just the beginning of a space that should really transform the way that cities can see this as working hand in hand to continually improve the system. So you're saying GPS is too limited for what you want to do with your scooters? I mean, GPS is great. Obviously, it's been the beginning and enabled us to do lots in this space, but there's so much room for improvement. Okay, let's switch gear a bit and talk about startups sort of did this space, uh, biking startups, and especially the Chinese giants. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that Ofo had some scaling issues and they had to scale back. Putting it lightly, but yes. Especially in international cities and, and they had to, you know, pause for a minute and say, maybe we shouldn't launch so many cities at once. Um, what are you learning from that? I think it's about the approach. 
from day one, we talk to cities. We figure out how to go from pilots and really scale into a city. We don't necessarily just place bikes there and hope for the best. I think also having a multimodal fleet means you can customize what's needed for different environments. And sometimes a regular pedal bike is not what you need. And so allowing us to create a customized program, scaling it over time, really using data, having data actually be something where we talk to the city, hey, we were seeing this amount of usage on our vehicles, therefore we want to continue to scale up the vehicles. So even after raising $457 million, you're not thinking, OK, let's buy 10 million scooters and bikes and put them all on the road at once? I mean, again, our methodology is working side by side with cities. And the ability to do so is based on showing demand. And one of the interesting things is that what you're seeing now is that cities have long wanted to support alternative mobility lanes and really creating the urban infrastructure. But it's been a bit of a chicken and egg problem. They haven't been able to show the demand because there wasn't the supply. But we provide supply, the demand is there, and I think what you'll see is that as we create more infrastructure and we encourage more of this behavior, cities will encourage also to see more and more of these types of companies being able to really serve their, their citizens. I find it interesting that in China, a lot of um, bike startups took off and there are multiple scooter startups in the US. Why do you think there is this sort of cultural difference between China and the US? It's interesting. I mean, I think, first and foremost, bike culture never has left China, right? The US is trying to figure out what is its new culture of mobility. We're trying to figure out how to go beyond the car. And I think the reality is that sort of the e-bike and the electric scooter and now our electric car, which are going into, really creates a first version of that transformation in a way that a Western audiences can understand and feel comfortable and really meets their needs. A couple of weeks ago, there was an article in the New York Times uh, saying that Facebook hired a PR firm called Definers. It's an opposition research firm. And they attacked George Soros using anti-Semitic right. comments. Yeah. First off, we do not support that. We do not believe that this is a space that should be used for anything but enabling and empowering. We use them to work on our lime green and our carbon free programs. As soon as we understood they were doing some of these things, we went to parted ways and finished our program with them. So now you admit that you're working with, with definers. Yeah, we did work with them, but we're ultimately not working with them. OK, because when we reached out, you, you wouldn't comment on, on the issue a couple of weeks ago. But why, why did you hire them knowing that they would send uh, sort of nasty pitches to journalists. Again, we didn't know that, A, and we were using them to research our carbon-free program, understanding what were the leverages of opportunity for us to really create the messaging, and also to do our own research, understanding the life cycle, all the pieces that are in a very complex business. As soon as we found out there were the practices that were not beneficial and ultimately not creating a good image for either companies in the industry, but they were also recommended by top providers all the way around, and as soon as we learned differently, we decided to move on. Let's take a very specific example. Sure. We at TechCrunch searched uh, through our inboxes mm. and we found an email from Definers attacking Bird, mm. your competitor. We wrote something on Bird and it was a sort of um, chirpy email saying, hey, FYI, uh, you wrote about Bird, but I think the numbers are not as big as you reported in your article. This isn't about going to a car-free society. Sure. It's about and I trashing will say I don't know anything about that, honestly. I mean, from my purview, the way we've engaged them and what we've done is part of why when I hear things this is why we don't work with them. So you weren't aware of this email and this kind of campaign? No. Aren't you supposed to know who you're working with? Yeah, of course we know who we're working with as to knowing exactly the tactics. I don't know your tactics at TechCrunch and I'm here talking to you. Now, knowing all of this now, do you plan to keep working with definers in the future? Uh, we're not working with them. OK, so you stopped the relationship altogether. All right, let's switch gear and talk about. Um, you like switching gears. Are we up leveling, are we down leveling, which way are we going? Well, you don't have any gear on the scooter, though. That's what I was like, saying. I don't even know anymore. Yeah. Let's talk about global expansion. Uh, you live in, in Berlin, obviously, with bikes and scooters. Yeah, electric bikes here. Uh, Frankfurt, Paris, Brussels, Madrid, all around Europe, basically. Uh, what has been the reaction so far in Europe right here? I mean, numbers again speak. Ultimately, we've seen some of the best markets between Paris and Madrid, and people understand this is solving a key issue. In many ways, the infrastructure needs of Europe are even more defined because there's beautiful old cities that are trying to deal with these congestion issues. Here, obviously, in Germany, we're trying to get rid of diesel cars. These are things that we ultimately want to work hand in hand, and I think the European cities are very progressive in their view and ability to create a new future for that. And when it comes to numbers, do you think you can get higher numbers in Europe, or do you still see higher numbers in the US? 
again, it's so market to market, it's hard to like do an apples to apples comparison, but I do believe that Europe will be one of the sort of largest opportunities for autonomous mobility vehicles, and it'll probably lead the way to the transformation around the world. And what about Berlin, more specifically, because we're in, Ber we're in Berlin right now? Yeah, so meaning we are here, we have electric bikes, our fleet Good is... numbers in Berlin? Yes, strong. I mean, again, the, the culture here understands it. There's also the infrastructure for it. There's protected lanes. Protected lanes are a massive part of creating safety, of enabling people to really feel like they can adopt a system like this. And it's one of the reasons we wanted to find cities that sort of can create that and allow for us to put that forth to other cities as well. And you're still rolling out new cities, sometimes with bikes, sometimes with scooters, sometimes both. Uh, the company was first called Lime Bike. Uh, what's the breakdown right now between bikes and scooters? Yeah. So from day one, we always wanted to be multimodal. We actually went with Lime Bike because it was SEO, and honestly, because cities understood the bike world and were sort of more open to that. And because we've always been collaborative from day one, we wanted to sort of start with programs that would allow us to increase and sort of diversify over time. In terms of the breakdown, I don't have a breakdown I can share, but ultimately we are seeing every market is different. It depends on topography, it depends on sort of what the use cases are, and that changes therefore the type of fleet that we deploy. So you're not going to prioritize um, scooters over bikes, for instance? I mean, again, electric bikes are for longer distances, for hills, depends on what you're trying to do. So we see having different vehicles actually enabling people to say, I need to get around my city, I don't think if I need a scooter or this, I think about what's the best vehicle, and hopefully we can always be a solution for you. Let's talk about um, one of your favorite partners, Uber. Hmm. Uh, they invested in Lime back in May or June of last year, of this year. And now users can unlock scooters from the Uber app, at least in some cities. Yep. Uh, how is the relationship with Uber right now? I mean, we're obviously independent. They're a minor investor in us. I believe they saw us as having built a strong city-first collaborative relationship, and that's one of the things we're trying to do is they really build into a mobility as a service platform they can offer cities globally. So would you call them an investor, a partner, or both? I mean, they're obviously both, right? We are working with them in terms of enabling us to be found in certain cities, and they are a minor investor, but obviously we have our own trajectories, we operate as separate companies, Ultimately, we're sort of creating a future which is electric and sort of clearly focused on that. And we believe that in some cases, rideshare hasn't really created the transformation of less vehicles on the road. And we needed to create a new future to get rid of those. And what do you think about the current strategy of uh, moving away from just cars and ride hailing to become a sort of um, app for all sorts of transportation? Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is that we want to see cities transform, and we welcome anyone who wants to find a way to help us do that alongside of us. That's part of why we're more of a partner-based company, really about long-term relationships and collaborating, than we are about trying to create enemies between people. So does it mean if Lyft or maybe a local competitor like MyTaxi, if they approach you I mean, and they say, the we want, yeah, we want to, to have Lime scooters in the app, you would do it? Always open to the conversation. And Uber also acquired uh, Jump and they're going to roll out uh, sort of Uber bikes and scooters in some cities. Do you think it's a threat for you? No, again, we welcome it. Ultimately, this is proving the viability of the space, enabling the transformation we need to see. The fact that globally we have less than 5 to 10% what is alternative mobility in terms of the number of trips that are happening and commuting and getting around the city every day, that's the real thing we need to do. We need to address and really change the behavior. And if multiple companies are enabling that, then we're all for it. And the fact that you partnered with Uber, isn't, isn't it a way to see if it's working and to acquire you down the road maybe next year or something like that? I, mean, I think Uber has its own sort of competencies it needs to continue to develop. I think them playing with us is ultimately saying they've acknowledged our competencies, that we have built an amazing platform, fast execution, scale globally, faster than anyone else has, and it's our ability to sort of leverage both sides of the partnership to really go back to cities and say, we can offer a full range of different ways for you to really change the way people get around in your city. All right, let's talk about the business model now. Am I changing um, gears? I guess we can't, so there we go. just going to another topic. Uh, so the business model, uh, as, as you know, some companies have um, bought a ton of bikes like Ofo and Mobike, and even now it doesn't seem like they found a, a, like a business model that actually works. Would you say that Lime's business model right now works? I mean, we have markets where we've already proven ourselves to be margin positive. So we know the business works. Ultimately, it's about behavior change. Mm. The more we see people using and sort of creating the opportunity to really integrate into their lives, the more successful the program is. Do you track the number of rides per day per scooter? 
Yeah, of course. I mean, one of the benefits of sort of the clarity of what we have on the vehicle set is we're always optimizing what are hotspot locations, where they should they be best put, sort of how do we optimize for the time of day, seasonality, all the other aspects of that. And in a busy city, like how many times a day somebody is going, I mean, how many times a day people are going to ride the one scooter in particular? It can range. Unfortunately, I can't give you an exact number, but let's just say it's actually multiples more than we actually see regular bikes. Oh, okay, because that's shorter rides? Honestly, I think it's shorter rides. I think it's also the fact that you can be in the suit, and if it's a hot day or whatever else, like there's an ability for you to use a vehicle that's electric in a way that you couldn't otherwise. I think there's a little bit of the novelty. There's a sense of like electric and the innovation behind it. So there's a lot of contributing factors that mean that you see people adopt and sort of feel more loyal to electric vehicles than they would otherwise. And when it comes to maintaining the, the fleet of vehicles, uh, you have to work with people uh, so that they, they will charge the scooters overnight, for instance. Mm. How does it affect the bottom line? Do you think uh, you can find enough people willing to do that and still be positive as a whole? Completely. I mean, ultimately, our juicers, which is the third-party charging system that we've created, yeah. enables us to offer complementary and supplemental income in a way that is a win-win situation. And we've been able to use that effectively to scale up, really create local evangelists, understand they help us actually report issues so we collect our vehicles faster so that we have the best and safest quality out there. So we've seen it as a win-win and it's something that people are seeing the value and because it's supplemental, it's not a full-time job. They can do it at night or in the evening and make an extra money. That is sort of is a win-win for us to really build a partnership that we think will continue to grow over the years. And let's say you grow 10x. Can it scale as well? Can you find enough We've done it places already. to put all the scooters everywhere? Yeah, I mean, we have cities where Seattle, for instance, we started with what is less than 1,000 vehicles. We're not almost eight to 10,000 vehicles. We know we can do this. It's something that we've proven and it's part of what cities believe us as one of the best and world-class operators. So one of your competitors, uh, Bird, announced a sort of new model, uh, which is letting people acquire a fleet of scooters and then being um, sort of rental company for, for scooters. What do you think about this model? I think everyone's trying to find unique and interesting ways to address the space. Mm. And I think the reality is it's probably an interim solution until the sort of cities have allowed for the saturation. And then really that comes back to it, is that this space and really the transformation is not about having a couple of hundred vehicles in a market. You need to see sort of an actual couple of thousand in these cities for it to really be ubiquitous, something that you can always find and trust upon. And I think finding different ways to create that is something that we're all looking for so that you really feel that there's always one accessible. Okay, we have time for another question. Uh, where, where are you traveling next after Berlin? Whew, I actually get to go back to Seattle. We have a Leeds retreat. Back to uh, Seattle. But then from there, I'll go to, let's see, Sao Paulo to check in. Uh, I will go to Santiago, Chile, where we just launched. I will check in on the APAC markets in Sydney and in Singapore. So yeah, keeping busy. And for instance, when you come to Berlin, do you actually use Lime to go from one meeting to another? Yeah, I mean, it happens outside of my hotel. There were actually two parked there. I didn't tell them to do that. And I managed to grab it to go to first, my first meeting, which I had before this. And it's interesting to see, like, you get a read of kind of how people are ultimately adopting them. I love asking people questions. I love testing all our vehicles. My operations team always knows when I'm in town because I'm like, hey, there's an issue here. Hey, there's an issue here. Hey, good, good job. This should be placed over there. So I'm always trying to sort of add intelligence the same time as use our product. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, it's lunchtime. There are food trucks that way. Please be back at 105. We have a great show in store for you this afternoon. Thanks. Pro 2 is the next iteration of our popular professional camera series and it's basically got a lot of features that our users have been asking for, we delivered on. And it's important for us to take the feedback and really give them a solution that's going to be easy to use both on the capture side and on the post side. Our biggest challenge until this point has been how do we create a super smooth and seamless workflow that will make users happy and they don't have to pull their hair out and waste time with the stitching and the post processing. So we really have to find that delicate balance between adding new features and still making it a simple process. 
We've upgraded the sensors and we've upgraded the internal motherboard to allow for 8K stereo capture. And we've also upped a lot of the other resolutions where you're able to now record higher resolution at higher frame rates, making it more in line with what the expectations would be from a traditional filmmaking standpoint. The defining feature of the camera now is the dual antennas that pop up from the top. And those are to enhance the GPS and the Wi-Fi. And you'll see that you can now record to six micro SD cards. The reason we shifted to the six micro SD card option is to allow up to 120 megabits per second on each card. So the bit rate is much higher than recording just onto one SD card. Now it has the ability to uh, stabilize in camera. So we've upgraded the gyroscope from a six axis to a nine axis stabilized gyro. And we've also rethought and redone our algorithm on the digital stabilization side. So it's now going from just catering to a strictly VR audience to also traditional filmmakers who just want to enhance their, their tool belt a bit. We'll be pairing the Pro 2 with our Farsight system. And it's the first ever long range wireless transmitter built specifically for a 360 camera. Ultimately, the uh, Farsight will be available on its own, uh, but together, both systems are around $5,000. So this glorious beast you see before you is the Trek Super Commuter Plus 7. It's a electric bike with pedal assist, but the pedal assist maxes out at about 20, so it can still stay within the range of a electric bicycle. And my favorite part is that it looks like a, uh, like a, I don't know, some kind of urban assault bike. Let's take a closer look. I really like how this bike is put together and I really like the replaceable battery. That's massively important for a bike like this. You can't swap out the battery, especially if you're at work. It takes about an hour or two to really charge up. It's got these massive 2.4 inch tires, Shimano Dior shifters on the front. You also have a Shimano HG500 10 speed cassette on the back. So there's no throttle on this thing. So it actually assists you as you pedal and go from eco, which is a little bit slower, gives you a little bit of a boost to touring, which gives you sort of a general overall boost, sport, which makes you go a little faster, and turbo, which makes you go really fast. It's a little expensive for what it is. You could probably have somebody push you <laughs> around town for the same amount that you would pay for this thing, $3,700. Uh, but if you're into bike commuting and you have a long commute, this is way to go. What's up TechCrunchers? We are at Skydio HQ where we're gonna chat with a group of startup employees who are building autonomous drones that can track your every move. We're gonna chat with their CEO and see what they're up to. Let's check them out. The basic idea for what we're doing is we think fully autonomous drones are really the future of the industry. Um, and we've believed that from the beginning, and we've also believed that like the, the core technology and the core enabler there is the, the software system. So we've really been focused on building that from, from the very beginning. So I, I'm seeing kind of a lot of prototypes behind us. Uh, you wanna just kind of give a long overview, kind of stretching through the process of, you know, where this idea started, translating into, you know, your new product, VR1. For almost the first year of the company, it was just uh, my three co-founders uh, working in a basement, uh, self-funded. So the prototyping at that stage was very, very scrappy. Uh, so we started with just off-the-shelf quadcopter frames um, and putting media center computers and USB cameras on them uh, and, and essentially starting the, the core of our software system. And there's been a pretty steady evolution since then to get to the R1. Um, so we built more sophisticated uh, rigs that let us like have multiple cameras, uh, to, to develop more and more of the software. And then at a certain point when we had kind of answered enough of the questions there about what was gonna be possible, what we really wanted the product to be, we started developing the custom hardware platform. Um, and 
you know, the, the basic idea there has been pretty constant from the beginning, but we've been through a number of iterations to get everything dialed in just the way that we want for, for our one. Uh, yeah, so we started like the, this first prototype, AirCam one. Mm -hmm. Uh, aptly named, was using basically like a media center computer, okay. um, which was not very power efficient, uh, not at all designed for this. The cameras are plugged in over USB. Uh, so there was a lot that was like not, not great about this, but it allowed us to get something in the air and start developing the software system. Um, and then, you know, I think we're just fortunate to kind of be doing this at the right time. So like after we started the company, NVIDIA announced uh, the TX1, these sort of like perfect embedded compute modules that have really powerful GPUs, uh, and that's what we started using. So we we did the sort of off-the-shelf computer thing for a little while, uh, and then started working on NVIDIA dev boards. What's, what's up with this monster? How's the, how's yeah, this, one this, doing? this is a team favorite. <laughs> the the this prettiest is, of, uh, of the bunch. This is the triangle rig, is what we called it. Um, okay. so this is when we had uh, one uh, prototype engineer who was awesome, and he designed this kind of superstructure, uh, but it's still fairly fairly clunky. But this was the first thing we built that had multiple cameras kind of facing in every direction. Okay. Um, so this was the first prototype that was basically all our custom hardware. So you can see the form factor is pretty close there. Sure. It's not exactly the final thing, but um, this is pretty close to, you know, all the, all the big ideas were, were in play and this is um, pretty much uh, all our final custom electronics. Um, uh, was was six pairs of camera pretty much like that was at least what you had to hit for the most part in your mind from the beginning? Yeah, that was a that was a fairly early design decision. Like yeah. we wanted the the key thing that we had in mind for basically every product decision is we wanted trustworthy autonomy. We mm -hmm. wanted you to be able to trust the device to fly itself without you needing to to pay too much attention to it. And we felt that one of the real keys, one of the real building blocks to making that happen was having stereo pairs looking in every direction, okay. which has a bunch of other challenges associated with it. Like that's one of the reasons why we developed this um, this perimeter structure out of composites to like to hold all the cameras and the configuration that we needed okay. uh, and be super rigid. Yeah, um, yeah. I was, I was curious about that. Was it a decision from the beginning not to make like the wings fold or anything? Because I know there's some, some drones that have a similar form factor that fold up. Yeah, so it's it's something that we explored, but we thought that this was going to be like a, a superior product experience. It okay. still it still fits into your backpack, um, and it doesn't have the added complexity and weight of folding, which okay. especially for having the cameras around the outside, uh, just just wouldn't really solve. Cool. So you know, around the launch, a lot of people were talking about the cameras, kind of the self flying selfie cam, uh, which you know for a twenty five hundred dollar product, like you know, I, I think that you can see a lot more. Uh, potential in you know what what the one-liner about it could be so as you as you kind of look to the future you know is it are you a selfie cam company <laughs> like what what uh yeah, how do so you characterize we, it we, we probably have like a mixed relationship with the word selfie i mean i think that <laughs> sure. if you just think about cameras in general like first of all cameras are just everywhere in our lives right every smartphone has one actually every smartphone has at least two now um, some have more the major use case for phones is taking pictures most social media is driven by people taking and sharing pictures and video. So cameras, pictures, video are just like a core part of our existence now and it's becoming more central. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about like what are people taking pictures and video of, most pictures and video gets taken of people. Like people are the most interesting subjects. Yeah. You can call it whatever you want really, but we think of this as just like another sort of evolution of the camera. It's a camera that understands the scene it's looking at and has the ability to move itself. And our first use case is, is targeted around capturing amazing content of people doing cool stuff that you would otherwise not be able to get. You know, when people when people take pictures of themselves now, almost by definition, they're not doing anything interesting because sure. they have the ability to like <laughs> stand there and pose or, 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 their, or their buddy is like, is holding yeah. the camera. Whereas this thing allows you to like, capture the stuff that you're most excited about mm -hmm. um, without having the, to think or worry about it. You know, I, it's hard to say what the category is going to be called in the okay. long term, um, but we think it's it's a real thing and it's going to be pretty big. And the, the kind of like consumer market questions. <laughs> that's not a drill, that's a, that's One of a them. prototype. That's a R1 that's strapped down. <laughs> The R1 with the hail fire yeah. uh, integration. A lot of these things sort of look like drone torture chambers where we have the thing like strapped down and then heat it up. Got it. Got to do that testing. We're here.
Illinois creator a new burger bot restaurant with the founder, Alex, who invented this crazy machine we're standing in front of. Maybe you could tell us, how did you get into the idea of building a burger bot? So I grew up flipping burgers, and uh, parents got a restaurant. I've made maybe tens of thousands of burgers in my life, and when your job is to make something like 400 of the same burger every single day, you realize that there are a lot of opportunities to make it just a little bit better, except didn't have the means. So I thought, okay, if better kitchen tools help me make a much better product, why not just take that to infinity? And this is kind of like the ultimate kitchen instrument. We just spent sauce down the milliliter. We just spent seasoning down the gram. There's uh, 11 sensors uh, to watch the temperature of the beef and some AI to make sure we lock in the doneness. When we grind the meat, we literally align the meat and the patty to go along with your, your bite kind of vertically as your incisors come through. So you get a lot of advantage on the texture side of things. So the burgers are tasty and I'm absolutely surprised that they only cost $6. But my question is, what is this gonna do for the future of work and all the people that already work in these kind of restaurants? So, you know, I, I grew up making burgers and that type of job is really close to my heart. And so I thought, okay, if I'm in a position where my job is to do something repetitive all day, how can I make a place of work where I can move from that into doing something that's either more creative or social? And so this place has a decent sized staff, actually, that we're paying everyone, we're paying everyone $16 an hour. On top of that, we're able to give people a 5% time, meaning 5% uh, of the time on the clock, is spending that reading a book or doing something that's gonna benefit them in the long run, as opposed to what I was doing growing up, just doing this over and over all day. And so I think what we're gonna see is an enhancement in terms of our collective skill set, moving into things that are just generally more fulfilling. If you want to go try this new burger, come out to 680 Folsom in San Francisco, and hopefully we're going to see more of these creator restaurants, even kiosk forms, or the full-size version like this around the country soon. That cheese just melted right in. Eat burgers all day long, or like, are you sick of burgers yet? Peak Design has a pretty interesting founding story involving Kickstarter. How did you start all this? Man, I didn't start, I guess it did, <laughs> by a result, start all this, but I just wanted to make a, a thing, which was the capture camera clip, and it was a small aluminum device that would let you take a camera, um, a SLR, and attach it to a backpack strap or a belt or something like that. It was a cool idea I had. I thought I could get people to buy them. Then you got that funded on Kickstarter mm -hmm. and then a couple more different products on Kickstarter and then eventually the bag. Yeah, it was like uh, the, 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 the first product capture was a hit. It was the second most funded project of all time. And that just got the ball rolling, like profitable year, year one. And so I was able to hire some people. And then what we did is we solved the problem that came up. Once you had your camera not on a strap, it was kind of like, well, it's sort of dangerous. It's hanging out there. So the next product was, let's make a strap. And so we invented kind of a way of attaching and removing straps because that was the main pain point there. Then we went back to Clips again, did Clips V2. Then we did Straps V2. It was like four years in. We've got a pretty good following and a uh, famous photographer named Trey Ratcliffe said, I wanna make a bag with you guys. So I kind of opened the door to bags. Fortunately, our lead designer is this magical, incredible, literally one of the world's best bag designers. And so uh, we were kind of off to the races on bags and now we're four years in and loving it. Tell me about the design process here. Yeah, so at Peak Designs, um, we really think of ourselves as a design studio first. Um, and, you know, bags are a, a large part of our business at this point, but we really take a ground up approach just like we would if we were designing any other product. That starts first and foremost with a lot of uh, uh, research into the needs that we're trying to solve for the user, and then it, we, we go and we sketch. The backpack was a, an evolution of the messenger bag, so really kind of trying to pull some of those same hardware cues that, that people really responded to that product with and kind of bring them into, into this backpack form. And then once you guys have it designed, what you want to make, do you guys test material and, you know, 
of uh, sewing and things here in-house? Primarily, we do the development we're doing in-house here is the development of all of the materials. Like you said, we do uh, a lot of ground-up uh, development on our fabrics. Um, our hardware, we have a really robust hard goods design team here, so we've got 3D printers and the old shop and everything like that. Uh, so we're doing a lot of CAD work uh, in-house here. Sewing-wise, we're sewing either like really rough uh, prototypes or working through complex problems. Uh, but the more kind of final production level prototypes we're doing in Vietnam. So the, speaking of the final, how's that process? Where's that process happening? Tell me more about that. It starts with basically you're making these prototypes and you keep revving and revving and going through these different rounds and exploring different things and eventually you start to really refine the, the general design that you think like, yes, this is, this is the one, this is going to solve all our problems here that we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. And uh, from then, it's, uh, it's kind of this re subtle refinement process until we get what we call a golden sample. And essentially, that's a master sample that uh, we, that's what we're going to go to market with and go into production with. What does the future hold? We build products that we want to use as people who work for this company, which is kind of an odd way of approaching things. We're not looking at the market and saying, what does the world want? It's kind of like, what do we want? And we're just hopeful that enough people will continue to have sort of the same set of problems, needs, and wants that we do. Certainly, there's going to remain a focus on camera gear. I mean, we've got a great toehold there. And a, a common thread amongst us is that we love photography. So I think that you're going to see some really core elements of any photographer setup. Um, sort of, you know, we're not making cameras, but we're making the accessories for cameras. So if you can think about what might be the most important accessory to camera users, we're heading that direction. Uh, and we're also very cognizant of the fact that the camera that's inside your pocket, which is an iPhone or a Galaxy uh, or, or a Pixel, is a pretty damn good camera too. That hasn't slipped our notice. So we might be so. expecting a little, little camera case, a little, uh, you know, uh, okay. we'll, we'll see what ends up happening, <laughs> but uh, we're thinking down those lines. So tell me about your latest baby. Yeah, uh, well, this is the uh, this is the 30 liter black backpack, mm -hmm. and really Looks this slick. is kind of by popular demand. Thank you. You know, it's kind of when you put things in all black, it just slick is kind of what comes to mind, and I think this is a great interpretation of that. But a lot of people were getting their 20 liter black backpack; they loved it. It's kind of become our most popular color, so we we were kind of our hands were tied. We had to make it in the 30 liter version, and this is it finally. Awesome. What is, what is this going to cost? Uh, same as our other ones, so two eighty nine for the thirty liter backpack, which, frankly, like for me as a consumer, like I balk at a two hundred eighty nine dollar backpack. Um, it's not something that I would gravitate towards, but when you actually get into this pack and you look at the features, and it feels like, it feels like the right price once you get into it, and that has been the resounding opinion of everyone who owns this product. So we feel real good about it being priced there. Beerbox is an innovative experiential vending machine that dispenses and opens cans of beer at events and venues where we really focus on eliminating long lines. It's a pain that we've all felt at these, at these events, whether you go to a concert with friends or a festival, or you go to a, a Knicks game, it's like, do I really want to go get that drink? I might miss the third quarter, but I really would want that next drink. So you basically pick out of a hat like, okay, or do rock, paper, scissors with your friends. It's like, all right, you go wait in line for 20 minutes, get as many beers as you can. These venues would love to sell more beer at the end of the day, but they're limited with real estate. They can't build more bars in the arenas, nor you know, do they necessarily want to hire more people to staff that. So the beauty of the design is that we could have four or six of these together, and you could have one worker there to check IDs. So it's kind of like a self-checkout at a grocery store or a Home Depot. For us to actually open the can, it's actually a requirement at many of these venues. If you've ever been to a ball game or a concert with your favorite artists, a lot of musicians actually won't perform with closed container. If you ever bought a beer at these venues, you either get it as a draft or they take the lid off or they open it for you. That's because a closed can is actually a projectile. From a design approach, we don't want to do something that was already out in the market. Can we actually make a bar out of it? And we've watched people hang out at the machine at festivals. They eat food on top of it and stuff. They almost attract, you know, more consumers to the machine. It's almost like a magnet because people are like, what are people doing 
over there hanging out. So it's like the tabletop almost becomes a great marketing channel for us as well. Common Sense Robotics is the first robotics company that was designed with the last mile in mind. We do micro-fulfillment centers, smaller than 10,000 square feet, that do fulfillment for e-commerce and grocery space. There are a lot of moving parts, literally. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what's happening when you order uh, some eggs, for instance? Sure. Uh, what are they going to do? What's going to happen is you're going to order your eggs, we're gonna get the order into our micro-fulfillment center, and then the order is immediately gonna send task to robots. We have multiple types of robots that work in a marvelous dance together in order to get your order picked. So for instance, if your eggs were part of a 60 item order, that would be picked in as little as 10 minutes. And the facility would also be located in the centers of cities so that it can get to you, the end customer, within an hour easily. Tell me more about the ground robots in mm -hmm. particular, because obviously it's quite cute to see them moving around. Are they smart? How do they know where they're supposed to be? The ground robots are actually kind of stupid, and it's by design. And that's true to all of our robots. So our robots have sensors, they know to drive straight, they know not to hit objects, etc. very basic things. But really the brain is in what we call the base, which is where we actually have a virtual site and we manage all of the robots, prioritizing all the tasks. So that brain sends the robots tasks and instructions on what to do, go straight, go left, turn right, and they just fill the tasks. And when they fill the task, they pick up these big blue boxes filled with products. Mm -hmm. How do you know where the products are and uh, where they're supposed to pick them up? This is obviously part of the beauty of automation is that any product that goes into our facility gets scanned and located within a specific tote and also even within the tote within a specific bin. And our system at any given time knows for every product that came in exactly where it's located as well as additional information like expiration dates. And it can constantly manage it and move it around to optimize for the movement. So it can think, oh, you're a fast mover, I'm gonna put you closer to the touch point so that it takes less time and robot effort to get to you. How does it work when you are a new customer? Are you buying robots? Are you buying a service? Our model is a fulfillment as a service model. Customers would come into an agreement with us and they would pay us on a per item, per order basis and we would just fulfill it for them. They'd send us their inventory, they'd send us their order information and we'd take care of all the rest. We'd take care of the labor, the facility, the robots, the maintenance, everything that's involved to make sure that the customer gets their perfect order. Why did you originally think about the service approach instead of the technology approach, as you said? I think it's really to do with where exactly that, where we can bring the most value to the market and how we can expand the market and enable players that otherwise can't. Two years ago, DJI transformed its consumer drone business with the foldable Mavic Pro. Since then, the drone giant has added a number of additions to the line, including the lightweight Air and super portable Spark. Introduced at an event last week in Brooklyn, the Mavic 2 Pro doesn't represent a major upgrade from its predecessor, but it does bring some important tweaks to the premium product. The camera is the biggest focus this time around, so much so that the company opted to provide two different SKUs. There's a Mavic 2 Pro, which is the first DJI to sport the Hasselblad camera, and the Mavic 2 Zoom, the first in the line to offer optical zoom, as the name implies. Unfortunately, the swappable gimbal didn't show up this time out. The image and video quality is solid on both models, and for most users, the cheaper zoom is more than sufficient for AV needs. It also includes some cool tricks like the dolly zoom feature, which creates a Hitchcock-like effect. Flying the drones is fairly similar to the predecessors, and while there have been some tweaks on board, you likely won't notice much of a difference, save for an extra couple minutes of battery life. Obstacle detection works pretty well, though we did manage to crash into a tree once the drone was out of our line of sight. The Mavic 2 isn't a revolutionary improvement, nor is it enough to justify an upgrade for Mavic Pro owners, but it's enough to keep it at the forefront of consumer drones. The Zoom and Pro are available now, starting at 1249 and 1449 respectively.
Eisen Triple Thread is a major measure platform where we specialize in building wardrobes based on lifestyle and musical preference. I was that kid that, uh, you know, in terms of style and color, I was super deliberate about what I wore. You know, I was a kid that collected Jordans and wanted to be fashionable because I just cared. And that fueled my desire to go out and learn pattern making. Start traveling the world and meeting with suppliers and just really like figuring out how the process kind of was done at a high level and a respectable level. So there was an attempt at building an enterprise software company in 2013. And that didn't go as planned, which was good because it put me in a position where I said, hey, you gotta figure out what you could do best and what feels natural and kind of comfortable and you can guide this process without relying on others to make your dream come true. Hey, that's it. All right. So, this is the look that you chose from the Fits app um, with a few updates per your request. So, the lining of the inside of the jacket is nice current color. The last buttonhole, sleeve thread, uh, matching the inside lining. Drop down back. <laughs> Shoot. The, the, the music aspect came up about a good year ago. So we were just trying to understand what is it that people, uh, what are they grasping on when they, when they say, hey, I'm looking for something, but I just don't know what it is. Like when there's impulse buying, there's something driving that. So the music piece is what we've determined drives a lot of our cultural understanding, our purchasing habits, emotions, Things of that nature. Spotify allows us to learn what others are doing in real time and, and we can access that information. So that's very valuable because it's a discovery tool. We can understand a little bit more beyond your, your transactional data or oh, you're buying something that looks similar to another group, let's recommend. So it puts a little bit more onus on us to then be a actual taste-making platform. where we're, go we're going for it. We're swinging for the fences every single day, strive for perfection in product. Over time, we're you know, gonna grow and just become more technical, more product savvy. Uh, so, Team Five in San Francisco. Guy tucked in. Carry on. Man. Mm. Ready to go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's walking out here with a suit. <laughs> there you go. About four years ago, Fetch started. We kind of came into the market with a big vision, a long term vision of.
manufacturing and warehousing a, an ideal market for robotics. And like I said, the problem is solvable. It's, it's what roboticists call the semi-structured environment. You kind of know what it looks like. You kind of know what all the, the factors are. And then the people inside that environment are financially incentivized to behave themselves. So if, if, you, if you have a robot riving around, no one's going to jump out in front of it and say, hey robot, did you find me? Or you know, do things like that. And so it's really an ideal area to deploy right now. Manufacturing and warehousing just looked like a really tractable problem from a robotics perspective, but there were a lot of other strong market indicators that drove us towards it, like a labor shortage. I know everyone talks about robots and jobs, but there's a massive labor shortage in warehousing and manufacturing. There's about 600,000 unfilled positions. If you go to any conference today for material handling and logistics, all you're going to hear is, I can't find enough people to do the jobs. Um, it's, it's the number one factor that people talk about when it comes to robots and jobs or just labor in general. Why don't we have something like a dishwasher for folding? We have a dryer, we have a washer. Where is the, is the dishwasher for folding? And that's, that's what inspired me to start working on folding. Folding laundry with a machine is a pain. You know, fabric is really, really difficult for engineers. And if you think about it, you have so many types of items in your laundry and so many fabric types, and you need to make a technology that will handle all of them together, not only handle them, but fold them in a reasonable quality, at speed, and don't forget the part of cost and size, of course. So you have a lot of uh, machines today that are industrialized, but they are room-sized, they cost tens of thousands of dollars and usually they can fold only one item very well. We're doing the majority of items that you have in an average laundry load. We can do shirts, we can do towels, pants, even pillowcases. But we, we said these are the most laborious items. And for example, all the small items like undergarments and the large items like linen, right now they're not in our uh, focus. The large because the machine will have to be larger uh, and the small because I think we can do it faster by, by hand. We've had multiple prototypes along the way and multiple models that go to different markets. And uh, the last one, the, the home version, uh, we've been uh, working on it for two. We're aiming to launch Foldimate or at least the first units will ship towards the end of 2019. It's very, very uh, challenging and we're really trying to make the, that deadline. But as you know, this is a development stage, so uh, we'll keep everyone apprised. But right now, still on target, end of 2019. SPART is a human resilience platform that we started to really reduce injury risk um, using analytics and hardware, a force plate. And that force plate measures how much force or pressure is put in the ground in different directions. And from that pattern, we've been able to both identify and predict and subsequently reduce injuries, initially in athletes, uh, then we moved into the military. and. by how our feet interact with the ground. So we use a jump. And actually from that jump test, the force in the ground, that pattern, we've been able to standardize through software. And that's what allows us to predict injuries to the upper body. There's a lot of balance tests that are out there and, and force plates, you know, the hardware we use have been around for decades. And so it's really the data science that's really allowed us to provide something unique. We're looking for somebody that can make us better and not just you know, provide us capital. And so Playground's expertise, particularly within hardware, was something that really, you know, appealed to us. And so that was the reason why we, we started a relationship with Playground.
you have all of these negative stereotypes against all the people from Oakland. They're looking beyond that to actually help the community. They make sure your school is first. They make sure you're doing good and everything. They check up on you if they see you're down. It keeps me out of trouble, you know. It keeps me occupied instead of doing other things. I could be doing the street. I could be here working out. Guardian's a 501c3 nonprofit gym that gives free boxing and jiu-jitsu to kids after school as well as affordable adult memberships. I was doing jiu-jitsu for maybe eight to ten years at the time and the thing that kind of uh, converged with that at the same time is that I was doing the Big Brothers Big Sisters program and I had a little brother he was uh, 11 years old and he was a great kid. What I kept thinking as we were doing those events was wouldn't it be cool in this case if he really loved to do jiu-jitsu and we could meet at the gym. That was really the other reason that I think the, the idea kind of took off was the combination of realizing people couldn't afford it and also realizing that people like me really wanted to volunteer and give back. So by kind of merging their passion, it makes it really easy for people to volunteer, mentor, and give back. Yeah, I worked at Twitter for a little over three years. I absolutely loved working there. I was there before the IPO, and I worked with some of our largest clients, folks like Comcast and Beats by Dre and people like that. It was really a tough decision, honestly, to, to quit or not. What it really came down to for me is once we started to hit that critical mass, I just felt like it was kind of that once in a lifetime opportunity that I had to go all in on. I learned so much at Twitter about the culture, and I think that's one of the reasons Dick Costolo is such a beloved CEO, is because he talked to the people, he made everyone feel important, everyone thought he was their friend, and I realized that we needed to build a similar type culture here if we wanted to be here for the next couple of decades, right? I felt that was something that I really had to kind of be here, and I wasn't able to fake. I couldn't just throw money at it. Like, I had to actually, like, put the hard work in to do it. I have really mixed thoughts, honestly, about where the, what the tech world has done to the Bay Area. I mean, I think there's the obvious things that we all worry about, the, specifically things like the price of housing going up. In general, tech's fine, it's great, it provides a lot of decent middle-class jobs, but there definitely is um, that element that it's changing our communities, and it's not necessarily good for everybody. And I think in, in some ways, this is our small step at making a small impact on that, right? As so many people in tech talk about today, one of the problems and the reason there's not diversity is because so much comes from referrals. And when you don't have that network to refer you into an internship or a job or whatever it may be, it becomes very hard for you to get in front of the right people and get that job. One of the guys that practiced jiu-jitsu here, he had a restaurant and he comes and donates food for the gym for the kids. And it was, it was summertime, I didn't have nothing to do, nothing better to do, just train. And he, off he offered me a job, and I took it. And I was working with him. I was a prep cook at his restaurant for about two months. The children here are so eager to learn because they weren't raised as athletes, or they weren't raised as, like, they've been boxing since they were 10 or 11. A lot of them are walking in, and they don't all have the same level of comfort walking in. But the thing with Guardian being free and being so convenient is way more welcoming than any of the other gyms I've been or even seen. So I think some of the kids, they walk in from different walks of life and they want to embrace it more. We're teaching them how to punch or we're teaching them how to grapple, but simultaneously we're dealing with immigration issues in their family and their community. We're dealing with their poor academic performance in school and helping to strategize on how they can improve that. We're dealing with teen pregnancy. We're dealing with pressures to join gangs, et cetera, et cetera. All the things that you would imagine somebody might bring into a space like this, uh, we've seen. I actually uh, started competing in jiu-jitsu last year. I did three tournaments and I have one coming up uh, next month. Uh, I had two second places. I used to want to like a long time ago, but never did because I have to pay. And when I found out about this gym, it was like, it was great. Yeah, I think that's one of the most common things we hear is, oh, you're teaching kids how to fight. And that's true, but it really has the opposite effect on these kids where they come in here, we see it over and over again. You take a 16 year old boy, for example, and they come in here and they do a few classes and they realize like, holy crap, like I don't know anything. And it really sort of shaves that, that misconception and that, that false confidence they have off and they have to start building from the ground up. When you give a person who has nothing, when you give them something, 
they're much more in tune with that and they want to develop that and it takes their focus off of the negativity as opposed to taking this tool and running toward, okay, now how do I go mug somebody? That could be on the cover of the Wheaties box. I don't have to spend five years in jail or things like that. I can be what I want to be because I found this, I unlocked my potential inside me. It's about self-control. It's about respecting yourself. It's about respecting your neighbor. And it's about putting expectations on the daily performance of a young adult and saying you will be this thing, this embodiment of integrity or you will not be a part of our community. We do have a food program right now for kids so um, we have a couple of local restaurants that donate food and our kids can eat those healthy meals after training. We do have a small tutoring program which is essentially at one desk at two to three kids maximum per time. We want to take that to a hundred X level and we're really trying to do the same thing that so many other nonprofits and schools and parents are trying to do, which is get kids better grades, make them healthier. We're simply just using martial arts as a bridge to get there. So about a week ago, I found this very cool blockchain project. It's the blockchain terminal, and I have with me Demo. You're the head of product for this, uh, this monster over here. <laughs> Why don't you tell me a little bit about the project, uh, and how is this different from online platforms that you guys have? The whole scope of the project is trying to build an industrial, institutional-grade terminal, similar to what the financial services marketplaces are used to today, and also provide a consolidated view of a very uh, decentralized market right now. The lower panels all around the trading technology, the trading apps, the messaging apps, which are, are much more prevalent now in how people are communicating about what they're willing to do within the market. And the upper panel is more around a app store similar to like the Apple App Store where ourselves as well as other vendors can put their applications in, whether it's news, social, charting, Excel apps, and, and, and other applications in the, in the application. So we wanted to provide a complete view of, of the cryptocurrency marketplace as best we can. Why wouldn't you just do this in a website? I think part of it has to do with, obviously, the compliance guard aspect of our application is logging all that information into the, uh, into the ledger, into the private ledger via our CG uh, blockchain application, and that's why the hardware is, is key to this application. So this is fully compliant, so any, any keystroke I type on here is recorded somewhere? That's the goal, yes. Okay. And that's the only way you could get it on a trader's desk? Yes. How is this different from um, something like a Bloomberg terminal or a, uh, or a Reuters terminal or any of these other tools? Both firms are showing certain aspects of the marketplace, maybe not to the, to the level of depth and breadth that I think an institutional trader would want to have. Doesn't mean that they won't, I just think that they're focused on their core competencies and this is our core competencies really bringing transparency into the crypto exchanges around the world. And you talked with the traders and they said they really wanted a sweet curved screen setup <laughs> that looks like, a, looks like something out of a gaming rig. We're, we're always gathering voice of the customer feedback of what they want, where they want. Again, it's early days for us. We have conceptually understand kind of what traders and institutional traders want and need to have. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're getting feedback back and we're kind of modifying the roadmap as we go based upon kind of voice of the customer and how we're validating things. I believe that sidewalks are sacred, yes, and that we need to create technology that interacts with people in the best way as possible. My name is Felipe. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Kiwi. In Kiwi, we build robots for last mile delivery. Right now, we are the company that have delivered more meals with robots in the world, and the only one doing it at scale. And we are based in Berkeley, and um, we have delivered more than 10,000 orders so far in the last month. We started with one robot going from the, cost, from the restaurant to the customer house, and we found out pretty easy and pretty fast that that was pretty inefficient. Like, restaurants tend to be clustered, and as soon as you send a robot from the restaurant to the customer house, like the second or the third order arrive late, and we created a multimodal system. So we actually have three robots. We have a robot inside the restaurant. We also have a semi-autonomous tricycle that goes in the streets. Right now we have humans uh, uh, driving them. And we have the Kiwi bots. So 
our operations were like this. We have robots deployed in the city, like depending on the demand on the zones. And then we, with the trikes, we pick up orders, we pick up dozens of meals from restaurants, and then we load the robots. And the robots make the last 300 meters. So we actually divided the logistics and right now it, it works. The technology is based mainly in cameras. So our main sensor are cameras. Yeah, so we don't use lidars or we don't use like high-end sensors and that have allowed us to like go beyond uh, like to, to move in a safer yeah, path in our opinion. So right now our solution is like humans plus robots. So with that we can actually offer uh, like a more affordable delivery cost for like for the society and um, make sure that like like these delivery companies and that society can order um, food delivery like in a sustainable way. So the robots, for example, if we are going to start to have more orders in, in a specific zone, the robots can move to that zone. And depending on the demand, like we try to optimize every time the uh, the trike route, yes. So like the robots will try always to like to make sure the trike route it's it's is the as fast as possible. One of the concerns right now that like we have in the space is what is that point where automation doesn't make sense. Right now having humans plus robots makes sense. As soon as we start to like we are pretty sure that we can automate things and uh, we will do it but by now we are using both. Hello, I am here with the Lumos Next Generation Helmet. It's this smart helmet that blinks as you're riding, so it like signals for you. Let's take a look-see and see what it's like to set up. According to the Quick Start Guide, I'm supposed to give the helmet a quick press to turn it on. Boom, it's on. Now I need to test and mount the remote to the handlebar. Now, to be clear, the Lumos helmet and its little juhiki right here have been on the market for a little while, but what's new about this release is Apple Watch compatibility. Instead of having to hit left or right, I could use biker signals, and then, of course, I'd have to do it on the hand that my watch is on, then it'll show up on my helmet. The next step is to sync up my Apple Watch with the helmet itself. So this was me doing, it's me training the watch, like what it feels like for me to say left. And now I need to do the turning right pose. Up, then I'll hit next. All right, now it's calibrating. Okay, now the watch remembers. All right, so I'm just gonna pop this dorky little thing on real quick. Make sure I'm ready to go. It works at times. It's a little buggy with the Apple Watch gesturing. So the, the CEO was telling us via email that it's very sensitive. That is the calibration is pretty sensitive. So I have to make sure I'm doing it in like the exact same motion that I did during the calibration. But I'd say it works like 80% of the time. But if it doesn't, then you have, you know, the little backup and just hit left. All right, so technology. Cyanix is delivering the Aurora. This is the world's first consumer night vision camera, and we're really excited about it. We're hoping to deliver to the world a capability that no one has yet the ability to see at night. We think that the market is underserved. Today, night vision is very expensive, it's low resolution, uh, it's inaccessible to most people. Uh, we know what we can do with our image sensors, so we wanted to provide that capability to the average consumer, wanted to help them bring their night to life, uh, provide what feels like superhuman vision. Uh, the Aurora is something completely different. Uh, if uh, you are out at the transition between day and night, or night and day, a lot of times you can't capture the moments that are important to you uh, with the current technology that's available. At our heart as a company, uh, we are people who want to make a direct-to-consumer product. We love cameras. Contact with the end customer is important. We also make a specialty sensor, 
And this isn't something that necessarily is the scale of a cell phone. We felt like we were best positioned to deliver it to the consumer in the camera product. So at the heart of the Aurora is Psyonix's own proprietary sensors. We've been making night sensors for very low light for night vision for years now. And we've decided to try to bring that capability into a camera for the everyday person. The company's been around for over a decade. Uh, during that time, we've sold mostly image sensors to our customers. Uh, this is our first consumer-based product. Uh, this is our first direct camera product, and we couldn't be more excited about it. The government has been an avid supporter of our products. They're one of our biggest customers. We've raised over $50 million thus far between uh, private equity and venture capital. As we go forward as a company with its success, we'll continue to develop the camera's performance. We'll continue to develop how it interacts with the world. The product goes for sale today for pre-order online at Sionics.com, S-I-O-N-Y-X, at the price of $799. Jetty X-Trex was started in San Diego, founded in San Diego by a few surfers, myself being one of them. Jetty uses a proprietary method to take the cannabis-derived terpenes, which are the flavors and the aromas from the cannabis plant, and we save them and reintroduce them later on in the process. There are a wide range of the terpenes that are found in a variety of different of plants. That's what gives cannabis strains their very defined like, like features, what makes them like noticeable. It's what makes uh, Pure Jack taste like Pure Jack or Granddaddy Perp taste like Perp. <laughs> Don't add anything that is not native to the cannabis plant. You're not like shoving bubblegum flavor No bubblegum flavor, yeah. It's all cannabis flavors from the cannabis plant. and. Um, yeah, that's one thing that we really do like about packs is they go really well together. I mean, the fact that you can set different temperatures on their devices really kind of helps express the good flavors of the cannabis plant. So welcome to PAX First of All. I'm the CEO of PAX. PAX is a consumer technology brand in the cannabis space. We make uh, these wonderful vaporizers for flour as well as oil. And I don't know if Apple does made vaporizers, you know, and they don't, but if they did, we hope, you know, we meet that standard. I think PAX has a, a great lineage of uh, particularly hardware, creating a, a wonderful experience for cannabis users. What I'm really excited about is us moving more into the software realm to create a more holistic experience for people. We have a, two very different product lines. One of them is the PAX 2 and 3, and that takes kind of loose flour. You grind up the cannabis and you put it in there, and it's much more tied to what people would consider to be kind of the original cannabis experience. You get to see the flower. Our other line is, is called the ERA, and so this is actually the ERA. And this line takes these pods of extract of concentrate. <laughs> Yeah, so we use a few small farmers throughout the state of California, and they all bring everything in through here where it gets quarantined, and we move on this way. You can see uh, we're getting like some of the grinding uh, done in this area. So once everything passes the quarantine, all of the plant matter gets ground up in here and ready to put into the socks for the extraction process. This machine uses like volatile solvents to run through the plant material and carry away the fats, the waxes, and the oil. Um, it goes through these three tubes here where it comes out of the fourth one, and that'll be your crude oil. This machine uh, typically has about 10% yields from the starting plant material. We'll get about 1% yield from the final extraction process. So this is a secondary filtration process and it's going to separate out even more of the chlorophyll and make a more pure product to go into the roto vaps.
This machine here is the rotary evaporator, also called the Rotovap for short. It has a warm water bath here, which is just hot enough to evaporate the ethanol and leave the oil in here. The ethanol will float up here where it condenses on these coils and falls into this container. You'll be left with a mixture that is all oil um, and ready for the next extraction process. The oil is put in at the top where it drips down through here and you can see like some of the drips even happening floats down through here and there are wipers inside that separated out by the molecular weight. And then so through here you'll get the oil which typically comes out about 90% THC. It's the good stuff. We were looking for a differentiator. Everybody was in these similar 510 cartridges. That was kind of the industry standard and PAX was the first company to come out with something different that had tech beyond what everybody else had. They had a closed loop system, the Bluetooth applications, all that stuff was just next level for the industry. So we have almost 300 different SKUs of pods in the market. People can choose one that suits their mood or suits the effect they're trying to get. So I, I think in a lot of other spaces that they're mature enough. If you take like alcohol or other things, people are familiar enough at a certain point in life where they know what a, what a dose or a serving is. You, you understand what a glass of wine will feel like. One of the, the issues new people have to this world of vaping is that they don't really have a sense of what a serving is or what a dose is. With this Era device, you can pair it to your phone, it gives them several settings, micro, small, medium, and large, and then when they start um, smoking out of their vaporizer, it'll just turn off and flash little aqua lights letting you know that you've reached that amount. Of course, it's all up to you. You can turn that off, you can change the setting, but we developed this because we know that people really like to have repeatable, predictable experiences. We have everything from, you know, veterans to, you know, folks that are part, you know, affected by the opioid crisis, cancer patients, all the way to direct legal users, and it varies by state. And so we take that responsibility of, are we always doing the right things at the company to provide the best experience possible. That's the mission. And so it doesn't just come from me, it comes from my obligation to everyone that works here and then the obligation of all of us to this much broader dialogue around legalization uh, and what it means for these different communities. Um, and so we're a small part of that. And 10 years from now when the history books are being written, it was a messy space, but these guys tried to do the right thing. That's important to us. Los Angeles to San Francisco Bay. Let me hear you say, I love California. And we never
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage TechCrunch senior writer and your Battlefield host, Anthony Ha. Hello and welcome back to the start of Battlefield. We are about to start round two. By the way, a couple people asked me backstage who is the person who's just been shouting yeah all the time. That's actually John Schieber, an editor at TechCrunch. John, how are you feeling? He's super excited. I hope you guys are too. Um, so again, we're going to see four startups in this session. They're going to be presenting for six minutes. There's going to be six minutes of Q&A with a whole new set of judges. I don't want to waste any more time, so let's bring out our judges. First up, we have Kim Mai Cutler, who's one of the successful examples of what we like to call TC to VC. She's a partner at Initialize Capital. Before that, she was a journalist for 10 years at TechCrunch, Bloomberg, and The Wall Street Journal. Next up, we have Matthias Marr, managing partner and co-founder at Talis Capital. He's also the co-founder and executive chairman at Pirate Studios. Next up, we have Nanad Moravats, founder and managing partner at DN Capital. Previously, he was a partner at Advent International in London. Next up, we have Sophie Quidenis Walforce, founder and CEO at Omnius, which aims to redefine how people work and how companies handle business operations. Previously, she founded Quidenis Technologies. 
Next, we have Sitar Telly, founder and managing partner of Connect Ventures, which has invested in more than 40 companies across Europe. So give it up for all of our awesome judges. Let's bring out our first startup, Loro. Presenting for Loro are Johei Song and Vanessa Cunha. This is our friend Steve. He was a very outdoorsy and adventurous landscape designer. But his life completely changed after he was diagnosed with the ALS, mm -hmm. which is a muscle degenerative disease. Now he cannot turn his head and he lost his voice. And people with physical challenges has limited field of vision and difficulty with simple movements such as pointing which leads to inefficient communication. And Steve is now alone. There are more than 17 million people on a wheelchair with similar conditions like Steve. Without independence and safety and social connectivity. Here where Loro comes into play. Loro is a smart personalized companion for wheelchair users like Steve. Let's move to the demo, please. Hi, TechCrunch Berlin. We integrated text-to-speech technology for Loro to speak his friends naturally to improve accessibility and usability. As you can see, Loro can be mounted on any part of wheelchair, and then the app can be downloaded on their smart device. Loro also has a 360 rotation and fully captured the surroundings. Now, Loro, uh, Vanessa, Controlling Loro just using her eyes. Our user-friendly interfaces are allowed to user to use uh, each features through a variety of input devices, including eye tracking, touch screen, and head mouse, and so on. Move to the second device. It is hard for certain users to move their heads during the conversation, or just track the movement. So when Loro sees friends, Loro easily just follow around and keeping the person in the center to enhance the quality of a communication, and also pointing often impossible. So laser pointer facilitates instant gesture communication. Loro is also a connected device. As more users engage with uh, Loro, Loro, we capture that data and they convert it into wheelchair accessible navigation and mapping system. And Loro also will be compatible with smart home devices. Move back to slide. Through our partners with NGOs, we conducted intense user testing with more than 45 people with various conditions, with iterating every time. Loro built for end user first. They expressed it will help them drive more safely and communicate more effectively. There are 40% of family members experience bankruptcy because existing assist devices are outrageously expensive. Our competitors are social robots, other assistive devices like Tecla or Toby, but they are either expensive or not designed for disability needs or very limited. Loro empowers people with disability with a great values and affordable price. Ele our niche market is 11 million people from ALS, multiple sclerosis, and spinal injuries. Then we expand our market to Parkinson, cerebral palsy, wheelchair market, which is 17 million people. By capturing our first market, we generate 1.4 million in the revenue first year after we launch, and then 3.5 million following years. Our estimate margin of our first product will be five, 55%. We adopted B2B model, 
through our partners with NGOs, hospital insurance company, and wheelchair companies. Roro will be manufactured and supplied to part, uh, patients through our partners. Roro also will be available via online retailers with $500 per unit and $10 for monthly subscription fee. Partners including ALS Association, Massachusetts General Hospital are heavily connected in our industry. Also, we have strong network of our mentor from various backgrounds, especially Kim Fred, who is the founder of ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. We, our team was founded in Harvard Innovation Lab, a place for innovator entrepreneurs with great resources. We are a passionate, diverse team of innovators. Loro will give people with a physical challenge the to connect and control and communicate with the world. Go to Loro XYZ. Wow. All right, judges. So I got a question. What's the biggest use case of the patient actually using the wheelchair and how integrated is the technology with the actual functioning of the wheelchair? The first use case is we is going to be camera. When they drive drive the wheelchair, the most uh, wheelchair users are afraid of going out because they not just afraid of being hit by car, but also running over someone else's toe or someone behind. So giving them a full surrounding vision is going to give them more independence and then going, that thing going out to the... And using LiDAR technology in, inside that then? Yeah. Oh. Um, so, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Please. Oh, can you talk about some of your progress to date in terms of some of those initial partners? You talked about like the insurance companies and the health organizations. Um, you know, how, wh what, do you have any initial partnerships or letters of intent currently? Um, the two partners I mentioned, AAS Association and Massachusetts General Hospital, are expressed really high interest in on pre-ordering or providing patients for the beta testing. Mm -hmm. And we are working on finalizing agreement, but we are still, it's ongoing. Uh -huh. My question and uh, social impact yeah. sounds like amazing. So, you know, congratulations. And um, on, on the competition, you, you mentioned there's some competition. So are you the best or the cheapest or where do you fit into that? I would like to believe that we are both because we integrate like several technologies, a really high price for the other ones. But we, with, with single one device, they have like a really user-friendly device and with all the features they need. So we are cheaper and we integrate everything they need. Otherwise, they will have to buy several devices. I have a follow-up question. <coughs> Sorry, my voice on the, pr um, the price. So what is your um, production strategy? Where do you produce? And so from um, my point of, or my experience in the hardware business, that was my previous company. So mm -hmm. congratulations that you are brave enough to enter that space. <laughs> um, it's all the, the tricky part is the, the um, production in the first step because you need to produce a high quantity to yeah. achieve this price, and you um, yeah you need a production or uh, distribution partner who gives you an LOI and the quality you cannot prove the quality. So how do you think about that? We've been contacted to first local manufacturer companies because the first round is going to be um, low number of units. And then we, after we launch our product, we can talk to, we, we can talk to another bigger manufacturer company to increase the margin of our product. How, how are you cheaper than the others? What are you not doing that they are? Can you repeat the question? You said you're cheaper mm -hmm. than the others. How are you cheaper? Why are you cheaper? Usually the assistive devices, they are around 3,000 uh, each. So what we are offering, it's like $500. Uh, it's, this price is also like we will perform more testings, but the maximum amount that we want to do is 1,000 because we research with our patients as well how 
it's supportable for them to pay. No, just, no, but, yeah, but just to add it to the mm. question, uh, the reason we are cheaper than other technology because we our innovation is coming from the integration, then inventing the new technology. So we, yeah. What are your backgrounds? Um, I'm coming from architecture and design. I'm a biomedical engineering. OK. And who does all the business decisions on your, on your team, on your go-to-market strategy? And Unfortunately, he's not coming today. Okay. But we have a business uh, ex um, expert in our team. OK. Mm -hmm. I, I, have you thought about any in integrations with insurance companies? And yeah, do yes. your com competitors do that already? Yeah, we, we are very early stage startup. And we just start talking to one of the insurance uh, expertise. And then we have heard that we have heard that we might be able to uh, cover by insurance with our device. And your competitors, any of them are covered by insurance in whichever market? Um, first, we we'll start with AALS, okay. and then we can. I move mean, on the competitors that you talked about are they are they on insurance in in US or in Europe or somewhere? Mm. Can you get them through insurance? Uh, some of them, yes, but it depends on insurance coverage. Okay. How advanced are the wheelchair companies? Obviously, in cars, we now have Teslas and we have autonomous cars. That's obviously an old wheelchair, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> sort of basic. How advanced is the wheelchair technology getting? Is it to the point where, you know, I say I want to go over there, can it do it automatically? or okay. who, And who is leading that space and are you working with them? Because I obviously... ALS, it goes very quickly. A friend of mine had it, and mm -hmm. he passed away in two years. It was very, very sad uh, to hear about it, and I know how dramatic that can be, but they, they can't do anything yeah. when they get this. Uh, true. Um, Answer quickly. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, we try to get the Power Witcher, because our first market is using, mostly using Power Witcher. Um, but the, I don't think it's like a self-driving wheelchair is not really commercialized yet. But the power reachers are mostly they control by the user with the joystick or even oh. they use their eye tracking to control. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay, give it up for Laura. <laughs> Let's bring out our next company, Spin Analytics. Presenting for Spin Analytics is Panos Skliamis. Hello, Berlin. Hey. hey. <laughs> Hello, Berlin again. <laughs> Ten years ago, few people were thinking about risk or bank regulations. Today, credit risk management has become a major priority in the whole banking industry. And the big challenge is how to develop fast, high-quality credit risk models. Behind each credit product or loan, there is one or more models. Banks use thousands of models, which are still developed manually. The average time to develop a model is six to nine months, and the average cost is at least half a million. We are an experienced team of bankers and credit risk experts. We have been developing models for the last 26 years. Our CTO, Elias. He's one of the best credit risk modelers in Europe. He was the group head of credit risk analytics for a large European bank for 25 years. We coded our expertise in an artificial intelligence engine, and we introduced Risk Robot. <laughs> risk Robot completely automates the manual process of developing and validating regulatory banking models. Let me show you how this works. First, we ingest any kind of banking data. Then the machine automatically applies all the banking regulations, like Basel III, IFRS 9, CCL. And then it automatically develops the model and the model documentation. And this is in ours. Move to the demo. Let me share with you our screen from our CTO's desktop application. Ilya, you can start the demo. So we have developed Risk Robot as a main platform and hundreds of applications around this, which we are called satellite applications. This is an example of the 
corporate portfolio in a bank, actually a large bank, where we have ingest financial and non-financial data, data, behavioral data. We develop a model in ours, and now Elias is presenting us the UI and how this happens regarding the projections about the credit worthness of a specific company. We'll run a projection with the finances of the company. Yeah, we just did that. This takes actually four weeks in a bank. And actually, Elias is doing more. Elias, yeah, please continue. This helps us actually the rating of the company. Let's move to the rating. Yeah. Move back to the demo, please. Move back to the demo, please. Can I see my demo, please? Yeah, here. So, Ilya, just stay there. Hello, Berlin. OK, this was an example of a very fast automation in a bank. Let's move back to the presentation, please. Yes. So, this is a game changer for the whole banking industry, as it reduces the time by 95% and the cost up to 70% less and works globally. Our competitors, they still use manual job as the banks. So we are faster, cheaper, and smarter. We use AI expert systems. This is a SaaS pricing model. We start with hundreds of thousands per client per year that goes to millions for full license. Microsoft, Alibaba Cloud, and Infosys all announce big partnerships with Spin Analytics because we are increasing the cloud consumption. We started from the west, and we are moving to the east, and we just opened our new APAC office in Singapore. And this is live. We have six paying customers, 20 pilots running in three continents, and I'm pleased to announce that BBVA, the global leader in open innovation and banking innovation, agreed after a pilot process where B Risk Robot developed eight models in 10 working days, when usually it's six months per one, global implementation for 35 countries. <laughs> so we have a great team, an amazing product, and a real plan. We are going to be in the top 35 banks by 2020. Sky's the limit. Join us. <laughs> Judges. Yeah, so I have a, I have a question. Um, of course. <laughs> we are in a similar space, so I, I for automating claim handling, and you said we completely automate the process. And yes. So I'm, I'm interested in the confidence score you reach and um, how do you think about accuracy and what's, what the threshold is. Yes. And if, so is there any man in the loop? Any man. Any man in the loop? So, so what's... What's the concept around the accuracy and? Yes, so you are talking about the credit risk modeling. Side. Yeah. OK. So these are PD, LGD, EAD models that the banks use for the loan portfolios. So this means that uh, these are behind uh, a, a product like a credit card, auto loan, whatever. And when the, there is an application, somebody sends the data inside, press the enter, and the model is running. This usually, this model takes months to de be developed because they have limitations of the data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we develop actually a system that automates the manual process. What's the manual process? Today, a modeler will communicate with his IT, will receive data. Actually, they will clean the data. This takes weeks, and then he will run the modeling process that he knows. This means that takes significant time, but doesn't mean that it's correct. Because a model is a person, and he knows a couple of methodologies. The system has more than 200 methodologies, and it's optimized to avoid overfitting. So accuracy ratio is one metric. Even if you have a high accuracy ratio, it doesn't mean that it works next, next year. If it doesn't work next year, this means a default for the loan portfolio. Yeah. So a too big to fail bank will be failed, actually. Yeah. And I have a follow-up question. You talked about on-premise. Yes. So how can you access the improved models to to get better over time yes. when it's on-premise? So, uh, we can actually implement on-premise or in the cloud. Yes, <laughs> uh, but I guess most in of both them case, want to have it on-premise. Yes, OK. Yeah. If it is on-premise, it's the same process. For us, it doesn't matter, actually. It's a, the database that is in the cloud. Uh, and so we connect 
every loan portfolio with one ETL. Okay. And this is done once, one day. And that's it. Then every data that comes inside from the bank, from any source, demographic, social, different data, extra data, we're not a data company, we're a fintech. This automatically updates the model every month or whenever they update the database. And this means that the model is already calibrated when this happens every 12 months. Cool. Thank you. Is your business model to go after banks or also fintech startups that obviously would like to have this uh, risk yes. model faster? And uh, This applies to everyone. Uh, we started from the global banks because we follow the global regulations. So it's fintech and regtech. The obligation say, uh, says that, uh, the regulations say that, okay, you have to develop the model today and you have to validate it ongoing every year after until you get rid of the loan portfolio. And this creates a huge fixed cost for the banks today, which is in millions or multiple millions. Mm. Uh, we started from there because there is a huge traction there. We have more than 100 banks. We just closed one new pilot yesterday with Standard Chartered in London. And uh, it can be applied to the challenger banks where they don't have the teams, but they need the technology and can be applied to any lending uh, or loan uh, business. So a small fintech that wants a model faster, if they have the data, they can develop it. Even if they don't have the data, we can develop a generic model very fast. They can develop actually with the system. And then as they input more data, the model will be updated automatically. Mm. And we'll write also the documentation, which is ready for the regulators. The documentation takes two months to be written by the teams today. Here it takes three hours. With the banks, are they running the, uh, the software on their servers or doing it through cloud? They can choose, whatever. Wh but it's their cloud. Yeah, sure. So it's secure. Yeah. Can you talk about how you developed your pricing model? And then of the six initial bank partners that you have, are those pilots? How would the contract value change over time if those pilots converted to something more long term? Yes, so we have a pricing model which is the limited and the unlimited version. Uh, the Full version means that you buy the software and you develop or validate as many models as you want. Uh, this means that if you are a bank like BVA, that they have 1,000 models, 35 countries, the same regulations everywhere, which means scalability, they can do that unlimited. And this is a flat license fee per year, recurring, ongoing. If they choose the limited version, this means they buy a, a license for the implementation and then a package of models, which it's again a cost per model. And this, it's recurring cost per package of models. We show that we, we identified that this model works for the banks because they start with a small package, 50 models, let's say, and then they upgrade that. For us, this means zero cost. They, we have just to change the password that they can develop more models. Mm -hmm. um, um, question? Yeah, so, um, on, I want to ask the same thing what Sophie was talking about. So uh, you said there's a manual way how, how the data first we are not in. doing manual way. It's automated. I know. You, so you're, you're automating it. At the moment, it's manual. You're saying that's the yes. pain point. So can you go deeper into it? What, 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 does, the, what does the data look like? What yes. So these are transactional uh, data from the banks, from the porf loan portfolio. So, so when, someone's, uh, when a person has a, a mortgage, he pays that per month, and this creates a data stream. And these are the data that they have today. But these data are limited because they're already biased in a way. For credit risk modeling, they have limitations, usually. So the modeler, the expert, which means that he's someone with a big experience in the bank, he has to take assumptions based on the methodologies, regulations, and the business targets. And these assumptions are not, uh, there is not a Bible that you know the assumptions. You have to have expertise. We have one of the best experts, and we have a big team now of experts, and we coded all the assumptions. This is what we did. So now when the system identifies a raw data, it understands what kind of data it is, and automatically takes the assumptions, write that in the, writes that in the documentation, and creates the final data sample that is based on this specific data set. This would be electronic data already when you deal with it. You're not dealing with paper and extraction of data from paper. No, to no, no. There's no, no the it's bank it's already yeah, has yeah, the data. Yeah, yeah, the bank. Yeah. But okay. they can add more data source. Let's yeah. say they are going to Asia, they are going to a country, they don't have enough data. Yeah. They buy a database. Yeah. Who knows what is correct from there? Yeah. They have to take assumptions. So we do that with the system now. Understood. Okay. All right, we are out of time. So one more round of applause for Spin Analytics. <laughs> Good. Let's bring out our next startup, Politea. Presenting for Politea are Farouk Tunker and Tasia Antonova. 
Thank you. Cities provide a vast variety of services to their citizens on a daily basis. Roads and infrastructure, parks, public education or health, just to name a few. A medium-sized city spends up to 100 million per year just on all its services. But when it comes to decision making, local governments step in the dark. And although cities collect a lot of data about themselves, it's just not available to city leaders. The problem is the data is trapped in silos. Cities have many different legacy systems. Sometimes data is scattered across Excel files or just exists on paper. It takes a lot of time and effort to aggregate that data manually. And it costs a city, a medium-sized one, up to 100,000 euros per year on that manual data processing alone. We solve that problem. Politea is a platform for mayors, treasurers, department heads, and city council members. We take data from any legacy system and produce insights actionable to governments to run the governments and reach their goals. The platform is modular and aligned with the most important city services, ranging from childcare to fire departments up to infrastructure. Last month, we've launched our first product module in the field of childcare. With its help, city leaders can track their performance, optimize their costs, or demand the forecast over the next years. But let me explain you in detail how a client uses the product in reality. For that, let me introduce you to Mike Wedel, head of central services of the city of Oranienburg. Mike wants to prepare for the next city council session. The topic is childcare. It's one of the toughest challenges in Germany currently. There are more than 300,000 children that aren't able to get a spot in the local kindergarten today. Wow. So how many spots are available? Will our spots be sufficient next year? And do we have to build a new facility? Those are the questions that keep coming up each and every council session. Instead of requesting reports from different departments, Mike just logs into Politea. In the graph above, he sees that the utilization rate has gone up. He scrolls down to the table below, and he detects that some of the facilities have gone above their capacity. Mike wants to check which area of the city has the worst rate. In dark blue, he sees it's the area of Lindenberg. Mike switches to the Politea forecast. Already next year, he sees that Oranienburg will hit the critical point when demand will exceed the available spots. And even worse, in four years from now, there will be as many as 230 spots missing. So together with the mayor and the treasurer, they decide to sit down and build a new facility. So how do we make that happen? The data bridge is a standalone software that is installed on the client server. We connect the data bridge to the databases and run jobs and queries on a daily basis. And if the data is just in raw format, no problem, we digitize it as a service. Our competition, looking at legacy systems, they just can provide automatic integrations to all systems. Consultancies deliver static and expensive reports, and US GovTech startups they just can't meet European localization requirements. We cover all of that. We, starting this year, generated already 50 strong leads and three paying customers that use our product for decision making. The GovTech market is young and has high potential in Europe. Our product lies at the intersection of local government IT and consulting and has an annual value of 1.6 billion in the European Union as a market size. Starting in Germany, we want to scale soon to other European markets. We do that by first run regionally distributed sales teams to convince customers on site with a modular pricing to win contracts below procurement thresholds. And of course, we scale through political networks and social proof. Our business model is based on a one time setup fee and annual license fees. The setup fee is based on the number of integrations to the legacy systems, and the license fee is based on the modules and inhabitants count. Our team combines the best of two worlds. Our CPU has 
15 years of experience in digi building digital products. And I have a public sector background. I advise the CDU, including Angela Merkel, on urban policy. We're supported by successful entrepreneurs and uh, as investors and public representatives as advisors. Our vision is that city leaders across Europe make data-empowered decisions, improving the life of millions of their citizens. Create a more efficient and effective government today. Go to politea.com. Thank you very much. OK, judges. I'll go. Um, so we invested in a company called Lagan, which was government CRM, and we eventually sold that uh, a couple of years ago. One of the issues with selling into this sector is the sales cycle it takes a long time. They're very skeptical. You know what I'm talking about. Do you have a what's your go-to-market strategy and what's your partner strategy? Yeah, I can I can answer that. Go-to-market strategy is basically what I also represented. So we do it politically because the biggest driver is social proof. So if one city in a certain region is a champion and bought our product, they already invite other cities. We have one example now in Brandenburg. We yep. gain one lead, and they just invite 10 other cities to the meeting to show them That's this true. is how we do it. Yeah. In partner strategy, we partner up with verticals that can deliver data and also profit that they are basically shown on the platform, the data. And we do that with end-to-end -end solutions because we have the richest database there. Okay. Is it, is it self-served or is it is a fully managed service? I can see them like it and then stop using it because something doesn't go well. And is it, full, is it fully managed? Uh, well, we support them, of course. We also educate them how to use it. It's definitely self-manageable, uh, but we're always there to help them. The issue is also that um, governments are not really performance-driven yet. They don't track <laughs> their data, so it's quite a new thing to them. We also partner with the most innovative customers. They reach out to us themselves. Um, and uh, that's one of the challenges to shift this paradigm to make it more based on decisions. Do, you, do you then track remotely their usage and step in if? Well, we can see the usage if they use it. Uh, we don't go in details of the data that they request. Uh, but we talk to them basically weekly. We also follow up. We do extensive re user research. Um, we continue working with those cities that we already have on board because we develop new modules with them. So next module is schools and demography, and for that we talk with them all the um, time. <coughs> Sorry. Oh. oh, can you talk about the initial setup process? I mean, what is the price point that you need to get to bypass the RFP process, and then how do you convert that, um, that initial price point to the, the long-term licensing fee, and what kind of process do you usually have to go through for that? When I got it right, you mean where's the threshold where procurement right, right. steps yeah, in, right? yeah. yeah, It depends on the city's uh, budget uh, constitution. It ranges between 10K and 20K on the contract size. And we, the lowest for the smallest city that we can go in is 3 to 4K per year and a setup fee of 5,000, for example. Mm -hmm. And if it's go, depends on the length of contracts, of course, then you get into a cycle. But usually, they can also use some laws in the European Union, for example, if you have a very innovative product and they, they can compare it, they can use a paragraph to procure it without long cycle, basically. Mm -hmm. And then can you also talk about what it takes in terms of manpower to serve each initial contract? Mm -hmm. um, because there's a you know, part that's more automated and then there's also this more um, consultancy type of structure where you'd have to clean the data. Look, Yeah. Um, okay, so for cleaning the data, uh, the budget, so the main data that overarches the government services, like budget, personnel data, citizen registry, is all already quite clean and well maintained because it's really regulated. For the um, more module related software, like childcare software, there we see some issues in data in different cities, it's different systems, and also they track th things differently. Um, and for that, yeah, we do support them, but also we tell them that our insights are as good as your data. So we also encourage them to take ca better care of their data in their systems. Actually, I have a, a follow-up question to that. So your software sits on top of their database. How good are cities at capturing data? Because it's garbage in, garbage out if they're not. <laughs> Uh, well, they have to report to the other institutions. For example, cities report to counties, 
yeah. um, on a quarterly basis mainly, and uh, of course they have to provide real numbers. And those numbers are provided by, uh, for example, in child care, child care facilities report to the city. They review the numbers, then they send it to the county, so it's fairly reviewed process already. Okay. Um, <coughs> you mentioned that in comparison to your competitors, you can access all legacy systems. That sounds awesome to me. <laughs> <laughs> you have to yeah. <laughs> talk about this um, in more detail. <laughs> and is GDPR a problem for your data bridge? Mm -hmm. Except, uh, answer that quickly. Um, the competitors are mainly, the closest competitors are budget softwares because they have the horizontal view on the city, but they are basically trapped in the vertical. So they have products that also use some KPIs from other data sources, but it's always manual input because if they go to other city with a different budget software, it's not working. So it basically they are locked in in their market. And the second question was about GDPR. It's of course, that was the first thing that we did. Our contract first is based on all GDPR paragraphs. So it's a long attachment list. And also the data bridge anonymizes the data on their service, so it's in their sphere legally, mm -hmm. and we reach the data that we get is anonymized and not personal. But you can use the data you get to improve the models. Sorry. You can uh, how, can you, can you use the data? So what what is helping your IP to get better and better? What is what is the concept around the IP? Um, if I understood you correctly, we do have the clean data. We can see this data. And in the future, we're going to be using it for um, extensive forecast, for example, for the budget, uh, for the demography, or in particular in child care or schools, the demand, focus the demand. Um, so that clean data we can use. And uh, the team of data scientists will be cool. working on that, for sure. That will be definitely the next step for yeah, our that's product. The next step. All right, give it up for Politea. We have one final startup in this round. That startup is Gravity Earth. Presenting for Gravity Earth are Johannes Ebert and Paul Longwa Marine. Today, one billion people are unable to prove who they are. Not having a recognized identity prevents them from accessing essential services. Impossible to buy a SIM card or open a bank account. Impossible to access child benefit if you cannot prove the number of children that live in your household. And very difficult to find a job if you cannot prove your academic and professional track record. Yet, the information to build a trusted identity profile is out there for everyone. It exists in the memories of the members of your community. It exists in the Excel sheets and databases of organizations, county governments, and savings groups. This data can reliably prove your age, your creditworthiness, and much more. If only it was all in one place and under your control. Introducing Gravity a self storing digital identity wallet that allows everyone to build a trusted identity profile based on verifiable personal data. Your peers, the organizations that hold information about you, can submit and validate credentials. Every validation reinforces your profile, and you decide which part you want to share. Gravity is built for strong communities and weak institutions, where social validation has long been used to establish identity. It is maximally inclusive. We built USSD menus that work on every mobile phone without the need for internet access. Move to demo. So here you see Paul's Gravity wallet and the kind of credentials he can aggregate. The Red Cross wants to implement a cash transfer program for youth under 30 years. And Paul wants to prove his eligibility. So he invites his community leader, Vincent, in Nairobi to validate his year of birth. OK, move to video. So Vincent has received an SMS asking to provide Paul's year of birth. By replying, he makes a claim about Paul. And this claim will have a high weight due to Vincent's position of trust as a community leader. OK, uh, move to demo. 
Greetings. Paul has received the claim and he can now go ahead and share his year of birth with the Red Cross that has just saved days in uh, on the ground fieldwork to identify its program participants. Move to presentation. So a proof of Vincent's claim is stored on the blockchain so the organization can see mm. when the claim was issued and by whom. Also, since claims are atomic and can be contradictory, Gravity provides a trust score for every identity attribute that takes into account the number of claims as well as the trust of the issuing entities. Our competitors like EverID and Evanem, they work on developing blockchain protocols for registration and sharing of ident existing identity credentials and biometrics. And this technology is important. However, we don't think it will be the determining factor of success for self sovereign identity. Instead, we want to build an ecosystem for our platform in a close-knit, locally restricted community using our strong local footing. Also, we want to build a product that reflects the reality in so of social interactions and how people uh, create trust in the local context. This is Kakuma Refugee Camp in northern Kenya that hosts uh, almost 200,000 refugees. I was there just last week. We work with an NGO there that runs schools and life skills programs to better track attendance and performance. And these education micro-credentials will fill the wallets of 2,000 users. Being able to prove these credentials and link them to other parts of your identity can be crucial for a refugee's progress in society, for example, by obtaining a scholarship. Our, um, by strengthening uh, the identification of beneficiaries, our solution has clear relevance for organizations providing educational, health and financial assistance. Cash transfer programs alone have reached a volume of 5 billion this year and are growing fast. And tomorrow it will help the 400 million unbanked in sub-Saharan Africa to access financial services, a $1 billion market. Our business model is transactional. The relying party is charged a fixed fee every, every time they uh, make an identity check and part of this fee is transferred to the user. Our team has decades of experience in mobile financial markets in Africa, in blockchain technology and data privacy. I myself have spent years building products for the East African market. Everyone has a story. Now let's give that story power. Join Gravity to give everyone a recognized identity no matter where and who they are. Thank you. Oh, Judges. Judges. Well um, can you talk about what the experience is like for an individual being onboarded onto this for the first time? And then can you also talk about what your strategy is for <coughs> um, getting organizations, convincing organizations that they should use this as a valid form of ID? Did that use it so that, uh, your, The initial organizations that are on there, that, uh, how do you convince them that they should accept this as a valid form of ID? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of the user journey, uh, we work, especially in the setting in Hakuma, with NGOs that sort of provide trainings. Mm -hmm. So the onboarding is at one point when the training happens, we sign them on, they create an account, and we create an account for them. And then it is not necessarily about identity to access like for example is in terms of existing a bank account so what we're trying to convince is first of all organizations to share the personal identifiable information or the data like micro credentials around education that are more like the larger context of identity like the personal data part of identity and then um, yeah in order uh, to use that as like a valid identity that depends on if we're in a regulated context or not and uh, yeah for now it's really aggregating signing users, uh, organizations up that have alternative data and use that as sort of their beneficiary tracking tools. I guess to expand on the question is yes. how do you prevent fraud and yeah. how do you convince um, any customers to, to, to believe that, you know, that that is actually true? Yes. The I mean, yeah, um, that's a good point. So, of course, um, Right now, the alternative they have is go to the community, get the community together, go to the community leader and do the social vetting thing and do that sort of every time and it costs a lot of money. So we, what, do, what we do is sort of we digitize that, we take it as, you know, as a fact that this is how so validation happens in the lack of identity and 
uh, yeah, we can we can improve that and add layers of security because we can give different levels of trust also to which kind of people yeah. make the validation. But I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the community, but people in the community might not know what is my date of birth, and they'll just say, "Yeah, that sounds about right." Matthias is 29. Yeah. I'm not, but um, you know, you can. Yeah, that it, um, you control that. Yes. So we we uh, we have a, a second layer on arch architecture where we reconcile the claims, the inconsistencies, depending on which entity issued which, uh, which kind of, uh, which made which kind of statement. And yeah, that is something we, 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 we're thinking about. But again, the alternative is to do that on the ground and have even more traceability, even less traceability. Okay. Do you use biometrics um, to identify the people, like fingerprint or eye or face? Mm. Yeah, so biometrics can be included as part of the identity attributes you collect. So we have quite a, it's a framework and you can add different type of attributes. Yeah. And how many people are on the platform already today? So we did an internal pilot with 3,000 users in Kenya, 75% uh, of them in the countryside, to test you know, the user experience about using the USSD menu, which is the main interface getting referrals and so on. That's where we noticed that 30% of them had discrepancy with their mobile operator's KYC, and 20% no uh, actually uh, national identity. Now this is disconnected, and the next step for us is to move on with this deployment in Kakuma refugee camp and to reach 2,000 users. You said that you, uh, you provide a trust score for each person providing a claim. Mm. How do you scalably figure out the trust level of each person providing a claim? Yes, so yeah. there's um, an initial trust score for people in the network, an organization that makes, uh, you know, an organization that runs schools that makes claims about education has a high trust score for this type of claims. A community leader also has a high initial trust score. How do you know they're a community leader? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about scaling this up, right? So I, I get yes. that yeah. as a pilot, you can do yeah. that. You can go into a community and yes. figure it out. But if you're launching it in a country, yeah. there's millions of people, how do you know who the community leaders are? Yes, so I mean, being a community leader is an identity attribute on gravity that other people can vali validate. Mm -hmm. So this will increase your, this will increase okay. your test, yeah. in, in Germany, there's been about 800,000 or a million mi migrants in, in Germany. What, what, what has Germany been using as a tool for that so far? Because there must be some systems out there already that are pretty established. Yeah. I mean, th you talked about 3,000. I mean, you know, obviously yeah. there's been a lot of movement yep. of people recently. There must be some other protocols that people are already using. Well, not yet, but you're right. I mean, it's top of the agenda of donors like the UNHCR that just issued an RFP actually to you know, look for this kind of solution to be able to, to reconcile the identification data of the people, uh, refugees, that might have lost all their identity documents. So clearly, we see it's top of the agenda for yeah, all the donors and humanitarian uh, organizations who want to improve the traceability, especially in the context of increased migration. I come back to uh, Matthias' point. I think. For this to work, I think there has to be some biometrics, whether it's blood, of DNA, or something. Otherwise, the, the risk of fraud here, especially as you know, people are getting grants, is too high. I think that's yeah. going to be your biggest challenge. Yeah, like Adar in India, they will use the eye, uh, yeah. iris scan compared to the fingerprint that can get damaged. Yeah. Um, All right, one more round of applause for Gravity. Thank you. That wraps up the second round of the Startup Battlefield. The judges are going to follow me backstage. We're going to choose some finalists. Before they do, though, let's hear it one more time for our judges. <laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> I want that guy. Yeah, oh, shit. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, TechCrunch editor and Disrupt MC, Jordan Crook. Hey, I'm back. You were so relieved there for a minute, but I returned. 
Um, okay, so we're gonna get into a little bit on ride sharing. Huge right now, trending, so to speak. So with that, please welcome to the stage from Taxify, Marcus Villig, and from VIA, Daniel Remote, as well as your moderator, Kirsten Korosek. Big round of applause. Hello. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, I want to welcome uh, both our co-founders and CEOs, um, Daniel and Marcus. Thanks so much for coming um, with Taxify and Via. So I'm really excited to delve into what we call the future of transportation, everything from ride hailing and scooters and I don't know, maybe more. So I want to set the stage a little bit and I would love it if um, you could both explain your businesses because there are some important differences. Uh, Daniel, why don't you kick things off? Sure. So thanks. It's great to be here. Um, at VIA, we've developed what we like to call an operating system for managing fleets of on-demand dynamic shuttles. Um, these are shared sort of medium-sized vehicles that can drive anywhere around the city following a dynamic route. And in real time, we are aggregating passengers into those vehicles. So multiple passengers are sharing sharing their ride, and hopefully we're doing it in a smart way so that you don't get taken out of your way. The route is very efficient. We started out by operating the service in New York City. We expanded to Chicago and DC, where we are operating our own service as a marketplace. And we've then found that our technology can be quite helpful to cities and public transit authorities. So we've been uh, hard at work providing our software, either licensing it or operating ourselves uh, for cities and public transit authorities all over the world. We have about 50 partners from Australia to Japan to Singapore, Europe, the United States, uh, who we are working with and providing our technology to them so that they can run a better, effectively a better public transportation system. And when you first launched, were you, was that the business model from the very beginning, which was this idea of the dynamic shuttle? Yeah, it was. You know, I think initially we had this idea that we would be a, a simply a tech company. We developed this technology and that in New York City, uh, the MTA, the Public Transit Authority, would be so excited by this new idea of how to run buses more efficiently, they'd immediately want to work with us and use our tech. Uh, it turned out they, they were not as interested as we thought they would be. Uh, so we launched our own service, took a few years, sort of demonstrated that it really worked. And now we're finding that cities are looking at what we're doing and saying, oh, wow, this could be a better way to run, run public transportation. And we're having some success getting cities to adopt it. So maybe they needed a little convincing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's yes. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably also timing. You know, yeah. sometimes you have to get the, right, the timing right and they have to see that it works. And, and for good reasons, cities are, are risk averse. They don't want to deploy something that, for the public that isn't going to work. The, the politics of it are complex. Yeah. So I, I can understand why they were reluctant. We yeah. were disappointed at the time. Yeah. Anyways. Um, so, Marcus, talk, a lot of people here probably know, are familiar with Taxify. Um, but why don't you uh, really tell us exactly where you are operating and, and how the business has developed? Sure. So Taxify is the largest European ride-sharing company we're now operating in uh, 27 countries across Europe and Africa. We have about 15 million passengers, and really the main competitor we have is our US friend, who probably everybody knows. But uh, we're now market by market actually getting ahead and showing that the local operating model is usually the one that's more efficient, and that's going to win out over the long term. And in terms of products, we, we started with taxis. And uh, now the business has shifted over the last five years mostly to private hire. And now we're actually gradually adding more and more transport methods on top of that. So earlier this year, we started doing motorcycle taxis in Africa. Now we started doing scooter sharing, first in Paris, and now rolling that out across Europe. So the long-term view is to be this leading transportation network across Europe and Africa that people can use wherever they travel and not only get a taxi, but any sort of ride they would need. And when Taxify first started, it was in fleet management, right? Or, and how, why, why did you pivot? And, and when did you do that? It's, it's actually quite an interesting story. So we first of all started out by doing dispatching software and fleet management tools and a consumer facing app to taxi fleets. 
But the issue was that they actually weren't too interested in that. So we were trying to sell taxi companies by saying that you need to adopt new technology, otherwise platforms like us are going to come in and, and consumers are going to switch away. But being honest, most of them were just very old school dinosaur thinking. They never adopted the tech. So we actually had a similar view that we were, OK, we have the tech ready. Let's just start to operate this on our own. And very quickly, we saw that this model makes a lot more sense to be self-operated fully. Do both of you, have you noticed, as it sort of exploded, this what we call mobility sometimes, our future of transportation, that, that the folks who were maybe hesitant have now are all jumping on board? Or are people still slow moving? Are agencies or other companies still uh, not quite ready to jump in? It really depends on, on, the, on the country and then the company. So as we operate in 25 countries, we see some of these, like Estonia or, or Finland now, that are very quickly adopting new ride-hailing regulation. Companies and consumers are adopting these services extremely quickly. And then, of course, we look at Germany, where ride-hailing regulation is one of the strictest in the world. You can basically only operate with licensed taxis. And it's going to still take many, many years before the industry can really get to its full potential. So it's very much case by case. What about with the, you, you're working mostly with um, the D Department of Transportation agency. So are you finding similar? It, I think that's right. I think it's very local. Uh, while you think about the, you know, the technology I think we're developing probably has global application. It, has to be adapted from city to city, but fundamentally it's the same product. But the politics and the regulatory environment and the partners and, and the drivers, probably the way they behave is extremely local. Um, so even within Germany, as you mentioned, some of the strictest ride hailing regulations, ride sharing regulations. In Berlin, we have a service that launched a few weeks ago called Berlkuning, which I'm probably not pronouncing very well. <laughs> uh, but if you haven't used it, please yeah, down, download the crowd. app yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and try to try it. But it's a shared ride in, in vans across Berlin that is um, we, we operate in Europe through Via Van, which is our joint uh, partnership with Mercedes-Benz. And this is done through the BVG, the, the Berlin Public Transit Authority. So the BVG, as a public transit authority in Germany, is actually extremely, in our view, extremely advanced and has adopted this technology. Other parts of Germany it maybe take quite a few more years to get to. So it can really vary even within a certain the same country. And this new service that, that just launched about two weeks ago, you said? It's about six or seven. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so how is that different from your more traditional service, or is it? So the, BV, the, the service in Berlin is particularly interesting, I think, because we needed a special license in order to, to operate it. So we and Daimler together formed this company called Via Van, that we wa and we wanted to launch service in Berlin. The, the service uh, to launch a shared ride service in Berlin was ran against the, regu the regulations, the local regulations. So we worked together with the BVG, and the BVG actually applied to the Berlin Senate and received a license. So it is a BVG service that we as Via Van are operating mm -hmm. uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. We use Mercedes vans and Mercedes vehicles. It actually happens to be, we believe, the largest electric fleet uh, of sort of publicly operated shuttles in the world. Um, about 80% of the fleet just runs about 100 shuttles is, uh, is electric, um, which is also an interesting uh, experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, then, and a different logistical challenge. Right? Very different, yeah. 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 So you do have different businesses, as it's clear, but you do share in many ways a similar rival, um, which is Uber. And you know, I don't want to focus too much on it, but I think Uber is dominant force in a lot of respects. So Marcus, I'm just wondering, has Uber or how has Uber impacted your business model? And does it inform your decision making? For example, when or if to go into a market? Overall, as we now operate in, in more than 20 countries around the world, we actually compete with them in essentially every country and city we're in. So we've always been accustomed to having quite fierce competition. But uh, what's already clear from multiple mergers around the world, whether we look at Russia, China, now Southeast Asia, it's clear that the local operating model in transportation is the one that's going to win out over the long term. So we see a similar pattern across all our cities. If you need to actually localize, then the US companies aren't typically best suited to do it. And we, we see this happening city by city. Uh, we are more focused on treating drivers better, which is something that's quite unique to Europe, because the regulations are so high, you have a lot less drivers you can actually work with in every city. 
So treating them well is a much bigger factor than it might be in a market where the supply of drivers is, is multiple times bigger. So these exactly are, are cases that you need to keep in mind, or whether we look at working with cities, which is very important in Europe, or integrating local payments and so on, then we, we see our big benefit is localization, and country by country we see in a few years we're actually overtaking them. And now fast forwarding a couple of years, we think it's, we're going to see a similar future in Europe and Africa as we actually have already seen in other parts of the world. So is working with local regulators more of a challenge than dealing with Uber? Is that the, is that the primary business challenge? Actually, yeah, it's again country by country. So when we look at uh, Germany, for example, then whether Uber or anybody else is here doesn't change our business much. The bigger blocker is that the regulation is very strict and there's just not enough drivers for us to work with. So, so that's, that's one example. Another is that market like Poland might be less regulated. You actually have enough drivers so you can build a business that customers are going to love, but you have very fierce competition. So again, the problems vary market by market. And Daniel, what about, what about you? How does Uber factor into your business or yeah. does it? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that company that you mentioned. <laughs> um, you know, we, we have, a, I, I think, a very different business model than, than yeah. Uber does. So where we are operating our own consumer service like we do in New York and Chicago, D.C., London, where we recently launched this Via Van, there we're, we're facing this quite fierce competitor, uh, I agree. But oftentimes we're finding that for shared rides, which is our core product, um, I think we have a pretty good advantage in, a, in, a, in the technology that we've developed because it was built from the ground up to, to allow people to share. And oftentimes, the way the drivers are being compensated on the VIA platform kind of all fits together very well. And so we usually find that we have good success in, in launching our own services, even when Uber is competing. Um, most other places are actually not really, unlike Taxify, not really in competition with Uber. We're running what is effectively a subsidized service together with the local public authority uh, or city. Um, and so that's, that's a lot less of a consideration. Okay. You both touched on, oh, Marcus, you said, uh, treating our drivers better, and you sort of referred to the, to the same thing. What does that mean? Does it mean making it easier to use? Is it pay? So I would say in New York, I'll uh, jump in. In New York, uh, the Taxi Limousine Commission recently issued a study that showed how much drivers were making on the different platforms. And if you look at how much drivers were making on the Via platform, uh, I think on a median basis, they were making about 50% more per hour than they were on Uber or Lyft. And th it's not because uh, they're earning more when they have a passenger in the car. They earn comparable amounts when they have passengers in the car. So the way the system works, their utilization is much higher. So the amount of time that a driver is sitting around empty is significantly reduced, which means that per hour that they're on the road, they're just making a lot more money. So I think that helps us a lot, at least. Sure. Um, again, coming back to the market specifics. So when we look at Europe, you have a very constrained pool of drivers due to high regulation. So the drivers are, are something that you need to fight a lot more for, rather than consumers, actually, in many of these markets. So what we're focused on at the end of the day is how much the driver makes. Like wh whatever other perks and, and gimmicks you can do on top of that, I mean, at the end of the day, drivers care about how much pay they take. Yeah, on. they want to make more money, or so, why would they do so, it? So what we're focused on, on, on one hand, is perks, how to actually save them costs. So in France, for example, just last week, we rolled out a huge partnership so drivers can get about 7 8% discounts on fuel with us, which other platforms don't do, or we just pay them more on every trip thanks to a lower commission. So at the end of the day, what this results in is that we're just attracting more drivers. The drivers we typically attract are then happier because they prefer us due to higher earnings. And at the end of the day, we, we see con consumers are making their choice based on that as well. So if you're more or less paying the same rate, but you actually know that on one platform the driver is happier and you have more drivers, consumers are more likely to, to move to that platform in the long term. Um, you also do have another thing that both companies share, which is a common investor, uh, Daimler. Uh, but I think that the relationships are a, a slightly different. So Daniel, talk to me a little bit about Daimler, because it's a, more of a strategic investment, right? Yeah, so for us, you know, we realized fairly quickly once we launched our own service that 
and this is obviously true for Taxify as well, the service, the experience doesn't end in the app. If you are using Venmo to, for mobile payments or uh, playing Candy Crush or whatever it is that you love to do on your phone, that usually ends and starts and ends with your, with your experience in the app. For us, the app is just the beginning, and then there's the vehicle and the driver and, and traffic and the city and everything else that you're interacting with. And it turns out that when you're sharing a ride, the vehicle that you're in makes a really big difference. If you're sharing a ride with three other people in the back of a Toyota Camry, it's not a great experience. And even if it's relatively inexpensive, you know, you might actually prefer the bus, you might prefer the subway, th there are many other alternatives. If you're sharing the back of a, of a minivan or a, a slightly larger vehicle and you've got your own seat, it just feels significantly better. Not to mention that the efficiency of that ride when you have a vehicle that can seat six passengers, we can get in and out very quickly without making other people get up. For us, the efficiency increases very significantly. So in partnering with Daimler, a lot of it was about can we get access and can we actually work together with Daimler to develop the right vehicle? Because as it turns out, there isn't really a vehicle out there that is designed to be a dynamic shuttle where you know, hundreds of people are getting in and out every single day and moving around the seats and so forth. So part of the partnership, yes, there's an investment. We've set up Via Van together, but really it's about thinking, how do we build the vehicle of the future uh, that can serve you know, a sort of dynamic mass transit system in a city at scale? So are you developing a van then? Can you talk about the vehicle that you're working on? Yeah, so I mean, we as VIA are not necessarily develop, you know, starting a plan to build a van, but you're absolutely. In yeah, on no, the but process. exactly right. We're partnering to figure out how do we at first adapt the existing van, and then I don't want to speak for Daimler for their car manufacturing plans, but the idea would be, you know, if, if there's volume, which we think there is, to develop a unique vehicle for this service. So do you see in five years, Developing a vehicle takes a long time, five to seven years. Right. Developing um, a van for a VIA, do you see that actually happening with Daimler? So I should, you know, again, I can't speak for, for Daimler. Yeah. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll get me in <laughs> trouble. But I, uh, I sure hope so. And what I can say is that even if you, you know, what we're definitely doing, which you can see in Berlin, so if you were to take this Berlkunig service in Berlin, you'll see modified uh, Vito vans that are, uh, or V-class vans, that are, are modified specifically for our service. So we're already starting to see the benefits of having this relationship. And I, hopefully Daimler feels similarly that they are getting input from consumers, from drivers about what makes a vehicle work in this application. Right, right. What about you? It's a slightly different relationship. What is your involvement with Daimler? So overall Daimler shares the same view that more and more people in 10 years are not going to buy cars, but they're going to be using vehicles on demand. They see that we are already the biggest ride-hailing operator in Europe. Uh, we're growing the fastest here. And there's a pretty good outcome that we will be overall this mass transportation platform that's going to combine cars and, and scooters and all other forms of transportation a person might need to get around in one single app. And of course, for Daimler, who's one of the biggest car manufacturers, they want to be a part of that future. So the investment was, was very clearly to make sure there's a strong European player in the space as well, rather than let this be another space essentially that's run, run by a US company. Are you working on any products with them at all or projects with them? Or is it more of a financial investment relationship? So the industry is still in its early days. When we look at overall on-demand rides relative to all the trips that happen in a city, we're talking about 2 to 3% of all trips. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of rides are still done by privately owned cars and public transportation. Mm -hmm. So for now, it's, it's an investment into the future. And then as the industry matures and develops, there's room for collaboration on many, many fields. Mm -hmm. One of those is just vehicle financing for the drivers. Another is working together on autonomous cars in the future. So there's a number of areas that we can get into. But for now, we're just focused on, on building the biggest European platform. You brought up autonomous vehicles, and I'm wondering what both of your thoughts are on that and whether you see that technology eventually being deployed within your own company and whether that's a priority. Uh, Daniel, what, or Marcus, go ahead. <laughs> so overall, uh, how I see it is that short-term autonomous driving is seriously overhyped. So there's not going to be major consumer impact from autonomous cars for the next three years at least. It's going to take time for, these, for the technology to get ready, for the regulations to adapt, and then the rollout is going to be quite slow. 
So in the short term, we're much more focused on practical things that work right now. One of those being uh, scooters and micromobility. So we see that is going to have a much more tangible impact on lives of people for the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. But sure, in the long term, autonomous cars are going to come. They're going to come on platforms that you can use on demand. And one of the most logical reasons why it's going to be like that is because autonomous cars will not have availability to drive in an entire city at once. But as we currently see the tech, it's developing gradually. So you know they might be able to drive in one area of the city, but no, not in all the rest. So platforms that combine human drivers and autonomous driving are going to be able to cover this seamlessly. So as a consumer, you're going to say, I want to go from here to here. And we know that we can either cover that route with an autonomous car, or we're going to send you a, a, a driver. So th those are things that only the ride hailing platforms can do. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for me to start from scratch with a purely autonomous uh, car platform or, and compete it, with that. that. That's interesting because, not to bring up Uber again, but I will, they, they have put a lot of money and created this entire branch of their company. Uh, Uber ATG to try to be the first, and, and they've certainly dialed things back. Um, whereas Taxify, it seems like you're just going to focus on the now and the medium term, and you don't feel like there needs to be one winner. Would that be accurate in, in terms of autonomous vehicles? Sure. So there's some network effects within autonomous driving, some different parts of the, of the ecosystem, but we're very confident there's going to be a number of players in that space. So there's not going to be that Waymo is one that's going to have an autonomous car and be 15 years ahead of everybody. It's, it's more likely that there's going to be a number of players and an ecosystem of these vehicle and autonomous tech manufacturers. So what about for VIA? How does autonomous vehicle technology play into your business model? So by the way, I... I, I very much agree with what Marcus said about where autonomous vehicles are today. The, the one thing I might add is that where, where I think we might start to see applications, and I, I, I still agree with what you said, it's not going to have a major consumer impact, but on a small scale is where cities or, or it could be within uh, private sort of campuses are able to adapt the infrastructure itself to make the problem easier, whether it's dedicated lanes that are more constrained or whether you can put uh, you know, beacons on, the, on the, sign, the, the lamppost or whatever it is, I think that will facilitate uh, services. And so we'll start to see, I, I believe, over the next three years, these, these smaller services pop up in parallel to what Waymo and others are doing, where they're trying to do it more free form. Um, and that will be, that'll be interesting as, as an alternative way to launching, probably with much simpler technology. Um, as far as V is concerned, you know, we, we have a sort of similar approach. We see ourselves developing software that sits at the network level, uh -huh. not at the individual car driving level. And there are going to be probably multiple providers. Uh, they will be a part of our network, we hope. But um, it's not the short-term focus. Right. So speaking of the future, because we have to wrap up uh, shortly, I'm curious about one of your big investors is Didi. And I'm wondering what the future looks like with Didi. Um, do you think they might try to acquire you or, overall, or just it, invest in you more? Overall, it's, it's becoming quite clear that the local operators have quite a big advantage over just trying to do one generic platform and actually operate it in every country. So we see it's more likely that the six, seven big ride hailing players that are there right now are going to be still there in five years and each doing their localizations. So when we look at our markets like in Africa with safety, local payment methods, these are things that actually take quite a lot of time to develop and you need to localize. So we don't think there's going to be one global fits all solution. Mm -hmm. And you recently got into scooters. Are you going to get into other businesses as well in the next year or two? Food delivery is one option, bike share. We're, we're, we're looking at, uh, at all, all the ways how to move people around. So that's what we're focused on in the short term. And, and right now, we see that ride hailing and scooters are the two best uh, things to focus on in, in that sector. And then as a market, the US? Is there any interest in going there? No. So for us, it's Europe, Africa. We want to win these regions, be the best platform for people to move around here. 
And what about for Via? What does the next year look like for you? Are you going to suddenly get into scooter business as well? So we're also adding scooters uh, mostly, again, for partner cities where they're okay. looking to provide a holistic transportation solution as a public transit um, offering to the residents. I think, you know, for us, the, the vision is to take this platform we've developed. I think it's a little bit of a different uh, business, again, from Taxify. So we do have a view that it can be global. And, uh, you know, by the end of next year, we'd like to be in about 300 different cities, uh, powering the public transit system in each of those cities. And Great. Working hard at it. Interesting, yeah. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Round of applause for these guys for coming up on stage. Thanks for having me. Okay. Is it your phone? My phone, yeah. Hey, party people, what's up? Yeah. All right, the VC industry has not uh, made a name for itself when it comes to being diverse, but Atomico has uh, decided to address the issue in an interesting new way. So with that, I'm going to bring up our next panelist. Please welcome to the stage Atomico's Sophia Benz, uh, LifeX, Right, LifeX, sorry, this is not on my card. LifeX, Redu Jane, uh, Doreen Huber from Delivery Hero and Lemon Cat, and your moderator, Connie Loizos. Here Thank you. Yeah. You want us to go here. up now? Yeah. Hi again, everyone. So uh, joining me on stage this time is Sophia Benz, who is the newest partner at Atomico, but who may best be known as employee number nine at Spotify, the streaming media company that she helped to scale as it grew to 3,000 employees. Uh, I realize there are probably founders in the audience who would love to tap her advice on how to grow their own brands, and we are going to talk about that. But first, uh, I also wanted to introduce you to Doreen Huber, who is the co-founder and CEO of Lemon Cat, which is a three-year-old uh, corporate catering startup. And beside her is Rita, excuse Jane. me, Ritu Jane, uh, the co-founder and COO of LifeX, which is a co-living startup. And they are joining us on stage today because we have some news, which is that Atomico is launching a, a program for angel investors that you're definitely going to want to know more about. Before we dive into things, Sophia, this is our first time meeting and sitting down together. So I wanted to ask you just about your experience going from a global marketing director of this huge company to becoming a venture capitalist. Is it a very different skill set? Yeah, there are many differences in the two jobs. And um, one part of me was thinking, oh, it's going to be hard to find a job that is as exciting as being the marketing director for Spotify. Sure. So I took some time off, and I was planning on just figuring things out ended up doing some angel investments and really enjoyed that, actually. I uh, loved the energy of the founders, and I wanted to find a way to sort of still be close to the ecosystem, mm -hmm. but without taking on a full-time job. You were in London at this point, and you were investing in London-based founders, or where were you? Located? I was actually based in New York. Okay. So I did a lot of investments together with some of my former Spotify colleagues, but they are uh, ranging from the Nordics to Europe and some US companies. Okay, and so, so you were continuing to angel invest. And how many angel investments would you say you've made to this date? It's around 25, actually. Okay. And, and Ritu's company is one of them. Very okay. proud of that. Okay, LifeX, that's great. But um, when, I, when I did that, sorry, I just wanted to tie it into sure. my role now. Um, I also figured it would be fun and exciting to work with someone who actually knows what they're doing and has <laughs> a process to it and who's good at it. So I met Niklas Sandström when I was doing some consultancy work for a company called Go Euro. Okay. And then we started talking and I said to him, like, you should be closer to the angel community because there's so much exciting stuff happening. And then that's how it happened. So I joined Atomico and Niklas, bless him, was uh, big enough of a man to bet on me when I was nine months pregnant. That's so great. Hired me two and a half years ago. And you were an entrepreneur in residence and then you became a full-time partner. That is correct. And I think that's a really cool role, act actually, for people to bear in mind if you are in that place where you're thinking about what you want to do next, because that really gives you an opportunity to sort of try out and understand what it actually means, mm. 
So after two years, uh, it feels great to be sort of full-time and, uh, and also be a partner. That's wonderful. And congratulations also on your newborn. Thank um, you. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about your new program. Yes, it's really exciting, and I'm very glad to be here. So thank you for having us. Um, so we are always looking for ways to support and boost the local ecosystems of the startup hubs in Europe. Uh, one way is obviously to sort of help foster and mentor the next generation mm -hmm. of business angels. I have seen so much positive things coming out of big companies having liquidity events in Stockholm mm -hmm. with Spotify and iSettle and Klarna, etc. So it's really a wonderful opportunity to sort of give back. So our program is all about that. And we believe that you know, it's more about long-term relationship building mm -hmm. than transactions. And we also want to be closer to the sort of getting to know entrepreneurs even earlier on in sure. their journey. And we also want to unlock potential and talent in sort of different pockets of the ecosystem that we don't really have access to. So it is it's a way for us to sort of broaden our scope and perspective and also help new people to sort of try out the art of angel investing. And I want to try and demystify it because it's not uh, you know, something for just an exclusive uh, group of people. It's actually something that you know, I want more people to try out because I had such a good experience with it. Right. And hopefully this will generate more people being interested in joining the VC industry and in the long run potentially will have more female and a diverse set of investors. Yes, I noticed, and we'll talk about some of the people involved, but there are many women involved in this program, which I think is terrific. Um, Doreen, let's talk about you for a minute. So my understanding is you've raised about $11 million um, from your investors to date. Your company is three years old. It's based here in Berlin. Yep. Your background is very interesting because you were previously the COO of Delivery Hero. Yes. Um, so what about that work made you think, I should start my own company? Yeah. Um, well, I was, uh, as you said, not, not new to the food market, so that's really my passion. I love, uh, I'm a foodie, I love working with food, and after three years at Delivery Hero, eating a lot of fast food, burgers, <laughs> and pizza, and so on, I thought, when we, whenever we were throwing events and uh, we were ordering from our own platform, I thought the experience was not really fantastic. You know, if you throw a party, an event, you want the food to stand out and you want to say thank you to your people. So you have a purpose why you are ordering food. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, is there nothing which is really great out there where all the great manufacturers, fantastic chefs uh, creating great food? And um, then I, after I left Delivery Hero, I did not do it right away. So that, that basically that thought was in my mind for a while. Okay. And I was working in the US uh, for a bit, investing in US startups, working with them, supporting them to go to Europe. Okay. And um, I was hanging out in those beautiful offices and they, the kitchen were full of fantastic food and caterers coming in uh, for breakfast, lunch and so on. And I thought, okay, this is fantastic. I have to bring this to Europe. And just, yeah, started research and that was basically the starting point for Lemon Cat. It is shocking how nicely stocked the, the uh, startup kitchens are <laughs> in, in uh, the <laughs> United true. States. But tell me a little bit about how you connected then with Sophia regarding this program. Yeah, um, uh, since I was fundraising for Lemon Cat as well for a while, I also, of course, talked to Atomico. I met Matthias and we stayed in touch. And then uh, after a while, he came back to me and he introduced me to Sophia and said, look, Doreen, we're doing something fantastic here. And he knew that I was uh, also an active angel investor over the last years already. Okay. And um, yeah, then Atomico offered me to be part of this program. And I said, yes, yeah. That's, That's a really great opportunity. Great, great, great. And Rito, I want to hear your story as well. So your company is a little bit younger, 18 yeah. months old. Uh, I know that you live in Copenhagen, but the company is based here or it's moving here? Uh, well, we are in Copenhagen in Berlin, and okay. now we are launching in Paris. Okay, great, great. Yeah. And you've raised about 4 million euro, including from Cherry Ventures. That's correct. Okay. And your company um, is... Uh, sort of, when you say relocation services, it's sort of like a co-living company that invites people who are moving to new cities to sort of... Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, people always ask us, relocation, co-living, how does this really work together? Mm -hmm. And um, I actually come from product background. So I was, um, you know, prior to starting this, I was head of product at this company called Pecon, which was all around employee engagement. Uh, before that, I was uh, at TradeShift, which was a supply chain management product. I was there as a director of product for quite a few years. Um, and, you know, when, when I look at problems, we always look at the best way to s 
find solutions. Um, and it might not be the most apparent way to solve something, but it's all based on user experience. So we started LifeX based on our own experience. I'm, I'm actually an American uh, living in Copenhagen at the moment. And uh, when I moved from San Francisco to Copenhagen two years ago, I thought, how hard could it be? I was moving for work and, and realized that you know there's a lot of bureaucratic systems that are still in play that, that make it very difficult to have a soft landing experience. Um, and when you first land in a place, you might not know the neighborhoods. You might not have any friends outside of your work. So how do you start making connections right away? Um, so that's the problem we wanted to solve. So it makes, it makes sense to do it end to end. Um, as, as I was building my own product teams with engineers, designers, PMs, uh, we noticed that they faced the same challenges that I had faced when I moved from US to Copenhagen. So you know, instead of uh, looking at it just as a relocation service mm -hmm. or just as a housing service, we wanted to solve a problem for anyone that's moving from city to city. So it's actually relocation and housing together because that's what somebody really needs. Sure, that sounds very smart. Yeah. How many markets are you operating in right now? So we are in Copenhagen, Berlin, and Paris at the moment. OK, great. Yeah. And um, had you done any angel investing before? How did you? meet Sophia? Yeah, it's a really good question. So, uh, you know, Sophia invested in LifeX. Uh, I still remember talking to her about this uh, about a year ago, and I think she just instantly connected to it because of all the moves you had done and hiring you had done at Spotify. Yes, I think um, we should have been around when I was hiring people across the globe. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also experiencing the visa process when I moved to the US. So we kind of have opposite experience. Exactly, but exactly. It it's not really it's difficult. it's interesting how international this problem is and how it you know goes from industry to industry, not just for tech employees, but for architects and uh, and chefs and also I met this woman on the plane today morning who works at UN and had the same challenges. So anyway, so that's how we connected, Sophia and I, and uh, have been in touch since then. She's been a great uh, angel investor to us. And for me I have been thinking about, you know, I have I have learned quite a bit now over the past 12 to 15 years in the tech community, but I'm a bit shy at uh, just writing blog posts and posting my you know, perspectives because I'm not totally sure what I can bring to the table. But over the last five years, I've realized that, you know what, there are certain areas that I have been able to help some founders out uh, when it comes to product decisions, you know, uh, figuring out your product market fit, figuring out your positioning, etc. Um, so I, I've been interested in figuring, trying to see how to help founders um, get better at making product decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what really encouraged me to get into investments, uh, just so that I could pass on some of the learnings I've had, some of the mistakes I have made, sure. and you know, make sure nobody else you know, repeats that or you know, has a little bit of a different perspective. Um, so I became an LP in an uh, investment fund called uh, the Nordic Web. Ventures. Um, it's out of Copenhagen, um, and that was a really light way for for me to stay in touch with the ecosystem and help some of the founders. Um, and then Sophia uh, and uh, I talked as we were raising our next round of funding. I met with Mateus at Atomico, and it was interesting. He was asking me about my product perspective and um, and what I think of you know strategy, etc., in product. And and then Sophia told me about this uh, new program they were starting. And, and I thought that, you know, I, I know I'm very busy with LifeX and, you know, we are growing quite a bit, but this could be a great way for me to, on the side, be able to share some of my learnings and maybe help somebody out uh, when sure. it comes to product decisions. That's so, terrific. So, yeah. in some ways, this reminds me of um, Sequoia Capital. So, obviously, this is not the first sort of angel program of its nature. Scouting programs have been around for, I don't know, maybe six, seven years. I think Sequoia Capital was perhaps the first to do it or the first to sort of be discovered to be doing it. It was sort of doing it on the down low. Um, but it works with its founders in large part. So past scouts have been the founders of WhatsApp and Dropbox and uh, Thumbtack, among others. So I'm just wondering, when you were sort of searching out the kind of first batch, were you looking at um, 
people who have ties specifically to Atomico or to your own angel portfolio, or was that not necessarily a no, requisite? No, actually kind of the opposite. I mean, uh, we all have connections in one way or another, but the whole idea with the program is also to expand our network. Mm -hmm. And we already have a really good sort of relationship, and we do deals together with uh, some of the people that we have invested in, etc. So I feel like we have a good, strong network, but we wanted to broaden it, mm -hmm. and we wanted to, to reach even further. Okay. So. Uh, Peop the people on the list, they are not all founders. Um, so we have been thinking about it in a broader sense. So founders and operators. Connectors, yes. I think the main uh, sort of thinking is you know, that it's people that we believe are sort of standing in the midst of the ecosystem mm -hmm. and that have a great deal flow and are connected to a lot of good talent. OK. So one thing that's sort of tricky with these programs, or has been historically, is um, you know, I guess when you sort of disclose as a founder or an operator approaching uh, another founder uh, that you like and want to learn from uh, and possibly invest in, that you are working on behalf of a venture firm. So uh, at what point have you thought through sort of how soon into that, those conversations they will say, I'm part of Atomico's uh, angel program? Yeah, so we want it to be uh, sort of transparent. So the angels always tell the entrepreneurs where the money is coming from. Mm -hmm. And then they make the decisions and they pick the companies independently. And we kind of just trust their decision and we don't you know, have a say in what companies they decide to invest in. And I guess for the two of you, are you concerned at all about their, that being sort of having a chilling effect? It's a little bit different when you sit down with a peer who started a company and you're like, tell me what's going on. It's, when we say I'm, I'm sort of here in the capacity as an angel who could potentially, you know, be working with Atomico, um, I'm just wondering if that changes the conversation or have you have you have you have you had talks yet? Um, Maybe I should ask already uh, well, as part of this program. Um, I did not specifically have talks for this program because mm -hmm. I have talks all the time. So I think it it comes naturally to me. It mm -hmm. is not something I would specifically talk to someone because of this program. Mm -hmm. um, I have you know, friends in the network. I, I meet people all the time. I come, ac come across great business ideas, or business ideas, not always great business ideas. And then, um, for example, if I, if I have an interest of putting my own money, I could say, look, there's another opportunity we have here. And what I um, specifically liked about the program is really the know-how, uh, which is behind it. Mm -hmm. So it's really not just me saying, OK, it's another X, Y, Z amount coming from mm -hmm. Atomico, but it's really that Atomico also opens the network. Um, I've uh, recently had the chance to go to London to um, participate in their founders event, and it was really fantastic. There were the best speakers. I could talk to everyone, and I got so much like really top-notch conversations where I learned so much that I think for every early stage founder, it, it can only be a huge benefit. So this is the way how I look at it, and uh, it's it's always you know the founder decides if he takes the money or not. Sure. That's why it's, it's an offer, but I think it comes with some great um, extras, you know? <laughs> sure. And Sophia, have you thought through, so Doreen mentioned maybe she puts a, writes a check and then also says there, there may be an opportunity here for you to sort of take on more money from Atomico. What if you are dealing with someone who sees a great opportunity um, and wants to perhaps invest even more than of their own capital than Atomico's. Is that perfectly OK? Or are there yeah, they're free to invest their own money on okay. top of the Atomico money. So that's not a problem. What about, what about sharing information? Is the cohort allowed to sort of um, talk to each other about what they're seeing? Or is there going to be some sort of a you so, know, network that you're building here? Yeah, I, I mean, one thing that I really look forward to is to build a sort of almost like a community of, of us that are doing angel deals, mm -hmm. mostly because there's so much stuff that we want to you know, learn from each other and, and talk about, and also to share deals. So um, we are kind of enabling those conversations to happen and so that the angels will you know, have fun doing it. But when it comes to uh, sort of information sharing, there's, there's nothing that they need. There's no requirements for that. What is the policy around information rights that you're getting? So they're, they're allowed to talk if they want. Are you sort of expecting them to sort of talk to you, or is there sort of a, a, a wall and they yeah, shouldn't no. be talking to you so, about so anything? There, there's no expectations from our end, but obviously they have a, you know, a warm intro to Atomico if they want to in the future, but it's, it's kind of independent. OK, what about a right of first refusal? If you decide when this company starts to mature that you want to get involved, 
Um, I'm guessing it's much more informal than that, but just to sort of make clear for yeah, no, it's it's, it's something that we'll do together with the angel because the angel is the one sitting on the relationship mm -hmm. and coming back to, you know, that we really truly believe that the relationship is one of the most important things in this business. We will definitely make the decision together. Whether there's whether you're going to invest, but you don't have a right of first refusal. No, I, I thought you meant oh. if there's a liquidity event later on, so that will be in tandem with the angel. But the investment process, then the angels are free to make the investments themselves. Okay, okay, great. Um, so, uh, you know, um, again, sort of going back to my earlier point, the biggest sort of wrinkle uh, complication with these programs is uh, signaling risk, um, you know, to state the obvious, which means Atomico or another fund um, writes uh, a check through one of these scouts or angels, excuse me, through uh, to a, a startup, um, and then the startup is sort of tagged in a way. Um, and so if Atomico decides once it does mature that it's maybe not the right fit for Atomico, it can sort of perhaps hamper that company. Um, how do you sort of get around that? Or, or how, why do you think that's maybe not an issue? Yeah, I, I actually am not so worried about that, mm -hmm. um, mainly because we have done angel investments, both me and Niklas and Matthias and Siraj, and many of them have not been funded by Atomico in the later stages, mm -hmm. but it still hasn't harmed the company or been a problem so far. So I don't think it's going to be a big problem. It's interesting. I don't, I don't really have an opinion on it, but I think it's interesting that there continues to be... Sequoia, for example, is a little bit more public about it now, but I think there's even um, funds in Europe that are, have similar programs that aren't so public about it. So yeah. I just wonder uh, why not. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the economics. Um, in Sequoia's case, um, the and I'm sure similar programs that have sort of modeled themselves after it, the scout who uh, finds the investment sort of reaps the rewards from that investment um, to, you know, to a, a, a significant degree, I guess. Um, and Sequoia's limited partners do. And um, then the uh, people in the scout program and the general partners themselves sort of benefit to a slightly lesser extent. Can you tell us a little bit about how the economics work here? Yeah, so uh, we, c we don't disclose the numbers as, as we normally don't, but we, there is a personal carry mm -hmm. for the angels, okay. which is pretty good and uh, I would say above industry standard. And then there is a pooled carry so that if one angel do really well, the others get benefit from it. Okay. And is the arrangement exclusive? Do they have to work only with your... Yes, yeah, so it's for one year and it is exclusive to Atomico Angel program only. So you cannot be part of two programs at the same time. Okay. And how much money do you have to invest? It's 100K per year. Okay. Yeah. So that's basically one to two checks, essentially. Yeah, depending on also what market you're operating in and what type of size of the checks you want to write. So I think people have different philosophies there. Okay. But yeah, minimum two deals with that. Okay. And what if... Um, so, so I think the idea, I don't know if we've said this already, um, there's 12 angels to start? Yeah. So they each have $100,000 to spend over the course of one year. What if you... Uh, and then you're going to be introducing a new class and I yes. guess building up a sort of an like, alumni network. Uh, what happens if you... It turns out that somebody's a particularly good angel. Would you invite them back? Yeah, I think we're, we're up for that. And um, but, but also one part of, of the one year thing is that we want to, you know, have a good um, flow of new talent coming in. And also, we don't want to have the old school sort of boys club. It's a small group of people that are holding each other's back. We want to open it up and we want to have more people and we want to be more inclusive. Sure. Okay, great. Um, so, Ridu, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. You said you're, you're starting to invest yourself or you're an LP in a fund. Um, what's your experience been like raising money? And I guess uh, as a founder, how yeah. much of an impact do you think uh, a good angel investor can have? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. Um, so, I mean, we just finished our fundraising round, so there's a lot of things that are just green in my mind to share. But, um, you know, I think it, it's quite critical, especially in the early on of your of 
early on of your journey to get angel investors that A, believe in you know, your mission and your vision of what you want to accomplish. So I think that's quite critical to have. Um, I think what's happening is that it's not just about the funds, it's also what value they bring to the table for you. Um, that's quite important for us. That's the criteria we used when we were picking angel investors. Um, so it's about them understanding your vision, believing in your, you know, where you, your strategy, how you want to do it, and also uh, bringing in something valuable to the table. Uh, and and it could be anything from, you know, uh, scaling, uh, you know, experience to marketing experience to understanding products to uh, it could be just fundraising experience as well. And I think for us this was really important because, you know, when we were so young for the first year, it was our angel investors that saw our journey inside out. I mean, we, we had a lot of, uh, you know, late nights and we had a lot of successes in the first year too, but, you know, the first people that we really wanted to share it with was our, were our angels. And, and I think that's the type of relationship you should have. And as we were starting to raise our funds uh, for this round, I mean, our angels were the one that were really connecting us a lot with the networks that they knew. Okay. Um, and I think that's really useful because they get to know your business intimately um, and they also get to they have a really great if they have great connections in the community they can also bridge that gap for you especially if you're you know a first time founder or a second time founder or might not know some of the investors in the industry um, so I think those things are quite critical and that's that's how we have actually uh, had our angels uh, we, it's been also interesting for us that you know when we raised uh, our last round the VCs were emailing our angels and asking our angels to get in touch with us and to let us know that they are good VCs for us to work with. So I think that's also a really great uh, channel for, for, um, for you to also use your angels as a shielding uh, well, when, you, when you have quite a few VCs who want to sure, contact you. Sure, vetting process. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think for us, it, this has been a really great way for to move to the next level. And, you know, I think now we are thinking about how to still have our angels be actively involved as we are getting bigger. Um, but I think in the initial stages, that becomes very important to have the right angels on board. And Doreen, you have a little bit more extensive experience as an angel investor. Um, so I'm just wondering, as a founder and an angel investor, how does your approach to other founders in the capacity of angel investor um, how is that impacted by your own experience um, as a founder? Yeah, I would say a lot because I, I can only agree angel investors, I think in, in all of my companies we had fantastic angel investors and they were insanely helpful in the beginning, especially because angel investors are most of the times brutally honest <laughs> and sometimes the more mature a company gets and the uh, more uh, proper VCs you bring on board, this kind of dis uh, discussion is not happening so in such an honest environment anymore because angels are more like the, um, the entrepreneur buddies basically, you know? So they give you honest feedback, they challenge you a lot. They, it feels like angels are, are so early on board that they are really on board with the mm -hmm. vision, you know, and everything. So from that perspective, um, I always try to bring my experience also to my angel uh, investments. Of course, it always depends on how much um, relationship you have with the, with the companies. And also at some point, I think also over the years, I invested in around about 20 companies and oh, wow. you cannot uh, supervise all of them all the time, you know, mm -hmm. because then it becomes a full-time job. But I always uh, meet with, um, I would say, probably 80% of my uh, f founders where I invested on a regular basis and we either jump on a call or we meet for lunch or so and, and yeah, and keep each other posted and uh, try to give them all my knowledge, whatever I saw on my way. And um, I think that's why it's, it's a super fantastic opportunity to do this now even with uh, Atomico as a partner. That's great. Um, one last question on the program. You mentioned sometimes investing and not being able to spend a lot of time with companies, which I think is sort of the situation with lots of angel investors. There's lots of interesting companies to fund. Sometimes they spend a lot of time with the company. Sometimes they don't. Do you care? Uh, do they have? Do the angels have like full autonomy, or if they want to join sort of a what in the United States is called a party round, where there's you know many many investors involved in a startup, which happens occasionally and often doesn't turn out terribly well because nobody's really 
watching the company or advising them very closely. Do you care if um, there are many participants in a round, or is that not a concern? No, actually, we just kind of trust the angels to make that okay. judgment to see if it's a healthy investment and group of investors to invest together with. Okay, great. It's well, before we go, I did promise the founders here that uh, I would ask you about pitfalls and um, <laughs> how best to scale their brand. So if it's not too ridiculous a question, do you have <laughs> any sort of quick tips and tricks that you could share based on your experience growing Spotify? Um, I think be relentless understand who you are and what you stand for, and make sure to communicate that in all of your channels ongoingly, and repeat your core message as often as you can, mm -hmm. and then hire people that are as passionate as you are about the mission you're on, mm -hmm. and make sure you have figured out the core values, because if you hire on those core values, it will be a much more fun and smooth ride. So I think do your homework when it comes to hiring, and also have a brand strategy and a brand position well worked out mm -hmm. that you then operate from. Right. But I don't know if that made sense. Sure, sure. <laughs> Lesson number one, hire well. Because <laughs> I'm sure it's very distracting otherwise. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Great so to much. meet you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks. All right. It is not very often that you hear of a company that has 100 million downloads of its app and zero dollars in VC funding. In fact, in Silicon Valley, it's more often the inverse. Um, so with that, I'd like to bring out our next uh, guest. Please welcome to the stage, Riedel's Dennis Jadanoff and your moderator, Ingrid London. Hi, everybody. Hi, guys. Dobry den. Dobry den. Thanks for joining us. OK, let's get to this. Now, you guys, Dennis, um, have had a pretty amazing run so far. You have gone from being a bootstrap startup to 100 million downloads of your apps. Yeah. That's a big, big deal. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, now, it hasn't always been easy. You've had, in your time, you guys have had 32 failures. Can you give us the short version, very quickly, on how you guys went from zero to hero? Sure. So. I think it's about timing. So back in 2007, when the iPhone was launched for the first time, there was no apps or no apps. So there was no way to read stuff on your iPhone. And we fixed that. We made a service. That's why the company name is Readle from Read. Quickly got 60,000 users, still not making money. And then we got a call from Apple. And they said, hey, guys, we're launching App Store. Here's, if you want to be featured on the first day, on the, of the App Store, make an app, here's deadline. Yeah. So here's how we started. So an early mover advantage. Yes. OK, but like everyone wants to get Apple's attention. They've been a big deal. When, when, you know, when they were doing the iPhone and the App Store, everyone wanted, to be a, wanted a piece of Apple. How did you guys manage to catch their attention and get to talk to them? So I, I guess it's about the product. And uh, as I mentioned, we got 60,000 users of our product uh, early on. And then it certainly caught their attention. And they even put a link on their website on apple.com to use Rido as a service if you want to read a book or a paper. Right. So they kind of knew us from the beginning. And I think my brother, who is the CEO and, and, and co-founder, Igor, he knew somebody from his previous job. So okay. he, it, it makes things easier when you know somebody there. So he had a contact with an yes. Apple. Yes. If you're a startup and you would like to get Apple's attention, what would you recommend people to do? I think, be it Apple or Google, they're being very proactive and very helpful, especially these days. And um, companies like ours, they help them and they kind of make their devices better. So it's fairly easy right now to kind of find who's responsible in this area, mm -hmm. or let's say from editorial side or from developer relations side. And it's pretty easy if you connect it. Like, ask around. A couple of, of people will definitely know people 
from Apple or Google or other companies yeah. who are kind of in charge of this. Okay. Let me just turn that a little bit around. Now, you were talking to Apple early. You said that they came up to you because they approached you guys because they didn't have what you have in their own product set. Now, they've been doing like increasingly more and more software themselves. Yep. Um, does that worry you guys at all? Well, um, for those who don't, don't know, like we, uh, you might not have heard about Riddle before, but uh, we have a portfolio of eight productivity apps that many of you um, hopefully used, like email called Spark, the Scanner Pro to scan documents, the uh, app called Documents, which is a file manager. So Apple moved in with iOS 11 last year. They make a big move into productivity. Yeah. Uh, doing files app, right. doing scanning, doing PDF, which PDF is PDF editing and everything. Yeah, yeah, which is very similar to what we do. The way we look at this, if our work can inspire one of the biggest companies to move into in this this area, we're doing something right. But we have to be very fast and like move and run faster because yeah. there is no way you can compete with giants like Apple, Google, and Microsoft. Right. Um, in the course, though, before they did all that, though, did they ever try to acquire you guys? I'm not allowed to talk about this. You're not allowed to talk about it because... Because like, we don't comment on this. I mean, we've had uh, um, different uh, offers from different partners, but uh, we never discuss, discuss and disclose publicly either these talks or our revenues. Because we are still right. private. Okay, so you're you're, but you have been approached. You can't say whether by Apple or anyone else. In like in throughout yeah. our life, lifetime. Yes. For acquisition. Yeah. There were some talks. Okay. But there were uh, some talks. I mean, from yeah, over okay. the course of the, from investment perspective, from acquisition perspective. Yeah. A couple okay. of times. We'll get back to investment in a second. Um, so with um, but with Apple. Um, they are, do you still have conversations with them or was that really an early days thing or do you keep it all up with them now? Conversations about? App development. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Happy I mean, placement. Um, each category player talks yeah. to the, and we managed to survive like for 10 years from very early on, build great products, have like tens of millions of active users on our platforms and who are using our products. And uh, of course, we, we will support the newest developments. For example, if Apple launches new iPad recently, right, with the new yeah. Pencil, we would support this new technology on day one. Right. If it's a new Apple Watch, we want to be there on day one. And we want mostly, like, this is, we're doing this for, for our users. Because of our users, we want okay. to give them this latest technology. Yeah. OK. Now, you mentioned you don't really comment on a uh, whether, you know, who, who might have tried to acquire you or if anyone has ever tried to, et cetera. What's quite interesting is that you are completely bootstrapped. Yes. You have never raised outside funding, which is pretty significant for a startup that's gotten to 100 million downloads um, to, to be able to have, have done quite all of that without uh, growth funding. But when we talked in September, you told me that you guys might start fund looking for funding. Tell us about that. So we were lucky enough to have a very first product to be a hit product. And yeah. we were making money from there early on. Of course, we failed uh, many times and learned a lot. And um, we believe that you are better off as an entrepreneur when you can make money. Yeah. When you raise money and you can spend money, oh, I can spend money. Like, everybody can spend money. Let but me ask a question. How many startups are out here? Can you guys raise your hands if you're in a startup? Raise your hands if you're in a startup. Raise your hands up high. OK. Keep your hand up if you are bootstrapped. Keep your hand up if you're bootstrapped. We well done, guys. Hands. Good job. Good job, guys. OK. So you want to listen to this. This guy's never raised any money. None. 100 million downloads. So and I believe that you are better off as an entrepreneur yeah. to, to to kind of to create your skill how to make money. And that creates a different culture inside yeah. because you are focused on your customer. And it's like a perfect creation of value when you create something that people can use, users can use. Users are paying money. Yeah. And people are OK paying money for things that work for them. Yep. But you have to be vocal enough to educate and to reach out to those people who might use your product. So now we are at this stage where we now trying to accomplish a much bigger challenge than ever before. Which, which is what? Which is uh, reinventing email. 
reinventing him up. Yes, yeah, so and that's why you need to raise money. I'm not saying we need. To, I'm saying we might raise money next year. Right. Uh, to scale faster uh -huh. and to launch in different platforms and to kind of uh, global expansion. Uh, and that's why, one why of do the you options. need to do that with outside funding? Why can't you do that the way you've done everything been, else up to now? We've been doing this ourselves for now more than three years. Yeah. And Spark uh, is a, like a three-year-old product. I think it's four-year-old. Okay, right. So also one of the things about being bootstrapped is that if your vision is that you might need a couple of years for this development, right, or, like, or, or your product, you can do it. You don't have pressure from somebody saying, you have one year. If you don't launch, we shut you down. Yeah. So um, with Spark, we've been, we've been um, investing ourselves and reinvesting in building this product. But once we now launched, we launched Spark for Teams, and now once we launch this, uh, we'll see this great product market fit, we might want to scale up our operations faster, scale up our uh, sales and marketing, and also different platforms. Yeah. And even may maybe go um, kind of web, which requires a lot, a lot of investment. So that's one of the options for us. OK. So it's quite interesting. I know you guys have been pushing Spark quite a lot. Um, what is your biggest app right now? Is it the PDF? Are we talking about revenue or users? Uh, OK, let's say first things. revenue. Which is your biggest uh, app for revenue? That's PDF Expert. PDF Expert, yeah. That's the one that I think most people will know uh, you for, I think, I think. Most people will know Scanner Pro okay. and Documents app, because okay. that's the most popular in terms of the numbers. OK, so which but one? Scanner Pro is the most documents. popular? That's documents. Yeah, we, for Documents. Uh, this year alone, we've added 15 million users organically. 15 million? 15, one five. 15, yeah, OK. All organically. Amazing. It's amazing. What's amazing to me is that it's happening at the same time that all the native platforms are really beefing up their own stuff. You yes, know? that's what, interesting. So what, why do you think that is? Why do you think people are flocking to an independent at a time when the native versions are just getting, F, if anything, better and better? So we ha and I, have free. A good, I have a good story. Um, yeah. Back then, when we launched. Uh, our PDF expert back in the day, we were the first one to launch this PDF editing yeah. for iPad. In two years' time or like one year time, Adobe launched its version of a free uh, PDF reader. Yeah. And I've got emails like, Dennis, you're out of business because you read this it. free app. Yeah. You're gone. Go away. What happened in reality, our sales increased almost 50%. I think what happens is that one, once like the big platform or a player educates a market, educates people that you can do this stuff on your yeah. mobile or iPad or Mac, some of them might want something more like advanced, more professional, let's say with a different user experience or much fast, faster. So, and I think that's where we come in because uh, we do perfect our designs. We do like parallel design with seven designers and like trying to really nail the experience. And that's what people kind of, that's what, what they yeah. love, and that's why they, why they get the apps. OK. That's fair enough. I mean, I think that we've seen that repeated across a ton of different apps, you know, where the native platform does it, yep. and yet there's still going to be a third party that just like one gets password, more. right? Yeah. Or Clean My Mac. Yeah. All those apps. Yeah. Slack. And Slack. Yeah. You know, there's a bunch. Dropbox. Um, so, you know, with your kind of gradual expansion of apps. I want to go back to Spark for one second. So now that's four years old. Are you, would you say it's a success now, or is it still needing more time? You guys are talking about investing money into it. You're really, really putting a lot into Spark. Would you say it's a success, or is there a point at which you'll say, you know what? It's not yet. We've tried, and we've not. It's not yet. It's not yet. When are you going to call success. time on Spark? <laughs> we will make it a success. You'll we make have it a no success. Other really, chance. really, really committed. We're really, really, really committed to make it a success. Why are you so focused on email? Like, why do you think it it's has to be something you win? Another story. Back in 2014, we had this. All our apps and top charts were making a great amount of money. Yeah. It's, it could be like a great lifestyle business. Um, but then we, they, we thought, let's solve a much bigger problem. Let's try to fix something. And Alex, our co-founder, runs into the room and says, guys, I know, we can fix email. We're like, mm-mm. <laughs> so he convinced us. And then we really believed in this. I took Alex. We flew to Silicon Valley. And then we talked to 80 people there trying to figure out the, like, what's the problem with email. What kind of people? VC, uh, everybody's like in, in tech space. Wait, did you try to raise money already? No, getting or? feedback. OK. Yes. So That's called soft marketing. Everybody yeah. was like, yeah, good <laughs> luck, guys. You're trying to solve yeah. email? Good luck. Yeah. So 
right now for Spark, uh, we do have more than half a million daily active users. Yeah. And now we're pushing hard into Teams. Uh -huh. And we believe that we can s help people to save time. If right. we, like a if, common inbox thing. If, yeah. Yes. If we save one hour per day for each person, I will be happy and that will be a success and that will translate into the financial results. Okay. Because you're doing it as a paid product, right? For Spark is free. But are you going to launch it as paid? So the Teams, it's like we, we yeah. kind of adopted the Slack model. Right. So it's free to so use is, as yeah. you started using it. Yeah. Once you tried it, you kind of go back to normal email. And then there is like Spark Premium for Teams. And right. the Teams will upgrade to, to kind of uh, ongoing subscription. Is going to or is already? It's live now. OK, yeah, that's, I thought we're adding a pretty lot of recent launch. Yes, yes. So how has that been doing so far? I think we have thousands of Teams, right? Uh, but only like Tens and hundreds are paying. Right. So it's it's this. We're still figuring out the, the exact product market fit. Right. And I feel as like we're like one percent away from kind of the hitting the, yeah. this inclination point. I got it. Okay. Well, let me just put it this way now. Um, you've given us a really interesting picture of like how it's taken four years. You still don't call it a success, but you're not giving up on it yet. You've had 32. Uh, things you've called time on, yep. uh, 32 different apps. Tell me how, and tell you know, entrepreneurs here, how you decide when something is finished that is just not going to work. When do you decide? <laughs> Flip I a coin. I think you can look at different data. You can look at different kind of okay. points and like what's happening. Are we like, is this a success? Is this not? But I think. Is it for, just when you see it stop growing, or? I think for the majority of entrepreneurs, it's just the feeling inside when you kind of stop believing in this. It's like a relationship. And then if you <laughs> like, if you kind of tell, like, say yourself, like, tell yourself, like, I'm done. Yeah. This didn't isn't working out. Then that's that's the end of it. Otherwise, if you believe in something, you will with iterations, you will pivot to somebody you something else. Stay with it. You think you, you should stay yes. with it if you believe. Yes. It. If you believe in this, if you feel that yeah. you can solve this problem, stay and solve this problem. Your job as an entrepreneur, your duty, is to kind of fu fund your vision, yeah. get a team, and solve that problem if you really want it. Okay. Now you, I asked you what your biggest selling and what your most revenue generating apps are, and you yep. told me two different apps. Yeah. Which is a relief. Do you think that you guys have managed to escape uh, Angry Bird Syndrome? <laughs> Do you know what which I mean by is, that? <laughs> which is they it's failed like, 50 times and then they had just one hit? Yes. Uh, I mean, we don't have one hit. You knew what Angry Bird Syndrome is. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't have one hit. Uh, yeah. All our, like, our four or five of our apps are in top charts on yeah. the App Store worldwide. Yeah, yeah. So we have this kind of, we managed to uh, figure out how to build successful products that people love and people use. Uh, and I'm not saying like each, each one of them like is a huge and massive success, but, but I think we managed to kind of to grow past this syndrome. Right. You've, you've broken out of that, of that rut. Hopefully. I mean, Angry Birds was a great game. And I mean, you know, the they're still doing Birds well. I mean, yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I mean, you can't fault what that success is, but I know it's been a difficult climb for them as a startup to, you know, or even as a post startup, as a public company now, to go beyond that. I mean, what, what would your advice be for, you know, avoiding that? I mean, for the, for, the, for the beginning, I think if people in the room, and including myself, can build something, something a scale of Angry Birds, yeah. that, that is that's pretty success phenomenal. Enough. Yeah, uh, that's enough. success yeah, enough. Very, very true. OK, now I want to ask you one last thing before we run out of time. Now, you guys are based out of Ukraine. We are uh, actually, we have people in eight locations worldwide. Yeah. But the headquarters are in Ukraine, yes. Yeah, which is amazing. To build a big, successful startup not in the valley, I always think is very commendable. To scale it, commendable. Ukraine is going through. Shit's going down in Ukraine. So what, how is that affecting you guys? We're trying to not comment on political issues as well. Um, okay. But uh, right now, we are not affected as a company, as a business. Um, I mean, I think the perception from outside might be affected of what's going on and like 
kind well, of. Well, it's a state of martial law, so you have to wonder how they're going to play around with all of their regulations and rules when you're in a state of martial law. It's a state of martial law, but it's like our daily life and our business life did not change. Okay. And um, I hope this will kind of pass away, and we can still kind of be focused on building great company and great business. Okay. Do you have a plan B if it does start to affect the company? Yeah. What is it? Depends on what happens. Right. But we kind of we we have to think like it's interesting like when you're in, in a country uh, that is in marsh under martial law, you have to think about plan B and plan C. Okay. So yeah. uh, the most valuable resource that we've gathered this throughout this ten years, it's not even like those one hundred million downloads. It's not even like the our like the revenue. It's our team. And uh, those people who kind of, yeah. we now have a team of 140 people. Yeah. So that's the most valuable resource. And if something happens, I think nothing will happen, everything will be fine. But um, of course, yeah. we will do everything to kind of to protect and uh, manage to protect our people. That's a good answer. Yeah. But we actually, we do yeah. have a Berlin office. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> um, so they can all immigrate. Um, but so, like now, you've got the um, plan B for your employees or C or whatever. But what about for your users? So, like, when you've got a state of martial law, presumably that's going to be impacting all kinds of things. How do you ensure? And has there been a situation yet where you would say that your users' data or anything like that has been potentially impacted? Mm -hmm. And how do you reassure people that whatever is going on between Ukraine and Russia, which has Pretty bad record for this sort of stuff. Uh, to that, that, that their information is secure, safe, private, and not touched by whoever. We do believe that we're on, on board with Apple about this, about the, the, that the privacy is the most fundamental and the most important things. So where for, is the where for, is the information located now? So for, for we don't have like only Spark has parts of bits of inf information. All the other apps. Uh, it's just like you install Scanner Pro and that's yeah. it uses iCloud. Right, that's no Apple. data. That's, yeah, but Spark have, is your email. We don't have any data. With Spark, we're trying to minimize the amount of data that we have to kind yeah. of to run the service. Otherwise, you can run the service. Right. But that's that's we're using kind of uh, encrypted Google um, Google Cloud. Okay. And Amazon. So it's nothing In to do with Ukraine. In which countries are those servers? Oh, I think it's it's uh, Germany and the uh, U.S. Okay. Yeah. So we're all, we're all safe. Nothing, so right nothing, now it's fine. Nothing impacts and you, our business yeah. and our users. Okay, that's wonderful. Dennis, you're brilliant for coming. Thank you so much. Thank Good you, luck guys. with whatever the next step Thank is. Thank you. Thank you guys. Dennis Giordano. Thank you. Yeah. See, that's enthusiasm. Did you see what that? Is? Yeah. Paying attention. See, I like Beanie. What's up, dude? What's your name? I can't hear you. It's okay. You still have all my love. Just for you, man. All right, let's keep things moving. Please give a warm welcome to our next guest. From Ubico, Stina Ehrensfard and your moderator, Frederic Lardinois. Thank you. Schieber. All right, security. Do you have any Yubico users? Anybody have a YubiKey? Whoa, two people? All right. Do you bring some free ones? Oh, uh, should I have brought some free ones for everyone? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> Next time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, these days, Yubico is pretty much the gold standard when it comes to hardware and two-factor authentication. You've been at it for 10, 11, 12 years now. How did you get started? Because cryptography is not your background. No, I have a background in product design. And um, this is the reason why I started an internet security company. I was going to log on to my online bank when they told me that I was secure with a username and a password and some software certificate I was going to download on my computer. But I happened to know a white hat hacker who said it would take him a day to write the code that would empty my bank account. Who was that hacker, you know? Well, um, what I did <laughs> is that I called up the bank and I told him the story and I said, uh, what are you going to do about that? And they responded, um, can you please tell your friend to not do that? 
And, and well, what I didn't tell them was that the hacker was my husband and the father of my three children. <laughs> that's, that's, what's the deal with your hat? Because that's a black hat. Yes. Um, a white hacker is someone who's a nice, and the black hacker is the bad guy. So Are you the bad guy? No. <laughs> uh, I mean, the reality is I have a background in product design. My husband is a brilliant electronic computer engineer. He could hack basically anything that was not hardware. And it's not everything hardware that is secure, but he, he could not hack smart cards. So we say, let's figure out a way to come up with a, something that he couldn't hack and that would be able to be scale and we could work everywhere. And that's how we came up with the YubiKey. Was your first product wasn't the YubiKey though, right? What was your first product? I mean, the first product in this company was a YubiKey. Okay. Uh, we, we came up with other inventions in a, a previous life, but that's, that's another story. Got it. <laughs> now, the way you got, what put you on the map was really that Google started using your products. That's the first time people really started talking about Yubico, I think. Is that fair to say? Yes. How did that come about? So uh, when I started, I had some challenges because everyone said, well, are you sure that uh, the hardware key is, is the future? Isn't biometrics or uh, phone apps or geolocation, all, everything by hardware, isn't, isn't that the thing that people want? Um, I was lucky to have a security engineer at Google buying my product. And he contacted me and asked for a quote for a larger order. And that's when I wrote my first business plan. Hmm. I said, if I'm in Silicon Valley, because I was actually at the time I was in Sweden. Right, you're a Swedish it, company. Yes, we were a Swedish company. We had not got much traction. But if I'm in Silicon Valley, and I work with five big companies there and two in, on, in Seattle, <laughs> I can win the world. So it was very, very focused business plan. Um, work with the leading platforms and browsers and, and online tech companies to figure out how, not only how to get them to r r use the product we had at the time, but continue to develop the product in collaboration with them so we could get native support in their platforms. And, and, and um, when Google started buy, buying my product, I felt, this is it. Let's, let's move to Silicon Valley. <laughs> so I did. How big a company were you at that point? Uh, we were a handful of people All at right. the time. <laughs> How did you get Google to trust you to buy your product, which is so integral to its Google security? Uh, I don't think they realized how small we were. <laughs> so that was, a good, that was a good start. How did you fake that? <laughs> um, I didn't really fake it, but I never said, hey, we're only, I, I mean, I th we were somewhere between five, we we're five full-time employees and, and another five contractors at the time. <laughs> uh, I had two addresses on my website. I had the Swedish address and then I had a, an address for um, our American. Uh, we, we literally had just a little, a little cubicle in a um, incubator in, in Silicon Valley. And I, I decided to put that address on the top of my website. So I looked more American than what I actually wore. And then it took some years before Google realized that we were just a small Swedish startup and not a Silicon Valley cool big something. <laughs> Did they think, oh, we should have just bought them with three people, it would have been cheap? I don't know. I think it was really, it's really good that we have been stayed independent <laughs> because in that way we've been able to move between all these platforms and vendors. I mean, after we won Google, we won Facebook and Mozilla and Microsoft and Amazon. And if we had been acquired by Google, we wouldn't be able to do this job. Being a small independent Swedish company that had to be agile, had to be innovative, and were not one of the big guys were, I think, not only secrets to sex to our company, but also to driving this standard. Absolutely. Now, when um, Google came out with its own, Google was is one of your biggest customers but they came out with their own security key earlier this year, which is not that unsimilar from yours. How did that feel? I was surprised, because they didn't tell me in advance, <laughs> which is not sort of how you treat a, a partner you've been working with for many years. Uh, but it was an interesting um, 
side effect is actually they told the world that this is the technology that they've never, never been hacked from. Mm -hmm. And there isn't any other authentication method that has the same good stats. Zero phishing attacks, 92% support reduction, four times faster than the Google Authenticator app. These were the stories they told. And because at the time when they launched the product, they didn't have anything in stock. So we were like, I don't remember, but it was like, 10 times more web sales than we normally have a normal real day. So I, I don't think that that was their, their in, intention, but they gave actually a, the business to us. <laughs> oh, interesting. So you weren't angry? I, I, I was disappointed that they, they didn't officially give us cred. Um, and um, I'd hope they'd s sat down with us and negotiated uh, the right terms instead of just finding someone else that have, they gave them the better terms. Yeah. One interesting thing about that Google key is, is that it's manufactured in China. Yes. That's yes, so. Is, is that a worry for you? Would, would you worry about that if you were manufacturing in China? Uh, 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 we have made a very conscious decision to manufacture in Sweden and in California under our own tight control. Um, and I think there are good reasons for that. What are those reasons? As a Swedish company, we don't have a, a government that require us to compromise the security and privacy of our users. That's true for the Chinese government. What about the US? US is um, more on the gray zone, maybe. OK. Why, why do you trust the uh, Swedish government so much? We, are, we haven't had war for 200 years. We are too small to have our own sort of advanced secret policy and, and sort of, I mean, we're, we're just, we, we have to be nice and humble. It's, it's the size of our, our country. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, talking about China, though, the other story coming out of China this year was that apparently uh, there were spy chips in the products that were sold in servers, mostly sold to Apple and coming from Supermicro. A lot of people are discussing that story. They're not sure if it's true or not. But does it feel plausible to you? This is not my area of expertise. I, but I think it's possible, yes. Why is it possible? Because it is possible to put in backdoors in most hardware products, in, in chips, in um, it's possible. It's actually easier to put backdoors into software, mm -hmm. but so when you ask me, is it possible? It's as possible to as not be possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. It's not. It's technically possible. That's right. what I want to say. Are you sure it's not happening with your chips? Um, we had a challenge last year. I don't know if you're aware. It was a. Um, in one of our chips from Infineon, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a security vulnerability. Unfortunately, I mean, the, the good thing is it only affected a minor part of our customers. It was, we've made millions of these keys, and there were in total 20,000 of our users we figured out that could have been affected. It was mm -hmm. a smart card functionality in a special use case that was affected of this chip. Um, and we replaced those keys. Uh, so yes, the reality is security is never a static, um, you know, just because it's hardware, it doesn't automatically mean that you're secure. So we always have to ensure that you um, are, um, you know, mitigate those risks. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of that, but have you put in any changes after that happened? Yes, we took control over all those crypto libraries in the uh, Infineon, uh, hardware platform. We, we just said we cannot um, not know what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot afford to not have control over it, yes. And we have very good firmware and security engineers working on this, constantly looking at it, reviewing it, doing audits and testing it. And we bring in researchers from uh, universities outside to help and, and sort of scrutinize our code uh, to ensure that we don't, um, you know, we don't miss anything. Right. Because you're not a three-people startup anymore. No, we are we're, uh, we're 160 people at the time. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a lot bigger than it used to be 10 years ago. Yes. Um, but you've been at this for 10 years. 
and yet every day I'm still putting in really long, complicated passwords that I have to change every three months for reasons only the people at Oath IT know. Um, why? Um, because uh, it takes time to develop a new global standard. And I think the reality is that it requires a new standard to make a big change. So what happened is that when we approached we got Google as a customer to buy our first one-time password device. Together with Google, we developed the U2F standard that eventually became the FIDO U2F, which is a username, password, and a key. We showed the world that you could not be hacked, that this is faster and easier than other authentication methods, but you still have a username, password. Mm -hmm. Then Microsoft came on board, and they said, we want to get, we like that it's unfishable or you know, practical and fishable, and we like that it's easy to use, but we don't want to store passwords. So the last couple of years, we worked closely with both Microsoft and Google and the FIDO Alliance community to figure out how we can replace the password. And last week, Microsoft launched support in Microsoft accounts of a super cool, super slick user experience. It's basically just a simple pin a four-digit pin. It's the same user experience that you have when you have an ATM card. And then you got the key. And um, that is the key to the passwordless future. Because now this standard is here. All the leading platforms and browsers are engaged. And there are open source servers that we provide where any company can make support for it. It only takes a few days. And then there are already multiple um, hardware devices including ourselves, that are out there uh, offering the authenticators. And in the near future, these things will be integrated directly into computers and phones. Right. And my Google have already put it in directly into Chromebooks. So that right. is the future of a passwordless. Not because you don't only want to say, hey, if we're going to replace username and password, it has to be with something more secure. We, we don't want to take it away and then like, oh, now, we're all, now all of us are hacked. If that security is built into all of my laptops, where does your company go? I still think there are security and privacy benefits of not always tying your identity into your computer and phone. So I see the use cases where it's good enough, and there are use cases where you want this external device. And this is about math. If you put your security into a multipurpose computer or multipurpose phone or multipurpose chip, like an Intel chip or a TPM, those chips are designed to do a lot of other things. And the bigger and the more things something do, the bigger attack vector um, from various sources, from Wi-Fi, from social engineering, from phishing, from, you know. Right. If you say, let's simplify this, let's realize we, we cannot compute, trust our computers, we can't trust our software, we can't trust our Wi-Fi, or we can't trust, you know. And don't even try to fix that, but instead move out the login credentials into a key, don't have a connection to the internet, encrypt it in the best possible way, and then put it in the pocket. Then we've done the best possible, what we can. Right. Well, I would expect you to say that since you're selling the keys, but um, are you saying we shouldn't trust these uh, chips inside a laptop, inside a phone then? I mean, we learned recently with the Intel meltdown that these multipurpose chips, they have more software. And the more software and the more advanced, um, you know, the bigger the system is, the, the bigger risk for there is for, for some kind of attack. I'm not saying we shouldn't trust it. It's just the, the smaller the attack vector, the fewer things the security credential. You know, the, if, if there is a chip or a solution that only focus on this. It's easier to keep it secure. That's sure. this math. Now, if we still have those keys, though, there's always been a trade-off between convenience and security. Using a key is still, it's, it's not as convenient as just looking at my screen and having the camera open up the phone for me. Is, will we ever get rid of that trade-off? Uh, what we will have in the future is the combination. So today I log in. Uh, on my phone with my fingerprint. That's how I open up. That's my first factor. You know, we talk about second factor. You know, factor could be a PIN, a password, a biometrics. You know, something that you are or you know. Uh, in addition to that, I have when I set up my com my phone, 
for the application, I want extra security too. I have added a YubiKey. Um, so for example, when I log into my Google account, I literally just press the, uh, the icon for my Gmail. I don't have to bring up my key more than once. Right. So a lot of people believe, oh, I don't want to carry my key because every time I log in, no. Most of these applications, you, you just do it once. You bless your computer or your phone with a key, and then you can put your, you, the way Google has set it up is on your computer, you, you have to do it every 30 days. On your phone, you only do it once. Right. Um, and that's a policy. And it's still much better security than, than SMS and OTP apps. And so it, it's always, a, you definitely, there is always a trade off between good security and, and good usability. But I think we've come to something thanks to working with these cloud companies, because they've helped when you build things into the browsers and the platforms and into the devices, you don't have to think about it. Right. Uh, so we finally have something that's super secure and super easy. There's one platform where it's not super easy and super, super secure yet, at least if I want to use a YubiKey, and that's the iPhone. Yes. IPad. Uh, we, we, are, we have an interesting conversation with Apple. We would have trying to convince them to open up NFC, because that is the... Um, and your new chips use NF yeah, I mean, NFC. Yeah, but NFC is already, it, the NFC is the near field communication, the contactless communication, where it's already used for Apple Pay. And it's just, a, it's not a technical conversation. It's a business decision they've done that they haven't opened up that. We have a, our YubiKey and that has NFC. You can use it for some Apple applications, but not for the new standard. Um, so we are working on other solutions that we're going to launch next year. And it's been a long journey. It's been one of our biggest sort of bottlenecks for, for, for getting mass adoption, yes. Will that be a solution I can plug into my lightning port? Yes. <laughs> and my USB-C port? Yes. All right, that's, that'll be good. That's about time. We already have Everybody a always asks me wh where- We already have a USB-C uh, solution, uh, by the that's way, true. yes. That's we already true. have. That's true. Um, looking at a little bit further ahead then, what's next for you? What's next for you, Co? I think right now, how I am here, and I was very excited when you invited me to come here because I'm ambassador for making this now happen. I mean, we put out a developers community. We op offer free open source servers. Uh, it's, it takes a few days to integrate. Uh, we invite developers, online services users to sort of join this movement, to get rid of passwords, to get rid of hackers. The internet is such a beautiful invention. We cannot let the fraudsters win. You know, there's... A lot of people are very cynical about everything being hacked. The stats we're seeing when you adopt this technology, you are not hacked, and it is easier and it is faster. So I think that the main mission we have now is just to continue to drive that. In addition to that, we are getting um, interest and, and requests from payment companies to say, hey, could this be used for payments and credit cards and IoT, and could we put this in cars? And so we're in- Crypto wallets. Yeah, crypto wallets. Yes, exactly. The same sort of standards parts. And, 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 and I, so I, I believe what we're going to do now is continue to evolve this technology uh, together with leading companies who approach us and say, we want to do this, just like we did with Google and with Microsoft. There will come a few others that help us develop things together with them. We have some of the best engineers on the planet. Awesome. That's all the time we have. Thank you very much. I hope we'll all stay safe. And next time, bring some free Yubi keys for everybody. I will. Sorry. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Boop, boop. There we go. Uh, we're going to break. Please be back at 3.55 for more sessions and one more Battlefield flight. See you then. demo days. Last time we were here was in the winter. This time it's summer and we're just here to check out all the sweet companies.
out like Uber drivers and Lyft drivers to put on their cars. Pretty good idea. This next company, I'm gonna let them explain it. We build diagnostic menstrual pads, enabling regular health monitoring and early diagnostics for women. Basically, a menstrual pad that collects a specific volume of blood. And what we found is that there is a lot of biomarkers in menstrual blood that actually tells you a lot of things about your health. We have kind of two groups of women. There is the woman who is interested in learning more about her health, or, or she has a specific lifestyle. Let's say she's a vegan. She wants to know, am I getting my minerals? She wants to track these things. That's kind of one group. There's another group of, of, of sort of women who have a condition, that a chronic condition, that requires them to go in and get blood draws very often. And for them, this is a product that you know is very useful, hopefully you know helps their life quality to be improved. Andrew Chen, one of my favorite presenters today. How'd it go, buddy? It went well. I'm tired, but it's good. Look good. You raising that money? Oh, you can't say that on camera. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, see ya. Hey, look, it's Andrew, the founder of Papa. Grandkids on demand, huh? Yeah, for sure. Grandkids on demand. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Let's do it. We connect college students to seniors. We send them to their homes for house help. We teach them how to use computers like social media and FaceTime their grandchildren. We ride them to doctor's office. We provide transportation. But most importantly, we're providing a social experience. We make it easy for anyone to access it. So seniors or families could call us. They could use our mobile app, um, or they could text or email us or go to our website and they'll request a student. We call them Papa Pals. They've all gone through a pretty strict process and provides follow-up information to anyone who's interested, like the family, friends, or other members of the care team. We launched in January in South Florida, and it's been growing pretty rapidly. It's really nice to know that we're helping a lot of people. Day one of Demo Day, summer 2018 is complete, and now I'm out of here. Day two of Demo Day. All right, let's go. Anna Esker. Hi. Yeah, we're checking out some companies, looking at all the demos. Now, which one am I going to invest in? I'm an investor. Here with the head haunch of YC Core, <laughs> Michael Seibel. How's it going, man? Good, Good. to see you. How are you? How's your summer? Summer was eventful. Had yeah. a baby. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I had a baby also. No way. When did you have a baby? All right. Back to work. Boom. So, YC. So, last time I was here, four months ago, yep. winter, winter, yeah. winter batch. Winter batch. Now it's summer batch yep are we noticing any trends between between that one and this one you know i was talking to some investors yesterday and um they're noticing a trend amongst our founders which I, I picked up on as well which is um i think as this next generation of founders coming through they know that they're gonna have to devote 10 to 15 years of their life to their startup and they're a lot more conscious about will their startup do good in the world and you know one investor walked up to me yesterday and he said I found myself rooting for these companies. Like, you know, like put investing aside, I found myself thinking, I want these folks to win. Um, like, and in a weird way, we're like, in, in, the, in the old days, like a business winning, you don't really associate with like, oh, you know, it's just whatever. But here it's like a business winning is, you know, a bunch of people getting childcare benefits or a business winning is curing cancer or a business winning is, um, you know, helping people pay for their student loans. Like, it's it's kind of a, it's it's a different vibe, which is really nice. So Definitely. That's Definitely. been a, a cool new theme. And I'll tell you what, it's it's founder-led. Like, we, YC doesn't have too many theses. We want to go where our founders are interested. So, 
um, it's fun to see the founders really caring about making the world a better place. Cool. Yeah. Now I'm gonna go into like a little bit of a, if it's okay with you, like a little sure. harder question. Hit me. We can Hit see me. If this Bam. Pow me. So I'm ready. In, the, <laughs> in this batch, you notice that there was a lot of like bio companies yep. and a lot of crypto companies, right? Yep. 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 And you know, in the past, there's been some like crypto companies ended up being, you know, a little kind of. Bull yep. And then there's also been, you know, the whole Theranos thing. Sure. Yeah, bio yeah, 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 yeah. So how do you, how do you guys as such a with 150 companies every batch, like every yeah, batch, yeah. do the due diligence to make sure that these companies are legit yep. uh, on both sides. But then also, what responsibility do you think you take mm -hmm. in doing that? Because almost you, why Combinator is viewed as like a standard barrier. Sure, like once you sure, get through sure, this, sure, sure, then sure. these companies are legit. Sure. Let's talk about that. So I think that um, if you look at the crypto companies, what I okay. Last question. What's up? This one. It's the batch is done. Boom. I know they're all your babies, and you always tell me this. Yeah. Give me a couple of your favorites for this batch. All, a couple that stood out. All my babies. <laughs> Love them all. They're all great. Never going to get me to choose. All so, right, man. You got, Thank you got you so much. You know, Thank you, know. you so much. All right. That's all right, right. Peace. Boom. Well, that's the end of day two. We've been here for two days. It's been fantastic. You get a really good sample, an idea of like what Silicon Valley is working on, all the new and upcoming ideas. Lots of cool companies, cool entrepreneurs, and all the VCs at Silicon Valley all under one roof. Isn't that just great? So anyway, from us to you, thank you for coming on this journey with us, and uh, see you next time. Snapchat is back with version two of Spectacles, its sunglasses camera. This time around, they're water resistant, they take photos as well as videos, and the case is a lot smaller, so you're more likely to bring them around with you. Snapchat only sold about 220,000 pairs of its old Spectacles because they were just kind of hard to have around. But even though they're still in a yellow bright case, the case is a lot smaller. It's more like purse fitting. It doesn't quite fit in your pocket, but it's definitely easier to bring around. The case also charges the glasses four times. What you'll notice when you put on the glasses is that the little bump in the back where all of the hardware is housed is a lot smaller, making the glasses feel lighter and more natural. When you put them on, they're actually quite comfortable, and with the little touch of the button on this left side, you'll see that the white ring of lights comes on, signaling that you're recording. If you tap and hold, you can actually take a photo now instead of just a video when you tap once. Spectacles will now come in a much more natural set of colors, a deeper blue, a deeper red, and black, instead of those crazy teal pastel colors like last time. And that means you're a lot more likely to actually want to put them on your face. Snapchat has put a lot of work into fixing the pairing process that was really clumsy before. Instead of a QR code, now you just press and hold down on the button while in the pairing mode in your Snapchat app, and they instantly pair together. Now all you do is hit the import button and it'll download all of your snaps off of your spectacles over Wi-Fi. You can see here that the quality is pretty high and the downloads are happening very quickly, about four times quicker than the time it took to download HD from Spectacles version one. Here you can see me riding a scooter along the pier in San Francisco. And Spectacles still shoot in that circular format, so no matter which way you turn your phone, it's always full screen. Spectacles claim that they can last almost a week with regular usage, and you won't have to download all of your snaps to your phone until after. And that makes it nice because you can leave your phone at home and just travel around with your specs. That's great if you're going to the beach or somewhere wet where you might not want to get your phone wet, but the Spectacles can actually take video and photos underwater. You don't want to dive to 200 meters like a diving watch allows, but going a few feet under the water is no problem. Because Spectacles don't have that yellow ring right here, it's a lot harder to tell that they are actually cameras. Nobody when I was riding around seemed to notice that I actually was recording video of them. And that could be a problem for Snapchat. It managed to avoid most of the creepy privacy issues that 
plagued Google Glass in its first few years because people always knew that you were wearing camera glasses. There's nothing super revolutionary about version two of spectacles, but they improve on so many of the pain points from V1 that I do expect them to sell better, people to record more content because they actually keep them with them, and for them to help Snapchat, maybe not just in the business side, but actually to get more interesting content onto the app that you're not gonna see on places like Instagram. Spectacles version two go on sale on April 26th in the US, UK, Canada, and France, and will be available in 12 more countries in a week or so. They're $150, and they're only available through Snapchat's website and app. No more of those Snapbot vending machines for now. But luckily, even if you just have V1, Snapchat is gonna push a firmware update so that everybody can take photos with their spectacles, not just V2 users. As long as the company doesn't endure a bunch of privacy scandals because people don't realize that they're a camera since they removed that yellow ring, I think these could be a big leap forward for Snapchat's hardware efforts. This video is not sponsored by DJI or Zion. We're doing this comparison vid because we like you guys. So we wanted to step our B-roll game up and get the Ronin M gimbal for our DSLRs, but we're already carrying hella shit and I don't want to add yet another Pelican case to the pile. A bunch of our production friends recommended the Zion Crane 2 as a compact solution. It seemed to be the choice for run and gun documentary filmmakers and wedding videographers. We spent a good month with it back in June and loved it. Then DJI came out with the Ronin S and well, let's get some test footage and comparisons. Unless you've been operating gimbals for a while, you're not gonna get smooth shots on your first try. It'll look like poo-poo. It took us a little practice and some really ugly footage before flying with them became a dance. Weight-wise, the Ronin S is about a pound heavier with an extra pound of payload capacity. We were able to mount the 5D and 35 mil on both with no problems. And the weight difference isn't that drastic since the weight distribution is pretty balanced, so it doesn't feel awkward. But once you adjust the tilt, roll, and pan to work with your running and walking shots, it's like butter. I mean, until you accidentally trip walking backwards, like the end. <clears throat> Honestly, both felt similar. It's like the difference between Team Edwards versus Team Jacob. You get it. You get it, you get it. <laughs> Balancing both gimbals take about the same amount of effort. The levers get stuck sometimes, but once you get the hang of it, you can easily balance them in two minutes. One plus with the Ronin S is that you can do a balance test on their app to make sure you don't fuck it up. Otherwise, if improperly balanced, the motor will overwork and you'll kill the battery and eventually kill the motor. For slow, walking cinematic slides and pans, both gimbals excelled. But it was hard shooting Brandon moving up, down, left, right, forwards, and backwards. It's much more difficult to track a fast, dynamic subject. The sports mode on the Ronin S only seemed to work when he wasn't jumping all over the place. No worries though, because nothing a little slow-mo and some editing can fix. Aw, yeah. One minor issue with the Zion, the menu dial is not intuitive. We kept wanting to press the button in the middle to select our options. You actually have to tap right to select. But the Zion does one-up the Ronin by having a sexier case, and you don't have to play Tetris putting it back in. A minor gripe about both cases, you have to unbalance and shift the levers around in order for it to fit. I just wanna run and gun, grab it and go. The Ronin S goes for $699, and the Crane 2 is $50 more at 750 
Let us know if you want us to do a tutorial on how to balance your gimbal and check out the site for the in-depth review on TechCrunch.com. This is the GoPro Fusion. There's been tons of reviews done, but they're all super long. Here's everything you need to know in 60 seconds. The look, the feel, the aesthetics of the GoPro Fusion, thumbs up. This thing screams GoPro design. It has a lens on front and one on the back and can shoot up to 5.2K. That's another thumbs up. GoPro Fusion software Fusion Studio is a work in progress. Works as advertised, but some definite glitches. It redeems itself by having plugins to work with Adobe Premiere and After Effects, so major thumbs up. Everyone wants to know about the scene. Further away the camera is from the subject, the better it looks, but the closer closer you get, the harsher stitching you see. So for 360 video, I'll say thumbs down. But for most 360 cameras, I'll say thumbs down. It's just too early. I mean, it looks good, but noticeable. But for the first version, it works and probably better than most. And that's like a reluctant thumbs up. That's most 360 video in general, a reluctant thumbs up. It costs $699 and that seems expensive, but for consumer friendly tech, I think it's not too bad. Overall, you won't use it that much except for small world effect and possibly here or there, which is pretty much the story of how GoPros go anyway. They're long. All right, let's do the quickest one you can ever get in the long You will need to set up uh, your credit card in the app. Okay, cool. So, should we do that before? Or? Uh, you know, I was eyeing some of these waffle cookies. That looks tasty. So I would recommend this one. Yeah, which one do you think is um, good? This one is amazing. So we have these o overhead cameras that know where you are, and then we have cameras on the shelf uh, which can track where the product is. So when you take a product, you now have a virtual cart. Um, and you put it back, it, it's taken away from your virtual cart. When you walk out, um, given that we try, we know what you have, um, we just charge you. Cool. You're, uh, you're done. I'm all set. Yep. So I'm finishing up this cookie I just bought, but I kind of feel like I stole. And you guys stock a lot of these new age foods and bath products here. Why did you select those to sell in your uh, autonomous store? That's a really good question. So one of the things that we're focusing on with this pop-up is trying to figure out what products to have in our next more permanent store. And so we tried looking at um, low margin and high volume products, such as uh, food products, and then also on the other end of the spectrum, which is higher margin but lower volume. And we wanted to figure out what would be best for us to iterate our technology on. How do they know who's who when there's multiple people in the store? So the overhead cameras are tracking um, how your body uh, looks like. So we don't do facial recognition, but we know what you're wearing. Um, and um, you are the closest person to the item uh, right now. So when you pick it up, we associate it with you. And if somebody notices that like, hey, I got charged for something that wasn't supposed to happen, or I didn't get charged for something, like, is there any way to appeal that decision? Yep, uh, so they can use the app to uh, talk to us, uh, and then we will uh, figure it out. What I really enjoyed about Inokio was that there was no lines, and it's this nice open floor plan of a store. It's great that there's less lines and the cashiers are freed up to instead help recommend products, but there's also the friction of having to download and sign into the app. And if the question will be, is this actually more simple, more convenient than just going to the 7-Eleven down the street?
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage TechCrunch editor and Disrupt MC, Jordan Crook. <sighs> Thank you again, TechCrunch. Appreciate the applause to the rest of you. We'll talk later. Uh, I'm a lucky girl because at TechCrunch, there are a few people, more than a few, that are really, really smart about crypto. So I have been able to avoid figuring that whole thing out which has been pleasant for me. Um, but the, the folks who are about to come on stage know quite a bit about it. So with that, I'd like you all to give a warm welcome, an actual, it's not even for me, it's for them. So just an enthusiastic, warm welcome, just try. Um, for Outlier Ventures, Jamie Burke, and for Materium, Vinay Gupta, and your moderator, Mike Butcher. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. I hope you're having a good time at Disrupt Berlin 2018. It's my pleasure to uh, um, introduce um, two uh, pioneers, really, of this space. Um, and uh, let's, let's get into it. Um, Vinay and Jamie, it's 2018. The crash is rumbling around our ears at this point in terms of cryptocurrencies. Everything's crashed in the last three months. What's going on, Jamie? Yeah, so obviously we're, we're in a crypto winter. I think that's pretty obvious to everybody and certainly to the two of us yeah. was fairly obvious that it was gonna happen at some point. And I think, you know, most of us that have been involved in the space for quite a while and are actively investing or building what we believe to be really important stuff um, in a way, we're kind of willing it to happen sooner rather than later. So Why is that, though? Well, so if you look at the scale of the dot-com bubble in terms of the amount of capital that was lost uh, compared to this, this is relatively small. Okay, It happened a lot quicker, a lot more compressed. Um, but broadly, uh, it was a, a fraction of what was lost in, in, in dot-com. I think that's important because... That's um, a useful context, actually, isn't it? Yeah, and it's also important because... You know, the, the deeper the crash, um, the more sustained the lack of capital coming into the space um, for, you know, genuine projects. And equally, the longer the kind of um, end user would be put off from using this stuff um, because of its connotations. Um, 
Vinay, I want to get into what Materium actually is in a minute, but uh, doesn't that mean that you've missed the ICO window? Because Materium hasn't ICO'd yet, has it? Uh, we were um, never interested in ICOing on the set of legals that were common in that period. Uh, we've always been uh, something that would be framed as being a security token, and the security token exchanges and all that infrastructure is still being built out. Uh, because of the nature of the business we're in, the legals have to be extremely precise. And you know, the legal reviews that we did of the utility token model, we were not comfortable with, particularly because of the risk of SEC action. So we've been kind of holding fire for the legal situation to straighten itself out before we moved. Uh, and I think you'll see next year the security token infrastructure and the properly regulated crypto sales will begin, and it'll be a very different world. I want, um, I'm, we're going to get into Materium and, and, and where it is, but I, I know that you both are uh, enormous uh, commentators and also observers of this space. So let's 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 crack this, you know, the, the currency issue and the you know where this you know the funding aspect of everything is coming from at the moment, because you know you mentioned. Jamie, that, uh, that actually this could be a, a moment when the real innovation starts. In fact, um, if you look at between 2000 and 2003, 2004, you know, you, that's when we got Google, eventually we got uh, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's when Amazon really started motoring. Uh, we, know, we know all of this. So, but, so was the crypto winter inevitable? Is there manipulation going on behind the scenes that we're not aware of? Um, what's your view, Jamie? Yeah, so, I mean, the asset class um, has been in a kind of a, a, a regulatory grey area, um, and uh, largely, most regulators have just been passively observing, and increasingly there's now um, action uh, taking place, primarily by the SEC, on low-hanging fruit and obvious securities violations. Um, but I think it's important to kind of step back and take a macro view of, of what all this means. And so the reason why we were able to have something like an ICO, and an ICO is a very uh, specific innovation using crypto assets and tokenization specific to crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. um, that does not mean that every uh, token must have an ICO or every token is purely there for fundraising. A token, uh, a, a unique digital asset that can be used to disincentivize or incentivize a distributed network to contribute value, compute power, storage to share value is incredibly powerful. It allows you to hard code um, rules and game theory into these systems. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, most tokens that came into the market last year and the year before were really just instruments to raise capital. There wasn't much thought into how these things can really be used to underpin the systems that they're, they're supposed to be native to. So uh, I, I think there needs to be kind of a clear line between looking at what was the ICO innovation yeah. that was enabled by this new economic layer to experiment with native to the web and the internet um, compared to tokenization more broadly. I mean, Vinay, you've got a, 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 some thoughts about how we, you know, the pre-ICO, people were actually trying to do things with Bitcoin mm. prior to Ethereum, Ethereum, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, the, the sort of first wave of kind of first wave, yeah, like sudden innovation in this space was what they call the altcoins, where people would take the Bitcoin source code, they'd make some changes, they'd stand it back up as a new network with a new purpose, a new monetary policy, and there was a whole bunch of activity around altcoins, and some of those are still significant. Um, uh, Litecoin, for example, is one of those that's still running. Um, that kind of scene began to spin down once it was easier to do that kind of stuff on Ethereum because you didn't have to run your own decentralized network. You could just write an Ethereum script and then you could run it on a smart contract. So the innovation kind of moved there. And again, some of those projects are very successful, some aren't. But they all should have been properly regulated securities from the beginning because they were raising money directly to the general public. And you know, the governments didn't go away. The internet doesn't exist in a separate dimension. There was always going to be a settlement with regulators. And what will come out of that is a correctly regulated token economy next year. The SEC will define these things are not OK, these things are. The regulated exchanges will come up. It's all going to straighten itself out. But by then, it will be much closer to regular finance than the kind of original blockchain Wild West. Isn't this going to mean, though, that um that in that window, many, many projects and, and much of the activity are going to move to non-US countries, Asia, parts of Europe, etc. Sure, but I mean, the, the kind of 
the jurisdictions in which offshore finance happens have always been a relatively small part of the global financial picture because they're relatively small countries. And if they get too far out of line, the US starts extraditing people. So it's always going to come down to a settlement with the SEC rather than an end run around them. It's Any. always compromised. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's important. So when you look at ICOs as they were conducted uh, previously, they were trying to achieve um, too much um, without enough design. So they were trying to have an asset that could be both a means to raise capital, to speculate, and um, to incentivize people to join a network and bootstrap it and contribute value. Um, and the reality is, is that um, like most startups in their, in their early stage, 90% will fail in their first three years. And I think we're seeing that mirrored across most tokens. Um, you know, they've raised capital on the promise of delivering some kind of utility. And like most startups, they fail. Now, the problem with that is, is that the, the reason why you have investor accreditation, and it's, of course, a very political subject, who should be able to participate and assume certain levels of risk at what stage. Um, because equity has certain amount of protections and, and rules around it, you can only sell that to certain people if they're accredited. And with, with a token, generally, they were sold almost indiscriminately. And so what happened was you had a huge part of the population that bore lots of risk in things that were more likely to fail than to succeed. And you can debate whether that's right or wrong. But I think what we're going to start to see now is um, when you're building out a network, so pre-utility, before you can actually use that token in the system, you're probably going to raise money uh, through equity, and that will be done compliant so, with local laws. So we're back to square one. Equity is back. Uh, uh, projects will be raising on equity, not on tokens as much. Does that mean the end of the kind of the great sort of white hallowed uplands, or the, the, the hallowed uplands, shall we say, of, uh, of not needing venture capital anymore? So it depends um, what projects you're talking about. So if you're talking about um, protocol and infrastructure, um, the, the great innovation that we've got that I, th I think is still going to stay with us is the idea that you can that should be open sourced and it can be tokenized, and that gives it very powerful network effects. Um, and so these things absolutely should uh, have tokens. Um, the point is, who should participate in financing? Um, uh, that network and who should participate in economic value creation and, and at what stage. And so I think we're going to start to see hybrids where projects will initially be uh, e uh, raise money through equity, the riskier part, until they get to the point where they need wider adoption and they need this token to incentivize the network and various behaviors. So it'll look a little bit like uh, previous venture. And we just did a report recently where um, venture has pretty much filled this void now, of uh, which was previously ICO pools and, and, and retail money. Um, when Materium is, is, I know that Materium is raising at the moment. Does that mean you're going to be going after traditional venture money? Uh, yes, very much so. I mean, we, we have investors from a variety of different sources. Um, but traditional venture money is important because they put a lot of skill on the table as well. And the kind of scaling challenges that we're expecting to see over the next year or so uh, are much more like the kind of things that you see on traditional venture because some parts of what we do are very much jurisdiction by jurisdiction. It's not just you stand up the network and you go. And the expertise that traditional venture companies have, they're basically selling in exchange for preferential rates. Your venture capital has always been consultancy masked as investment. And the most successful VC firms are almost like consultancies. They've got more in common with McKinsey than they do with a bank. So let's get into a little bit more about Materium. So you, um, we recently ran a story on TechCrunch about how you'd uh, tokenized a Stradivarius violin, very rare violin from the uh, 17th century, I believe. Yep. And, um, and so how did you do that? Why did you do that? And why does that illustrate uh, what Materium is? So the, the violin project is a multi-step project, right? Uh, the first thing we do is we take the violin and we move it into a new kind of governance framework so that the classical community, uh, classical music community as a whole has a stake in the governance of the instrument. What are you doing? Are you, are you scanning it, 3D mapping it? What? Oh, all that's already done. Uh, Stradivarius violins are typically identified by CAT scans. So step one, you build a governance framework, and this is the phase that we're in right now. Yeah. Once you've got the governance framework and the right set of governors associated with that, that's all then framed into a smart contract. Then what you do is you split the equity in the instrument away from the governance, and the equity is sold to the classical music public 
uh, using the crowdfunding regulations. So you wound with, with a token which is managed by the equity crowdfunding regulations so it can be sold directly to the public. So I can own a part of a Stradivarius violin? And participate in the governance of it. And the long-term objective Governance here, meaning? Governance meaning things like where is it played? How right. is it maintained? Right, uh, because these things are—I mean, these are core human heritage. Right, the classical music world ran on Stradivarius violins for centuries because we didn't know how to make better violins. There was this collection of 500 of these things, and they were head and shoulders better than other violins that were made for reasons that we've only figured out scientifically in the last couple of decades. So the idea is to take these things out of private collectors' hands and uh, give them directly to the classical music community. So it could be as a, whole. a public good. Yeah, this is exactly the notion. And once you've got that template established, you could do it not just for fine art, but you can also do it for ecosystem assets like rainforests. Uh, if you want to protect, you know, gorilla wild, uh, wild you know, lands, you could just go there and basically have everybody that's interested just buy up to hundreds of thousands of acres of forests and preserve it. There was a, uh, an environmental uh, movement that uh, to not so much tokenized, but sold off one centimeter by one centimeter yeah. pieces, pieces of land um, to the uh, the field next door to Heathrow Airport to stop yeah. the third runway being built. Is, so you're saying that we could tokenize the Brazilian rainforest and Amazonian rainforest and uh, stop it being shut, uh, cut down? Oh, yes. I mean, there are already companies doing that uh, from the private equity side. So Permian Global Capital has an enormous portfolio of rainforest assets. It's just a question of how do you make the link from that being a private equity game for the very rich to being something where people can show their values by buying and protecting the assets you know, in nature that they consider to be critical. There's a, there's a problem though, Jamie, isn't it? Because there are many projects out there who say, we can tokenize this, there's Proppy, which is tokenizing real estate, there's, uh, there's several startups, uh, uh, names with which escape me for a second, who are saying they can, they can tokenize uh, collectible art. You know, what, is this a really sort of a viable proposition, especially for investors? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, once you solve some of the legal technical issues that Materium are, um, are trying to do. In theory, you can uh, tokenize, securitize, and fractionalize the ownership of pretty much anything. Um, and of course, you know, that's going to bring huge amounts of liquidity to fairly illiquid assets purely because the bar of ownership is too yeah. high. It's, a, it's also very useful for investors from a diversification perspective. So the ability to buy a little bit of tens of thousands of assets is the kind of thing that you could only do at a very large scale right now. But it gives a kind of stability to your investments that makes ordinary investors more able to get the kind of stability of return that you get with, say, pension funds. So I think there's a pretty good chance that this will turn out to be good for retail investors once the markets have settled down and the irrational exuberance has burned off. But I would say, you know, so because of the whole ICO thing, you know, tokenization and the idea of a utility token have kind of been poo-pooed like it was a failed experiment. And now the shift is towards security tokens. That's the next big thing. Um, and of course, within that, you have this subset of let, let's tokenize equity in startups. Um, and for us, um, whilst that will definitely be big, it's kind of giving up on the hard part of figuring out how do we actually tokenize these global public utilities that will be the protocols that are going to be foundational to the web. And hopefully Materium might be one of those. We have Sovereign, which is bringing an identity layer to the web. Ocean looking at data marketplaces. Um, Fetch looking at AI. So you know, there are a number of critical foundational layers in what we believe is an emerging Web3 stack. Um, they should almost definitely be um, open source and tokenized, because they are global public utilities. And the problem is, if, if the tokens that um, power those things are securities, they can't be global. They're inherently local. And so this is why we have to solve um, why there should be a classification of, of a utility token. When is it appropriate? How, how is it appropriate those things are financed? Who should be able to participate in these systems? That, this is a really big, important project that we can't give up on because the existential threat that we've got to somehow counter is currently the web is incredibly centralized. Data monopolies are platform monopolies are now AI monopolies. And increasingly, we're devolving power to a handful of organizations with our home, our car, health. Um, so we need an alternative. And I think that alternative will be, will be uh, tokenized. I, I know, Vinay, you've got some views about how blockchain and AI will meet. Mm. How is that? How will that work? So the way that Materia looks at the world 
is that right now the blockchain's big problem is you can't get out of the blockchain from inside of the blockchain. There just aren't on ramps. You know, we talk about things like one day you'll be able to rent apartments on the blockchain and you'll have smart contracts and escrows and all the rest of this thing. But right now, all of that is notional. None of it works because we can't get access to the legal assets in the real world, the houses and the cars and the so on from inside of the smart contracts. Once you can do that, and that's the bridge that Materium is crossing, then you wind up with a large pool of assets in what we call the smart property register. That smart property is a natural target for AI algorithms because you say, okay, we want to pull this car, that house, uh, these flights, you know, that coordinated trip where you go and see whales or wherever it happens to be. If all of those things are attached to smart contracts, the AIs just spider all of those smart contracts figure out what's possible, and then arrange them into value propositions for people or for other AIs. So it gives you this ability to reach out from the AIs to the real world. And what the blockchain gives you is the link that lets the AIs make a decision that affects a, an actual physical object. Why do you need a blockchain to do that, though? Um, because you need some way of managing the property rights that is secure and legal so that the AI uh, actually has the ability to do things like rent you an apartment. You need something to handle the agency questions, to handle the proof, to handle the payments. The blockchain is kind of like a low-level control mechanism for getting a hold of the real world. And also it's trustless, as it were. It's trustless, and, it, and it's, it's a machine interface to legal reality. And once you've got the machine interface to legal reality, that's what lets the AI arrange legal reality. Without it, the AIs are only able to reach property that is owned by the company that runs the AI. So like if you've got supply chain optimization inside of something like Apple, there's plenty of AI there, but it only works on assets that Apple owns. If you want to do general optimization of the world, you need the blockchain to index the assets of the world, then the AI runs on top of that layer. Jamie, I know your, your view is that perhaps Web3 might not come about the full decentralization that people have talked about, and that actually, I mean, that it, it might row back. I mean, where do you think we are? Yeah, so I just want to expand upon what Vinay was saying about the interplay between AI and blockchain. And we use blockchain as a catch-all term. Obviously, it's much more nuanced than that. It might yeah. not actually be a blockchain. It might be distributed ledger technology, a different like, iteration that, of it. I mean, things like Amazon Quantum, right? Right. I mean, you know, it, it's not necessarily true that it will all be blockchain. There's a range of things here. Right. But, but actually, so the, at Outlier Ventures, our thesis is what we call convergence. We've done two papers on it. You can find them on our website. Um, and we specifically invest at the convergence of distributed ledger technology, which includes tokenization for us, things like IoT, data marketplaces, so big data or the problem of big data, uh, machine learning and AI. And so for us, this Web3 stack is all of those things. IoT is collecting the data, harvesting the data, um, sensing the world around it. Uh, that then needs to be managed, curated within data marketplaces, which Ocean does. Um, and then it moves its way up to degrees of automation through smart contracts and then potentially something more intelligent like autonomous economic agents. Um, so it's a combination of these technologies that's actually is what's most interesting. Um, but then to your point about um, you know, where are we now and might there be a more pragmatic step to what I just envisioned there, which is you know, it's a, at least a 10-year project, if not a generational project, about how, how all these technologies come together. And so there is an argument to say that, you know, uh, Ethereum was a very bold project, was a very ambitious project, and it was it was it was driven um, by a particular ideology, and it was it was a big leap, right? And there's a big gap between the world today as Web two and what we might call Web three. And I think there's a good argument to say that maybe there's a baby step, which is Web 2.5. Now, a lot of people don't like that because it's not as decentralized mm -hmm. um, uh, as people may want from something. But the reality is, as Vinay was saying, there's a lot of corporate innovation happening now at IBM, at SAP. Um, is it truly decentralized? Is it truly Web 3.0? No. Is it being used and deployed for real business use cases? Yes. And I think there's this transition, this pathway to decentralization. Vinay, do you, will uh, Ethereum end up being the friends to, to another Facebook that might come along? <laughs> um, so Ethereum as it stands is a pretty good prototype, right? I mean, when you're at this kind of 20 transactions a second level, that's the same kind of performance we had from punched card, punch card machines in the 1950s. So it's always been clear that the all singing, all dancing scaled blockchain was the thing that had the reality and the power behind it. And it's been a contest of wills to see who could get to that technology first. 
the, the recent pulling together of the Ethereum community around Ethereum 2.0 as a concept, um, I mean, the, the vision was there even back when I was at the foundation in 2014, 2015. It was always considered that the proof of work level was simply an on-ramp to proof of stake, and that once you got to proof of stake, you could do sharding and you could do parallelism and it would become fast. And that was understood as being the real Ethereum. So the thing that they're calling Ethereum 2.0, I think, is the jump, right? And it's what Ethereum was always meant to be. Ethereum replaces Ethereum. And it always has to be that way. The new way. version. Always has to be that way. The question is, when you're up against things like Amazon Quantum, which they just announced, right? Amazon's own internal blockchain-like protocol. In that environment, do you wind up with something that looks like Microsoft on Apple versus Linux? And it's the kind of plucky outsider that winds up winning because it winds up on all the mobile phones kind of unexpectedly? Or does it just get trampled? Or do you wind up with total dominance? And that, that question, it's the old dynamics of open source ecosystems versus proprietary ecosystems. And in fact, in nature, we always find those things in a balance. If the proprietary guys tax too much, everybody uses open source. We've never yet seen a situation where open source became long-term dominant. Maybe Again, this time. You, as an investor, what would be your pick? Well, the, the, the thing is, you know, these things are so much more complex than startups, right? We're, we're talking about complex systems. We're talking about um, economies. So there's so many different skill sets that need to be applied. And so it's totally understandable that um, the, the, the projects that are first out the gate won't get everything right. I think actually where projects have gone wrong is the rush to codify things and commit to high degrees of decentralization day yeah. one you, I mean, whilst they're learning. Because if you think about lean startup principle, you know, you don't commit code until you've, you've verified assumptions. Yeah. And so I think we need to move back to a kind of a more agile approach to uh, ach well, achieving decentralization. I mean, a lot of this is that the, the blockchain has always been the domain of bond villains. It's always been huge overarching world transforming ambition. Um, but the traction is always, almost always at the other end of the scale. You know, there's still this outgoing question, can we make the big jump? Can we change the world? Or is it going to be just a component of a big mixed ecosystem? Right, in one sentence, what will you be doing next year? Uh, tokenizing everything and uh, providing the interfaces for the AIs to reach the real world. Jamie? Well, I'm just looking forward to several of our projects that have been in development for at least two years, doing the hard work of token design and building out networks that didn't ICO coming online and providing, you know, pragmatic but still ambitious protocols that are going to allow Web3. Well, well, there you go. That's what's going to happen next year. And uh, we'll see, I think probably the next couple of years might well still be the most interesting time in blockchain. Yeah. Well, for now, Vinay and Jamie, thanks very much for d coming to Disrupt Berlin. Awesome. Lovely. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Okay. So we're going to do even more. We're just doubling down on crypto here. And uh, also pay close attention to this next session because uh, our speakers will be answering questions on the Q&A stage sh just after this. So if this piques your interest, head on over there and and ask her some questions. And with that, I'd like to uh, please welcome to the stage from Thunderbeam, Kaidi Rusalep and Josh Konstein, your moderator. So the funding landscape has changed. Startups are no longer going public nearly as quickly as they used to. And that's really changing the entire ecosystem of who is getting funded, who's getting rich, and what's happening to the future of the early stage startups. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the industry at large and what's going on. So first, I just want to ask, why do companies want to stay private so long now? Many reasons. First, if you think about um, uh, easiness of access to private capital versus uh, public capital, right? It's much more easier to go and approach the VCs, later to go and approach the PEs and, and get the check of not just 10 million or a couple of hundred millions, but billions of dollars. We know the uh, latest uh, big funds uh, 
created by the uh, SoftBank, right? $100 billion, and, and they, they even want uh, to make it bigger. And the second reason uh, why companies, and especially founders, want to stay uh, uh, private longer is they control the valuation. They want to be the masters of the price. Right, because when they go public, they're kind of at the mercy of the public. They really don't have nearly as much control. In a way, yes. So when companies do stay private, that ends up blocking up a lot of this capital. It doesn't end up yes. being, with the exits, it flows yes. to people yes. who eventually become angel investors, yes. invest in the early stage companies. So what are the downstream effects of these companies staying private longer? Well, uh, uh, depends on um, whose point you take and whose point of view you take, right? If, if you think about the early stage investors, for them, it's about getting access to the early stage investments, but then again, getting uh, exit from the early stage investments so that the capital can serve what it's meant to be served, to get into the early, take the risk and get out early. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, one point. If you think of the uh, founder's point of view, then uh, at, at one point, you should be able also to incentivize your employees. And you become much more appealing if your employees get shares that at one point become tradable. But if they, they eventually become tradable, why does it matter if they get them when they're already public versus when they're still private? They become tradable at one point, but it may not be in three years' time, it may not be in five years' time, maybe it's in nine years' time. And so you think this is affecting the retention for these startups as well, because people aren't necessarily going to stick around for that long. Yeah, yeah. what do you do with your, with your options if, if they just stay as options? Well, that brings up this question of regulation. Should, these uh, should governments mandate there be liquidity for startups so that employees can exercise their options long after they leave or that uh, com companies must allow employees to sell on the secondary market? Uh, n no, I, th I think it's, the, uh, it's still the, uh, um, the entrepreneurs should be able to run the company the way they want to run the company. It's, uh, it's still the um, uh, founders who uh, have to decide how they want to work with their employees. But what I think what the government should do, they should enable of raise of uh, exchanges, private exchanges like Fondabimis, which gives the uh, founders the opportunity to make the shares tradable. That's what the government should do. What happens when a company doesn't want their shares traded on your secondary market? then they won't trade on the secondary market. So uh, the employees can't go against the wishes of those companies and sell them anyways? Now we're going into the uh, legal uh, corridors, right? Yeah, I want to hear about the illegal corridors. That sounds really interesting. <laughs> the Bible of every single company is a shareholders agreement. And shareholders' agreements uh, describes the way the shares are treated, describes the way should the shares be tradable or not, when the shares should be tradable, how much options are allocated, and what is happening around those uh, options and the allocated options. So this is where it all starts. And I know that the, uh, quite many uh, VCs uh, lately started to ask, at, at least, uh, uh, close to us, started to write in the shareholders' agreements that shares should be tradable and could be tradable. Then the second is, uh, will uh, or is there enough private markets where those shares can be uh, tradable? And is there any um, enough um, uh, trading opportunities for those shares. And this is now where the uh, governments uh, step in. No, it's not actually very easy to trade the private shares and make those private shares uh, tradable. Why wouldn't a startup want their, com their shares to trade on the secondary market if you've said that that actually will enhance retention? Because people will want to go work for a company if they know they're going to be able to trade the shares later. It's the... Um, uh, Right. It's the uh, giving opportunity for uh, early stage investors to do their job properly, which is exit properly. Second is to engage your uh, customers and partners 
because when you make your shares tradable, you enable uh, the um, family around you, the network around you, right? Become not just your client, but also your investor. In incentivize the uh, clients and partnership uh, relationship, and then the employees as well. But you, you're saying that in some cases, startup founders don't want their shares to trade on the secondary. And if so, then you guys don't allow them to be traded and they have to go into those illegal corridors. But why wouldn't they want them to, to trade on the secondary market? When I was, um, my, uh, my background is I was the uh, CEO of uh, Nasdaq in Estonia. And then uh, when I once, and, and I was talking to quite many uh, entrepreneurs and quite many CEOs. And, and at the end of the day, it's either the decision of the founder and the CEO whether to make the company uh, tradable on the, uh, any of, is it the public market or the private market? And the second is either it's coming from this, uh, um, laws and, and rules and regulations, and, and which was one of the reasons why, for example, Facebook became uh, uh, public or, or why they were forced to, to go uh, public in, in the states uh, where they were. Because they reached that 500 shareholder limit yes. and they had to get it done? Yes, yes, and yes. So, I guess, so that makes sense that if, if a company doesn't want their shares to, go, uh, to be sold on the yes. secondary, it's because they're yes. worried that they might get forced to go public before they're ready. Yeah, but uh, nowadays what I, uh, what I see is, is the trend also, what is changing in the, uh, whatever is it, the private uh, market or the public market, is the companies and the startups very much value the crowd around them and very much value the network around them and building up a network effect is something what you can do by uh, making the company even if it's on a private market making it uh, tradable you can um, you can make the family or, or your network even closer to you. They are your shareholders, which means they will start working for you because with this, the share price will go up. And, and I see it's, it's becoming a, a, even when we talk, for example, about the uh, ICOs, it's also the network effect. It's not just about raising the capital, but it's about building the network and incentivizing the network. Some of the tokens and, and majority, the ICO tokens, are actually the community tokens. So the price depends on the community effect and the network effect. So you said that startups can be worried about selling their shares on the secondary market because it can force them to go public. Sometimes startups just go public too soon Ooh. by themselves. Yeah. And in, you know, do you have any specific examples of companies that you think kind of raced to go public, which would have really benefited from using uh, secondary markets as a liquidity uh, off valve so that people could get that liquidity and they wouldn't have to go public so soon? The, the, uh, the examples of if they benefited of No, the ones that, that had problems because they went public so, too soon. We can't generalize it that specifically for this, they went uh, because of that they went public, uh, the, the, the company had some kind of problems. I mean, the problems raise when you go uh, public on the wrong reasons. If the company is forced to go public, then the attitude is always, oh, I have to be here. I don't want to be here. If the company wants to go public, the attitude is, is from the start very different. You want to be public, which means you behave like a public company, you treat your uh, public investors, you uh, produce the information, publish the information. It's very different, so we can't generalize it. I mean, I'm not asking you to generalize, but I'm asking for specific examples of companies that went public and then ended up flopping, at least for a few years. You know, I, I think of Twitter as being a big example. They went public when their business was really not set up right. They were not making nearly enough revenue. They had not figured out their ad, uh, their ad products. And so the share price cratered. And now, only years and years later, are they finally riding the ship and finally getting towards profits. So you know, are there any other companies that you think took that path of going to public too soon? Yeah, but um, they didn't, the trouble is not because they went public. They, it, it was too, too early, yes, but why did they go public? So it, I wouldn't say that it's this, what you say is exactly in the in the one to one uh, correlation. Sure. So do you have any other examples of companies that went pri public too soon? Y 
We can uh, say the same about, for example, uh, LinkedIn. Yeah. They also made public uh, or went public a bit uh, too soon, right? Um, there's another interesting uh, story around the, uh, or I mean, like uh, Google also went public a bit too soon, but it was 2004. They raised around 36 million before going public. How now, crazy is that that Google had only raised 36 million dollars before going public, when now that's like a toss-off round you see a dozen of on TechCrunch every day? Yes, and and the, the uh, latest, I mean, Alibaba raised like 11 billion of going public. But I mean, for the, for the Google, maybe they could have also raised some private capital before and could have been uh, uh, private for a while, but they didn't. So it, it's which side you take. Do you take the founder side or do your company side or the investor side, right? So you guys have built something really fascinating through the blockchain. You know, obviously, cryptocurrency prices are cratering right now, and the era of speculation is coming to an end. Instead, people really want to see true utility coming out of the blockchain if this thing is ever going to become really worthwhile. What have you guys done with the blockchain, and how has that actually helped your business? Yeah, the uh, Funderbeam is a funding and trading platform of the private companies. So when um, uh, companies raise funds, uh, then every single investment we record in the blockchain and we record the transaction in a blockchain. So in a way, we are like a private uh, exchange. And uh, the way we use the blockchain is, is like an uh, audit trade or the ledger. So we keep it uh, to provide the uh, trust on the um, investments and, and uh, on the uh, transactions. And the funny thing, actually, at the beginning when we built it, uh, started to build it in uh, 2015, then we also built the trading on the blockchain. And then we understood that the uh, capacity and, and the speed of running a trading platform on the uh, blockchain as the primary source was, uh, wasn't enough, the speed isn't enough. So we do trading now off-site on our, uh, on our uh, database and then record the investments on the blockchain. So we're, we were a bit too early in the technology, we can say it. So you were, you were burned by blockchain too then. You guys tried to put your whole trading platform on there, yeah. but in Instead, you end up just sort yeah. of keeping track with a yeah. ledger of who's, yeah. who owes what. But, but, be, but that's, that's still the uh, remaining uh, problem right now of, of uh, the public blockchains. And, and if, if you run your system on the private blockchain, you can have as, uh, the speed as you want. But then there's the philosophical question between the private and the public blockchains. But anyway, it enables us to get rid of all the service providers on the post trade. So we don't have them. So you don't have brokers and people like that. No. Does that mean nobody has to pay those extra fees? Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys take a cut? We uh, take the cuts on the funds raised and uh, cuts on the uh, trades. And how does that compare to what a broker would charge? Uh, it's, it's not just about broker when we talk about the uh, uh, main uh, stock markets. It's the broker, then you have the clearing agents, and you have the settlement agent, then you have all the uh, central uh, entities, and it's about the um, uh, trading fee, it's about the brokerage fee, then it's about, about the account fee. Uh, there's uh, different fees what actually the, uh, the investor is paying. So speaking of blockchain, last year we saw this massive wave of ICOs, all these blockchain companies raising just somewhat ludicrous amounts of money mm -hmm. with very little accountability. Mm -hmm. And I think that investors have kind of wised up by now saying, we actually want to say in what's going on with the company. We're not just going to hand you the money with a promise that you're going to do the right thing with it. So what, what's going on? Are ICOs still a reputable alternative to IPO? There's IPO, ICO, STO, right? STO it, uh, is a uh, security uh, token. Um, what's, what is interesting and what the ICOs and STOs have brought, they have brought the additional possibilities for the founders to manage their own uh, financing grounds around the company. What do I want to raise the funds? And uh, what do I want to give out for the investors? Is it just the community token? Or is it a piece of my equity? Um, and um, ICOs, I think it's um, what it has done last year. It has definitely challenged the uh, main existing markets, stock markets, 
Nasdaq, name it, here in uh, Deutsche Börse, in, in this market, whether the ICO is going to be the alternative for the IPO, not sure, but STOs, I think, are going to challenge uh, stock exchanges more and more, because basically on one technological layer or one, of, uh, one layer of technology, you can build a whole system and still give investors the equity, give them the uh, shares, some, uh, uh, some sec forms of uh, security, and you make it tradable. Do they get voting rights as well? Yes. Sort of that, that kind of yes. Because I, I don't think a lot of IPO investors or public market investors are feeling too sore about missing yeah. those ICO investments, but considering half of those startups yeah. have just disappeared into the wind and taken the money with them. Yeah, but, but uh, if it's a security token, which is a, um, a built up like a, an equity token, for example, we do it through the nominee structure and nominee gives you the voting right, then yes, this is what you do. And those platforms can actually run the voting. So we've talked a lot about the benefits of staying private, but are there ever examples where staying private means a company misses its window to IPO or suddenly the, uh, the competition gets a lot worse and it becomes much harder? Well, look, before the um, uh, missing the window is um, when you uh, follow the uh, markets, right? When, when you follow what's happening in the, in the stock markets, you definitely miss the window if uh, companies wanted to go public, but then the dot-com boom happened. Mm -hmm. Or when 2007, 2008 happened, when this, uh, you, you missed the window. Uh, th this, is, uh, this is one thing. The second around the going public is, is again, what is the incentive or w what is the reason of the company? Do I want to raise additional capital, capital or do I want to make my shares tradable and, and get the uh, liquidity of, of the uh, companies? But I can't name a company who says specifically, I regret for uh, not going public earlier. I mean, I, th I think of Palantir as being a really good example of this. You know, if they had gone public in 2014, 15, before this big tech uh, backlash against big data and invasive privacy stuff, I think they could have had a lot more success. And instead, they stayed private, and now it's just a rat's nest that they have to deal with, and everyone thinks they're kind of this evil company. But uh, it's... Uh, it's Looking back and thinking maybe this would what have happened, and again, uh, which position do you take? Do you take the position of the uh, investors, or do you take the position of the founders? Well, I think what happens is with, when you go public, you're really forced to be judged by your, measure, your metrics, your, your actual revenues. Whereas when you're private, you get to be valued by your hype, which can be good or bad depending on how the ecosystem is swirling. But just to recap some of the awesome insights that we have from this panel, you know, these companies are trying to stay private because they want to control their valuations. Uh, that can have problems for the downstream ecosystem because there's less money being reinvested into new startups by angels. And it can hurt retention for these companies if they they don't if uh, employees feel like they're never going to get their money back they're never going to get rich uh, but startup founders want to keep control and they want to build this community surrounding them and that's why offering liquidity to their uh, employees and early investors can actually help build this crowd that will help support them and create this family for them uh, you know, there's there's always going to be companies like LinkedIn or Twitter or Google who went private a little bit too early but if you if you think about what you want to do with the, your company if you plan properly and you take the window when you have it and you instead of rushing to go public stay private for as long as you need to get your business right you're not going to see that terrible situation which you have like with snapchat where you go public and there's all that hype and then everything comes crashing down thank you guys all for watching and thank you for uh, the thanks. panel thanks
ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage TechCrunch senior writer and your Battlefield host, Anthony Ha. Hello! We have one more session of the Startup Battlefield today. You're going to see four more startups who, again, have been chosen from hundreds of applications. You're also going to see the wildcard company, which is basically chosen from the Startup Alley. They found out last night that they're going to be presenting. So that should be especially interesting. That'll be the very last startup that presents. Once again, they present for six minutes. There's going to be six minutes of Q&A. And then tonight, we're going to announce the finalist to help us choose those finalists, we've got a new set of expert judges. Let's bring them out. First up, we have Alexia Bonatzos, who's, of course, the former co-editor-in-chief of TechCrunch. Now she's the general partner of her new fund, Dream Machine, which helps exceptional founders make science fiction into nonfiction. Next, we have Sonali Duraika, partner at Excel Ventures, where she's led investments in Spotify, Wallapop, and many others. Next, we have Stefan Ganchev, partner at Launch Hub Ventures. He's also the co-organizer of Digital K, a leading European tech conference. Next, we have Zephy Hennessy Holland, a general manager at EF Berlin. Not only does he manage EF Berlin, he was part of EF's first cohort in London. And last but not least, we have Christian Meerman, founding partner at Cherry Ventures. He was also the first chief marketing officer at Zalando. Give it up for all of our judges. Woo! That means it is time to bring out our very first startup, Spike. Presenting for Spike are Ziad Amale, or sorry, Ziad Alame and Michelle Regi. I will live eight years less than you. <laughs> it's because I'm diabetic. Diabetes is, an, diabetes is an autoimmune disease that affects a person's ability to produce or react to insulin, enslaving us to a life of blood sugar management and insulin injections, like this one. Ever since my diagnosis a decade ago, I've injected myself with almost 30,000 insulin injections. But that wasn't enough. You see, the problem is I still missed more than 3,000 other injections. And I've miscalculated more than 6,000 dosages. Living with diabetes is extremely difficult because everything affects my sugar, from food, medication, activity, the stress of TechCrunch Berlin, mm -hmm. and even the weather. And although I've tried multiple apps to live better with diabetes, all they did was give me fancy tools so that I can input my behavior and my moments of shame. Well, not anymore. Introducing to you Spike, the smartest diabetes assistant in the world. Using its technology, Spike automatically monitors your behavior, routine, and vitals so that it can provide you with the perfect insulin and food suggestions. Let's jump over to the demo to see our CMO, Michelle, who is also diabetic, how Spike will help her. Michelle has been stressing about the pitch just like me. And Spike, using her heart rate and her activity, detected that she's in stress and detected she might be having a hypoglycemic moment. So she, the app asked her to, to scan her patch, which we support, to know her sugar level, to check if she's going through a hypoglycemic moment. It only takes a second. She's going to sync it. And now we can see, and now we can see on the overhead that she is indeed below the lower limit. She's 56 milligrams per deciliter, which is a, a, indeed a hypoglycemic moment. I've had sugar before I came, so I'm not going through it. She can also compare that curve to her stress, temperature around her, insulin, and even her steps, so that she can know better what's happening. Now, usually in hypoglycemic moments, diabetics go out to have food, 
And for TechCrunch, we created a special tab on Spike, which would mimic her activity of going to McDonald's. As soon as Michelle arrives to McDonald's, she would receive the top three options she can have based on her dietary restrictions and her need and her glucose level. After that, she would receive a reminder to take her insulin, her post-meal insulin injection. Let's go back to uh, presentation. As for her guardians and her doctors, they are informed in real time about her diabetic situation, receiving alerts if unusual patterns happen or if something is in deep uh, danger. Today, there are more than 2,500 daily active diabetics all around the world using Spike. And they are loving us. 87% of them transferred from other apps to use Spike. And that's not, not a surprising conversion rate because Spike is experienced differently. It changes things from doing more work to worrying less. Now, living with diabetes isn't just extremely difficult. It's 10 times more expensive. And this is why Spike is forever free for diabetics to use. And we're in talks with insurance companies, self-employed, uh, self-insured employers, and other entities who are interested in keeping you healthy. And not just healthy, but keep your productivity up. Because diabetics cost the US $90 billion a year in lost productivity. To date, we have been supported by more, by more than 10 international organizations and funded as well. And I'm proud to say that the King's College Hospital of London is our medical and research partner. But not just that. One of the largest pharmaceuticals in the world, Sanofi, has partnered with us after they saw the impact we created on diabetics' way of living with insulin. Behind Spike is a passionate team of diabetics, engineers, PhDs, and nutritionists, with more than 13 patents in the biomedical field and four, pa patents in, four papers in computer vision and AI. But we also have fun every single day. By the time I've told you about Spike, 24 people died from diabetes. 16 of them died because they didn't manage this disease properly. We could have saved them without them having to do any work by making diabetes management less diabetic. Thank you. Judges. So I can go first. Please. Unfortunately, my father passed away from diabetes. So Sorry for uh, that. No, it, I, it's a very needed. And you did really great, so you shouldn't have been stressed. You too, so thank yeah, you for that. Your stress level uh, should, uh, so yeah. should go <laughs> I guess, down. Uh, you know, in my experience, it's not just about the insulin. It is so much about behavior. Because the numbers you quoted are all about behavior change around exercise, around what you eat. So how do you make this an app that's not just about measuring input and output, and then actually trying to change behavior over time because it's a cumulative disease, as we all know. Absolutely. So we started with insulin reminders because it was the easiest way to capture diabetics and get them on board. But the long-term plan is we look at your day-to-day -day routine and we start to find slots where we can either suggest activities to you, walk this extra 10, min 10 minutes after your meal so that you can b d uh, decrease your insulin consumption or burn sugar less, uh, you know, um, sleeping patterns are very important mm -hmm. as well. Uh, there are many things that we can introduce, but as we, build, uh, as, as we build with Spike, collect data, understand it more, then we will be able to provide such kind of activities. And I totally agree with you. It's not just the insulin, it's also the behavior. Thanks. Uh, I have one question. Like, I, I see that you are wearing some kind of a patch, but like, uh, um, tell, tell us a bit more about it. Like, do you, do you, do you need... Uh, do you need to change it? Uh, I mean, uh, are, uh, do people need to, to wear it all the time? Have you considered doing a bit more fancy wearable device around it? Absolutely, or? absolutely. So uh, this patch, we didn't develop it. This isn't our patch. This is from a pharmaceutical. We support today more than 10 glucometers on the international okay. market. We've realized that we could build a glucometer, we could get it uh, into the market, but that's costly. And we don't want to restrict our market to people who can pay for our glucometer. We support this among the cheaper glucometers as well. And you don't need to input data into Spike for it to work. 
uh, many of the situations that we cover do not need your direct interaction. They would just happen, just like entering McDonald's, for example, that doesn't require any prior input. But it is good to find better ways to input data, such as this simpler way, which is just tapping your phone. So just uh, one question. First off, thank you. That was great. Um, what changed to make this possible now? Like one of the things that you said was there were all of these previous apps that never really solved the problem. Yeah. So what was it that shifted to make it now a viable thing? It was understanding that the problem doesn't happen after the incident happens. The problem happens before the incident happens. And by incident, I mean having food or missing your uh, dose or not doing your activity. So by understanding where the problem is, we were able to use current technology to start shifting or adding value to that, uh, uh, adding value to that space. I think the problem with other apps is that they were built by people who aren't really diabetics but studied diabetics. Mm. So they look at them and mm. they see, OK, the charts say that they have elevated glucose levels after they eat. Let's try to solve it after they eat. But as a diabetic and as a technical person, I realize where the problem is and where I can solve it. How I, are I you hope gonna I answered your question. Yeah. I, I have, so your main differentiation is that you're diabetics building the app, because I think Clue, their founder is also diabetic and they're building in diabetes Absolutely. management. Um, it's multiple things that make us different. The technical skills, um, the support team that we have, the VCs that have invested in us who are also in the healthcare industry. <laughs> All that aside, uh, a patent pending on our technology of situation detection. All that aside, we have a vested interest that I personally feel obligated to fulfill. The reason I started Spike is because I was going through a downtime in my uh, diabetic life. And I quit being the CTO of one of the largest crowdfunding platforms in the MENA region, uh, in the, in the MENA region to find ways to live better and help other people not reach the stage I've reached. Um, I, I love it that they are as well doing something to manage diabetes, but we will not sleep as Spike before we get a solution out there. And I guess this dedication sets that support. You also have a very good name. <laughs> uh, it comes from the pain of sugar spikes. <laughs> and what is your growth strategy? So how are you going to do user acquisition? What has worked so far in the past? How are you going to grow from 2,500 users to you know, 500,000, a million, Fantastic. even more? Um, so today the numbers are uh, around between 8,000 and 9,000 total users, of which 2,500, more than 2,500 are daily actives who mm -hmm. cross the 14-day drop-off period that usually healthcare apps face. So that's on a side note. Uh, we've been to date growing organically by word of mouth. When we first launched app, it was to be tested among a few diabetics. You can count them on hand. And then surprisingly, those diabetics started talking. And diabetes is a topic that you talk about. Mm. So we plan on having offline and online communities. That's one. Two, we also plan, and that's a defensibility strategy on uh, what keeps us uh, apart from having competitors come in. Uh, but two, it's also our partners, our distribution partners. Uh, there's uh, pharmaceuticals, which we have, insurance companies, which they will force, but also we have online uh, portals for, 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 for doctors like uh, Cree uh, in Sweden. We can also use them because part of their problem as well is how do you get to have more visibility uh, yeah. for patients. Uh, so through, peop th through places where diabetics actually exist, we will be there at that moment. Mm -hmm. All right, give it up for Spike. Thank you. Woo. Next up, we have Imago AI. Presenting for Imago AI are Abhishek Goyal and Shweta Gupta. Come on out. Hi, everyone. By 2050, we need to feed 2 billion more people. And yet, every year, $1.3 trillion of food is wasted due to substandard seeds, yes. disease, and non-optimized practices. For seed manufacturing companies, determining the quality parameters of their uh, trades is critical for plant breeding. Phenotyping make it possible for these companies to develop new types of seeds by looking at these quality parameters, such as disease severity of crop, length of fruit, pericarp thickness, etc. 
companies can make key breeding decisions. Plant breeding is a very costly and complex process. It takes around six to eight years to develop a new improved seed variety. Currently, conventional methods used to determine these quality parameters are laborious, time-consuming, and inaccurate. Handled instruments such as scales, vernal calipers, threads, and even mechanical sorters introduce human bias, which decreases precision. Introducing Imago AI. Imago AI proprietary technology does autonomous quality parameter assessment of agri-food products by just clicking an image. With high throughput precision phenotyping, we reduce phenotyping time by 75%, increase seed hybrid selection accuracy, and inform key decision-making parameters, increasing genetic gain. Hence, the phenotypic data collected through our softwares help these companies to produce better quality of seeds in lesser time. So imagine a rice breeder who is trying to figure out which crops to breed next, because this season, crops have lots of disease. So let's move to demo. Here, the breeder wants to measure the disease severity for his plants. So he takes photos of his multiple plants. So these are the field images directly taken from the rice field. And then he enters his field information. And here, what you are seeing is AI system calculating exact disease severity percentage of each and every individual leaf, and even highlighting the symptoms of disease tissues just by yellow color. Back to presentation, please. Breeder can also do time series analysis <coughs> on top of the result. So our platform provides information on disease severity, progression of disease, and the likelihood of infection for future plants from the same set of seeds. Hence, by establishing this parameter, breeder is now enabled with the information to better breed and select next batch of seeds. Next slide, please. So our defensible technology is built with AI, computer vision, and machine learning. So our AI is built with thousands of images collected from the crop field and is self-learning in nature. Our technology is independent of image capturing methods. Either it is by handle devices, or by drones, or by hyperspectral satellite imagery, even to predict yield in advance. Talking about the competition, ImageJ does phenotyping by pulling the produce from the ground for just few phenotypic traits, which is not sufficient for complete phenotyping and even ask for the manual selection of the plants. And human taking measurement introduced bias, and even some of the traits are beyond hu human capability to measure precisely. Imago AI provide accurate, completely automated, and in-field and real-time solution. Within the seed industry, the market size is more than $10 billion. In fact, last year, a multi-billion dollar seed company did two million field trials, where they have to measure the quality parameters of millions of plants. While our initial target is for the seed companies, Imago AI is also used by the food industry to measure their quality parameters. And the AI industry in this sector is moving at a CAGR of 42% from 2017 to 2022. We have already onboarded world's three largest seed companies, which control 40% of the global market share. DuPont Pioneer is one of our recurring paid clients. We are already learning six paid pilot with companies like Basif. We are in the talks with Microsoft for potential partnership. On the business model, we charge yearly license fee along with the variable fee per image processed by our technology. We have experienced computer vision and AI specialists as our core team from IITs and Google 
with more than 50 years of combined experience. We also have complementary mentorships of agri-food experts from multi-billion dollar companies. So seed processing companies and food manufacturing companies looking for AI-enabled quality parameter assessment go to Imago AI today and save millions of dollars. Thank you. All right, judges. So how much, if I can go first, how, how much uh, do you need to do to train your AI across all of the seed types and across the disease types? I'm sure there's a more technical term, but I have no idea yeah. what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> so that's a very interesting question. So in general, in AI community, it takes around thousands of images to build models. But we take less than 50 images to build models. So our technology is very, very less data hungry. Mm -hmm. And this is a super advantage to us. Why? Because practically to collect thousands of images from the fields, it's a, become a separate project for these companies. So this is a, one of the reasons the companies want to uh, entertain with us. That's impressive, okay. Can you talk a little bit about what are the reasons why some of the customers that you've tried to mm -hmm. close have said no? So what are the things that they want that you haven't been able to offer? Because like, it seems like the traction's great so far, so I'm curious about why people said no. Uh, so, like, uh, so most of the companies with whom we, uh, we have already done pilot, so uh, we have 100% success ratio from converting them to pi from pilot to our paying clients. Uh, so the companies uh, who are basically saying no, so uh, like they are basically operating at a small scale, and they can easily employ cheap human labor to do that stuff. That is the only reason that they won't, don't want to use our technology. But otherwise, we haven't really faced that sort of thing. And how fragmented is the kind of different customers? Like, are there a few big players in the market, and that's it, or? Okay, so uh, there are big MNCs, companies like DuPont Pioneer, Besef and all, and then there are mid medium level companies, like, uh, so we have done pilots with two major Indian seed companies, Maiko and BioSeeds, so they are mid-level companies. Then there are uh, small companies, so we are not targeting them, so we are just in talks with yes. big and medium level. And how many different seed types or crops do you offer right now? So we saw a rise in the, in the example, and, and I think a few others, so... How many do you have now, and how long does it take to onboard more and to, to go broader in, in your assortment in that sense? Right. Uh, so uh, it doesn't really take us any time to train our model. So within a week, we can uh, make live a solution for any particular crop or any particular trait. So uh, as the demand comes from the user, we train our models. So uh, that's not really an issue. But we already have covered a couple of vegetables and field crops based on the demand that we have. Mm -hmm. Isn't one of the biggest challenges in ag tech AI the application of the models on variable soil types? Like, like you make a model and then the soil and the environment's constantly changing. So what is the utility after you've phenotyped a plant? What ends up being the, the real solution? Yeah. So, uh, so uh, the plant breeding, so this is a process which helps these companies to develop new variety of seeds. And the most critical step in plant breeding is this phenotyping. Phenotyping is basically measuring different parameters related to plant growth development, so, but most of the companies are doing it manual. So as an AI, so we are helping them to automate, becoming more e efficient and optimized. So the last pilot we did by one of the company, we reduced their phenotyping time from two days to just 30 minutes. So that amount of scale we are talking about. So uh, in addition to that, I would like to mention, so uh, this phenotypic traits, the data collected through our software, this helps the companies in decision making. And plant breeding is all about decision making, which two seed varieties we need to breed now so that we can have a resultant seed variety which has all the desired traits. So what, it's all about decision making. What is the price point for the SaaS to someone like DuPont? So uh, it's totally customizable product based on the demand of the client. So there can be a number of different rates. So uh, the price range would vary from a minimum of $40,000. It can go up to $1,50,000 and millions of dollars, depending upon the uh, importance of that particular trait and how difficult it is to capture that. And within the, uh, within the same seed company, we run different pilots for different divisions, like research division, uh, food and manufacturing division, packaging division, quality and assurance division. So our technology has application in multiple divisions within the same seed company. Do you need to prove any sort of ROI when you're selling? Are they saying, okay, how do they test it out before they decide to roll it out? What does kind of a proof of concept look like? Okay, uh, so uh, basically initially we do a pilot with them. So the pilot lasts a minimum of 10 days to one month. 
And uh, during that pilot, they check the efficiency. So as she already mentioned with, a, with one of our other clients, uh, so they uh, earlier took two days to phenotype the product, but using yeah. our software, 30 minutes. And so. on the accuracy side, uh, with the pilots, we have already achieved 99% accuracy. Very and still impressive. robust. What is it specifically about the technology that allows you to train on such a small data set, which then also doesn't um, leave the problem that someone else can just come along, take an equally small data set, and then make a copycat? So, yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, in fact, that is one of our secret sauce. Uh, but given an idea, so we are combining deep learning power with Bayesian programming, and we are able to handle uncertainties in the model in better way with lesser number of images, so making it more robust and less data hungry. Mm. I'm telling you, this is very, very important point for, for these agriculture and food companies because they don't have such exactly. huge amount of images. Mm. And is that, is that patented? the technology behind it, or what's the? So we're in the process of applying to that. Okay, cool. Where's the engineering team, or what's the background? So I'm from AI background with six years of experience. And, uh, and I handle the business and strategy part. The Got it. Business right. Strategy. All right, one more round of applause for Imago AI. Thank you, guys. Next up, we have Relay. Presenting for Relay are Michael Hearn and Max Goisa. Come on out. Crypto prices are tanking, yep. <laughs> but blockchain adoption is on the rise. Bringing companies on the blockchain is expected to be a $60 billion market within the next five years. Companies will switch from SaaS to decentralized services. Companies will tokenize their equity to make their companies more liquid. Bringing companies on the blockchain, uh, companies adopt blockchain because it is a because there's no other platform that allows for such an efficient way to manage value. And that is affecting the company's bottom line. By adopting blockchain, companies can also in increase how they collect and acquire data. Data is the lifeblood of many companies. But instead of having to collect it yourself or purchase it from someone, you can now crowdsource it. Crowdsourcing data means that the company orders the data and then is fulfilled by competing data providers who write the data directly into the company's database. For crowdsourcing data, you do not need developers. It is much cheaper and much faster than collecting the data yourself or purchasing it from someone. But it requires novel infrastructure that not every company is able to build. They may require blockchain developers that they not have. They may require more budget. That's all reasons why crowdsourcing is difficult for companies to adopt. Enter Relay. Relay is an open source framework that turns an empty database into a crowdsourced data set. With Relay, we are building Braintree for the new data economy. Let's switch to the demo and see how simple it is to crowdsource data with Relay. For this demo, we assume that we are an investment fund, and we would like to have sustainability data about publicly listed company to see if we can generate alpha from it. So let's start a new project via the Relay framework and see this from scratch. We first select a data storage. So we're initializing Relay. The first thing we do is we initialize uh, a data storage. And here, this is where we wanted data delivered to be into. This can be almost any database. Right? This can be your Postgres. This can be your data warehouse. This can be your Slack channel if you want it to be. But here we'll go with Near4j. The next thing we select is a ledger storage. This is through which we will reward the data providers. Again, this can be almost any ledger solution. But here we'll go with Ethereum. Lastly, we are specifying the schema, what kind of data we would like to be receiving. Um, for this demo, we already provided the template, which you can see here. Now, we can switch to the next window and see that the Relay framework deployed our database. It connected our database. It deployed our smart contracts for rewarding and 
it started the relay instance, which is managing everything. It manages the data quality as well as the payouts. Now, let's move to the next window where we see the data now coming in into our database that we just requested. We have two data streams. Um, and these data streams can be provided by almost anyone. For example, these could be uh, undergrad college students who adapt one of their school scripts to provide us with the data and make some money. Here we see how much reward they receive for doing the job. We see that the upper one is rewarded almost twice as much as the bottom one. And that is because the upper one is providing us with more and higher quality data. Before blockchain, crowdsourcing data was impossible because with, real, with fiat, we cannot incentivize and reward people in the light of strong information asymmetries, as we have it here. But now that we have blockchain, we created with Relay a blockchain-enabled semantic data structure that is almost as simple as JSON and that anyone can use to receive and request data into almost any database via almost any ledger. We see Relay in the market of blockchain services that right now is a $700 million market, but expected to grow by almost 100x within the next five years. And it's truly cross-sector. It is going from energy to finance to um, consumers and competitors. We have competitors. Competitors are Dirt and Computable, mm -hmm. um, who are about to enter the space. But we are ahead with a working product and paying customers. We pivoted recently to now fully focus on our crowdsource framework. Right now, we're onboarding two new paying customers a month in the finance and the curation market space. But we expect those numbers to double in Q1. Um, we're operating as a service business right now, um, charging half of the price that what companies would need to pay if they would build it all themselves, which gives us low five to low six-figure deals. And we usually de deliver working solutions within days for those companies. But we're also exploring software licenses, platform models, and venture building. If your company needs data, and you are thinking about collecting the data yourself, or purchasing a data set or data access, then go to relay.com and crowdsource that data set. Thank you. Judges. Uh, I'll go first. I just, uh, I just want to understand why, why do you need the blockchain? Don't you, can, can't you just have uh, like a normal, uh, let's say, legacy incentivization method for, for your data? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, the main reason for using blockchain here is uh, that you want to do something with monetary value attached to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for that, blockchain currently is one of the cheapest ways for a company to integrate it versus getting a banking licenses, managing the balances of the providing uh, community members themselves. Like their blockchain really is a viable solution. So but it's a simplification in a way. Yeah. But right. why would you need a banking license for that, right? So it's, if you look at how do kind of market research companies do it and incentivize end users, they give them whatever, bonus points or, or cash back, whatever. So I think there are other forms that are already working, right? So. I mean, uh, that was like if you were to make it really simple for the users, manage the balances. Yes, there are other traditional software as a service companies, mm -hmm. but uh, there it traditionally has been shown that, uh, or our experience from customers has been that the trust uh, of the community members is pretty low. And hey, will I actually be able to exchange that for monetary value? Versus here, you can actually get tokens, you can trade on a free market, and in, in the end, exchange for real cash. So I'm actually invested, believe it or not, in something that is adjacent. I'm an investor in True Story, and I also saw Dirt. Uh, I think there's something here. What data sets do you think this is most useful for? Yeah, so I was working before I did Relay at a venture capital firm where we tried to predict the success of startups. And we had a massive problem taking our prototypes to production because there wasn't any data available for you know, startups and their founders. right? We couldn't purchase it. It was difficult to scrape it and collect it. And we also tried to hire interns right, or use Mechanical Turk to do it. But none of those solutions worked for the scale that we were you know, interested in. And so the project failed because of the access to data. And I think in, in finance, um, 
VC especially potentially um, when you do some quant stuff. This could be really, really interesting. But we see in the blockchain space also like doing this for, for art and uh, sustainability data and many other things. And where are your tokens trading? What exchanges? So uh, yeah, uh, we don't current. We don't have an issue ourselves. We uh, launch. We are also not building our own network. We are helping uh, companies like True Story actually build those protocols. Okay, True Story specifically. No, not True not Story, story specifically, specifically okay. but like <laughs> True Story. <laughs> okay. And and who are you usually selling to? Mm. So if you go to a customer, I mean the product is more you know with a developer front end, but uh, but I assume the sale goes more towards a business or commercial person. So what's your entry point if you want to make a sell, and, and then how does it go down in the organization? Yeah, right now we're exploring two routes. The first is finance. Um, the, the, the clients we can't disclose, but it's usually companies that want to get a data edge or information edge. Um, the second one is in the creation market space. And here it is also about like defining like data standards. So for example, if you're talking to uh, Aragon or Colony, right, they have similar data uh, properties in the um, decentralized management space of, of people. Um, and you want to have standards for, for those data so they become interoperable. And that is something that, that we're exploring as well. Mm -hmm. How does this become anything other than like a race to the bottom with regards to the kind of prices that you guys will pay out for data in the long run with other people entering the market? Um, we, we see first ourselves as a framework, right? Um, so this is completely free. Um, in the long term, we may provide a network through which data providers come come on and then provide various clients um, with data, right, for which they get rewarded. Um, but here it is expected that it's a race to the bottom. But this is not our problem, right? This is the token of the company, and um, it, this is essentially the benefit of why it is so much cheaper to crowdsource data than collect it yourself or purchase the data set. So what do you think the long term enduring use cases are? If you think about, is it finance? Is it only finance? What do you think where you'll really be able to kind of create some sort of a moat? Um, I also think that we have not explored this at all right now, but uh, we think that every company needs access to some data, for example, leads um, or BI or other stuff that you potentially want to just crowdsource, like you know, a rather query of what companies are in that space here in Germany, for example, instead of hiring an analyst that you know, spends a week uh, finding those companies. Have you any sense of cost efficiency? How they do it today versus back to the kind of, yeah. do you need blockchain to do this? Uh, we're, also, we're also really interested in how, how this can work out, but I, especially if the data is already available, if someone has already a data store or, or data set of, of companies, um, it can be provided super, super cheap within seconds um, because it can distribute it many, many times, and especially if there's a market of many data providers, those costs will dramatically go down. I think there's, I mean, it can be really, really a lot cheaper than if you hire an analyst. Uh, also, to add, uh, to add onto that, uh, the blockchain part as a ledger solution is completely optional. You could also, uh, yesterday, okay. Amazon announced a yeah. product for a non-blockchain ledger, which could okay, work so very could well for that. a lot of enterprises. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, give it up for Relay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's bring out our next startup, Coup. Presenting for Coup are Alexandre Merrigan and Miles Scher. Do you know the first thing I do in the morning? I immediately reach for my phone. <laughs> 10 hours. That's the average time US adult spends in front of screens every day. The most time spent in front of screens are on social media because picture, video, and text are heavily screen-based formats. Audio, however, is the only format we can consume without a screen. But the most social media content we consume today is all produced within 24 hours. And there's no modern equivalent that fits this consumption pattern when it comes to audio. Until now, introducing Ku, a audio-based social network that lives in your pocket. Move to demo. Ku let users consume a continuous stream of bite-sized one-minute audio content in a story-like format. Users follow brands, friends, and celebrities creating their own personal audio feed. 
Every 24 hours, your feed resets. This way, users consume fresh and up-to-date content every day. This is your feed. Your feed consists of the people you follow. And let's see what our internal production crew facts have to say. Crew facts. They sleep up to 18 hours per day. Their diet is high in toxins and very low in nutrition. And they smell like cough drops. Did the koala just become your new spirit animal? Uh, let's hope not. That's Miles minimized the player and tossed it away so he can explore other parts of the apps, of the apps like our hashtags. Hashtags is our way of curating content on the platform. And they could be anything from topics like sports to challenges like rap battle or a cappella. Being new on a social network, you rarely have anything to consume. This is why we have created the Daily Host. The Daily Host is a known content creator that anyone can listen into. This way, users can find new content and people to follow on the platform. But Ku is also about creating your own content, which you can do in the recorder. And of course, we love your voice. But to spice things up, you can add sound stickers, like a drum roll or a laughter. Let's see if Miles here can create a coup. That's good. Hey, TechCrunch, Miles here. Did you know that koalas can run faster than rabbits? Oh my god. <laughs> Miles can also write a caption and tag his friends. Then Miles can pose the coup. Hey, TechCrunch, Miles here. Did you know that koalas can run faster than rabbits? But the primary use case of Koo is actually this. When your screen is locked, when you're riding a bike, cleaning a room, or commuting to work. Back to presentation. Social networks like Snapchat and Instagram are interactive because it's easy to create. They're social, so you can stay up to date with your friends, but they're not passive, so you must use a screen to use them. Audio streaming services like music or podcast, they are not interactive. It's really hard to create content. They're not social, but they are however passive, so you can use, it, use them in your pocket. Crew is interactive, it's social, and it's passive. Crew lets users share their life through voice, which can take away the insecurities that often comes with photo or video. This can take away, take away body shaming from social networks and hopefully improve people, and especially teenagers' mental health. 124 million people listen to podcasts in the US today, and marketers are also moving towards this, this trend, showing a $256 million spent on podcast advertising. Interesting, though, is that 49% consume podcasts at home, and 22% consume it in the car. This shows us that people need to schedule time in their busy day to consume a podcast. Who wants to fit in to the spontaneous consumption pattern, whether people have five minutes or an hour? A social network is only as valuable as its community. And that's what we are focusing on right now. And to build our community, we are partnering with YouTube creators that are local to create highly engaged communities YouTube creators are also very easy to identify with. We can help inspire our users to create their own content on the platform. We're also finalizing a partnership with one of the biggest record labels in the world, which will allow us to add one minute music into the platform. We're also looking at voice integration or voice assistant integration to our platform so you can use it with your favorite Amazon Alexa or completely without a screen. We're also really intrigued by the idea of geolocation of coups. So you can place them at restaurants, museums, or events, creating a form of augmented audio reality or a world of audio. The team sits together in Stockholm and it, com it's, uh, it's consists of new, new, uh, users, it consists of um, our team with numerous successful products under their belt. Back to demo, please. 
We don't have a lot of time, so you may just want to have your closing thought. Yeah, exclusively seconds. here for Tech Run This Stuff Berlin, we have created a hashtag on the platform so you can download the app and share your voice stories from the conference. <laughs> nice work. All right, judges, who has questions? So don't, don't you think that uh, you know, you know, in, in certain geographies and to certain age groups, this will just turn into a new conversational uh, way of like uh, interacting rather than just consuming uh, content like the way we do with Instagram, for example? Was let's like a new version of push to talk or something. A new version of push to talk? Yeah. Uh, well, the difference between Ku is that it's not a messaging platform. Yeah, 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 but yeah. don't you think that the users can, can start of turning, the, turning the user into the... Of course. Uh, we tried to make the app as simple as possible because we want to see how people are you know, behaving with this new format because it's completely different from what they're used to. And that's why we, we're actually launching on stage right now. So that's what we're figuring out as you know, coming the next 30 days. So I've got a competitor. I'm an investor in TTYL. Yeah. Dude, they are AirPods as a platform, short form uh, voice messages. Uh, I, f I have so many questions. My, <laughs> so many. Uh, my first one is you said uh, that because of voice, you can avoid uh, shame and you can, you can kind of uh, be yourself. Yeah. Do you think most people like the sound of their own voice? That, that's the thing. I thought that too. I was like, right? okay, my voice is not that good. <laughs> but then I went to different high schools in Alabama and I talked to the teenagers there and they all started like trying out the platform and creating. And the best part of that was three girls that came up to me after my presentation and said, it's so nice to find not have to show my face. And that meant a lot to me. By the way, your voice is great. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Have you, had, have you got any too, users at the moment? Do you have any users at all at the moment or any usage history? I don't know. I saw three guys signing up today. So okay. <laughs> today's day one. Yeah, I had like three guys, 20-something. They were pretty cool. Yeah, okay. they signed up. But we had from our test with the, with the yeah. teenagers, everyone on the schools uh, signed up to test the app. And um, they were like uh, six, 628, I think. Did they continue using it? Yeah, they continued using it because we launched the, the today's host, and they all had listed into that. But we held her off so we could launch it here uh, to you guys. Congratulations, that's a great name. But what's your hypothesis of who the real core users will be? You always need that set of users who love it, who live off it, who tell people about it. Who do you think that user group is? Yeah. Teenage girls? Personally, I think it's going to be teenage girls or teenagers in general. Um, I think a lot of girls are feeling like, finally, I can get heard okay. instead of getting seen. You also mentioned it was passive. You, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you probably have to open the app. If you're on your yeah. AirPods and you're getting the messages, you probably have to open the app and keep it running. Today? Today. I but give me, give me four weeks and you can just say, hey, Siri, play my cool feed. But how do you overcome the problem? If you compare yourself with you know, Instagram, Facebook, and so on, that you can consume kind of while you're in a meeting or you're just bored in a situation and you just scroll through versus here you need to kind of, you know, put it on loud or have it on your headphones. So you need to pay 100% attention and you can't do it in parallel to other stuff, right? So that could be an issue of users not really using you because they always need to have a setting where they can play sound. Yeah, I think it's the other way around actually. Because if, if you're in work or if you're in a meeting and you want to check your social networking feeds, it's going to look pretty weird, you know, because you're scrolling through your Instagram. Uh, but many people don't take away their AirPods. Uh, and you can consume... Oh, so you would sit in the meeting and then just <laughs> listen through Maybe. your AirPods? I want to be I would, I would, I wouldn't I'm not prefer, sure that's so good. I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Hey, you should pay attention uh. to the meeting. But if you're sitting and working, you can consume audio, which is pretty much what everybody does today. Because mm -hmm. everyone, or not everyone, but a lot of people have, oh, okay. have uh, AirPods. Yeah. 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 Do you think it matters for your target user group? As in, like, do you think that your target user group of teenage girls or teenagers will suffer from the issue that Christian brought up? Yeah, since um, they did a wild, wide study of teenagers and screens, and they, they spend like nine hours in front of screens each day, 
Um, and 52% want to quit or wants to lower the time they spend in front of screens. But they don't know how to do that, because basically closing your screen is like shutting a door to your whole social life. And bringing the social experience to audio, showing teenagers that you can still remain digital connected while enjoying the world around you is what we're trying to do. Yeah, but don't you think that the people can uh, need to detach in general from, from being too, too much time connected? Yeah, of course. Um, but studies also show that should you have screen time or no screen time, we should probably have it like somewhere in the middle. It's all balance, and we're trying to help that. So we're not saying quit screen. We're saying we want to lower your screen time that you spend. All right, one more round of applause for Ku. <laughs> Thank you. There is one final startup presenting today. That is our wild card startup, Legacy. As a reminder, they found out yesterday evening they were presenting. But at the same time, we've had wild card companies that have won the entire competition. So this could be amazing. Let's bring out Legacy. Presenting, presenting for Legacy is Khalid Kateli. All right. All right. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Say hello. Hello. So it's worth it. Nice to meet you. Even in the six minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am here to talk to you about legacy. My name is Khaled, and for the next five minutes and 40 seconds, I'm going to talk about assets, investments, and deposits without ever referring to the financial industry. That's because legacy is the only life investment you'll make. In the past 40 years, male fertility has gone down by half. Infertility affects about one in seven couples around the globe. It's pretty sobering when you think about it. And maybe, like most people, you think about fertility as a women's issue. And if you do, you're wrong. 30 to 50% of the time, when a couple can't have a child, it's the man. And in fact, as a man, every year you get older, the quality of your sperm declines. Now, here's a quick question. Do you have a mobile phone? Where do you keep it? Because I keep mine right here. But it's okay, I already legacied. It's not just cell phone radiation you have to be worried about. It's smoking, drinking, drugs, pollution, antihistamines, cancer, diabetes, obesity, the list goes on. Now, we are facing plummeting birth rates across the globe. This is not a local issue. America just announced the lowest birth rate in the last 30 years was 2018. In Europe, the average birth rate is 1.55 babies per woman. To even maintain a population size, you need to be at 2.1. And in China, the number one most looked up term on Baidu, their Google, is fertility. Legacy is the solution to the fertility crisis. We are the first company focused on the consumer experience of testing and then freezing men's most valuable assets. I'm going to show you the product we've developed very quickly. So it's designed to do a couple of things. So first of all, it's designed to look beautiful, which it does. When you open it up, this is the kit that we actually send to our clients to their homes. They never meet with a physician. They never have to go to a clinic. They get this at home. There's a beautiful personalized note inside with some information about our core values as a company. Privacy, quality, security. Inside, you have two objects. One is the deposit cup. The other is called a buffering medium, which helps keep the sample viable for up to 48 hours. So we then pick it up from your home, transport it to our partner clinics, who then test it, analyze it, and if needed, freeze it. Let's go back to the slides. So the team blends this unique mix of business, healthcare, and fertility <coughs> expertise. So I'm the CEO. I studied business at McGill University. I studied policy at Harvard University. I'm certified by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, the Canadian Fertility and Andrology Society, and I was a healthcare consultant for several years, but don't hold that against me. I work with Daniel Madero, the head of clinic partnerships, who actually ran the largest fertility clinic in Colombia with his family for five years before working with startups at MIT and Harvard. Now, in the short term, we see an immediate addressable market of $8 billion in the United States alone. Longer term, when we look at the EU and the US, we're looking at $180 billion plus, and I'll break that down very quickly. And I don't want to get too distracted by the bigger chunks. I'm just going to focus on that tiny little one at the very bottom. That's men in the US aged 20 to 49 with household incomes of $70,000 or more. These are people who can afford to pay for the product. That's an $8 billion market right there. 
But when we look at the whole US, when we consider the EU, that's about $180 billion. And that's because we believe that every man who can should be testing and freezing his sperm. Now, it's not the size of the market, but it's how you penetrate it. And the customers might be men, but we actually, in many ways, focus on their partners. So we do direct to consumer. We target a lot of men in professional services. Consultants, lawyers, bankers, I know this field very well. These are people with high salaries, high stress, and yes, they want to have children, but maybe not right now. More interestingly, we target a lot to their partners. So all of us know that women are the chief medical officers of the household. And that's why actually a lot of our targeting is to the female partners of men who also compare this to egg freezing, which is costly, $10,000. It's expensive, it requires surgery, and it requires weeks of hormone therapy. So these are the people who will eventually convince men that yes, you should be thinking about your fertility, not just me. And finally, there's 250 companies in the United States that already offer fertility benefits. Now, Legacy will someday be part of, this, of those employee benefits and off those fertility benefits. It'll be part of the package that is offered from all forward-looking companies. Now, we do have some indirect competitors, sperm banks, very focused on donation. Clinics, terrible consumer experience, and you have to go to the clinic. Trust me, not fun. And we have some companies that do fertility testing, incredibly emasculating branding. Now, look, we're testing two models right now. One's bundled, analysis and freezing together. One's unbundled, just the analysis. This is allowing us to test which model is going to work better. And ultimately, we are going to be like 23andMe, Hims, and Roman that took topics that you have never thought about before. Genetic analysis, hair loss, and when was the last time you talked about erectile dysfunction in public? But these are companies that change their industries. And I say this not just because I love sperm freezing jokes, but because in the future, legacy will be the norm. Thank you. Okay, judges. Well, in this, in this uh, kind of industry, the, the, the first question that comes into our mind is always yeah. privacy. So mm. how do you solve that? You are asking one of my favorite questions in the world because I Sorry. live and breathe <laughs> privacy. And frankly, I think one of the things that most companies have done so wrong is taking consumer data, repackaging it, selling it to pharma companies, exactly. who then develop products that they then sell back to us. So we as consumers are getting hit three times. So privacy is actually one of our core values. It's the very first core value. We take privacy extremely seriously. But what is the service around it? So kind of like when you get your results, mm -hmm. is yeah. it just a piece of paper or like an email and then it tells yeah. you, hey, your, your sperm is bad? Or does I it like make sense <laughs> to have a doctor involved? I like that obviously. question because when you go to a clinic, they give you this report that makes absolutely no sense, mm -hmm. right? Your normal range is between 1 and 926 and you're at 925. Is that good? Is that bad? We don't know. So we take results that are produced clinically, and we turn those into something that you can understand. So we tell you your motility, which is you know, what percentage of your sperm is actually swimming forward, for example. Your motility is good. It's in this percentile range. And then we actually give personalized lifestyle recommendations. So we've scoured. We've studied over 100 studies, taken all that data. And we then use that to tell you, hey, if you stop smoking, because you told us you smoke five times a day, it's probably going to boost your quality by X percent. Do you need any kind of medical certification? Are you a medical device? Do you need a telemedicine interaction at all? No. No, so we, we, so we as Legacy do not. We partner with clinics that are fully certified, of course, under the necessary state law, country law, whatever that may be. But they, of course, have all the certification to be conducting the tests of the assets. Okay, but can you give advice yeah. even without that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Why now? Mm -hmm. Like, what changed to make this possible? June 25, 2017, so I've had this idea for years, but I knew that it was missing that, that one thing. Because how do you tell a guy, hey, by the way, have you ever thought about uh, your fertility? A meta-study came out, 185 different studies on male fertility came out, and that's where I got that statistic, a 50 to 60% decline in the fertility of Western men. That's why now, and in fact, you'll see over the last six months, and we were in a number of these, the New York Times wrote about it, TechCrunch wrote about it, Forbes, GQ, Guardian, Independent, list goes on. So was it that previously yeah. consumers didn't know it was a problem, therefore there was no demand, there so were, no one there built was, the company? Yeah. Yes. So there, there were a lot yeah. of piecemeal mm. pieces of data here and there, and I had known the field well enough to know it was an issue. Okay. But it's difficult to communicate, oh, but smoking will affect you by 3%, and drinking will affect you by 5%, and you should drop your coke habit. So. <laughs> Don't go into saunas. Yeah. 
Actually, yes, unless you don't want to have children, in which case, do go into saunas. All right, so I'm not invested in a competitor to this. Yep. Um, <laughs> I've, yeah. I, I've got a, some feedback on your, your setup of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there is a decline in male fertility, but yep. the dec decline in birth rate is because of contraception and women's education yep. and women's participation mm -hmm. in the workforce. Yeah. So people yep. predict that the number of children 15 years from now will be static. Mm -hmm. And many people argue this is a good thing. <laughs> So do you, do you think that we should be bringing <laughs> more people into the world in the West? Or? I actually think about this question a lot. And to yeah. go back to your question about privacy, I think a lot about I want to build an ethical company. And there's a very real question, which is, should we be bringing more children into the world? Yeah, is this eugenics? Like, are we just bringing Correct. rich people into the world? And so threefold. Yes. Uh, number one, on the eugenics front, we don't deal with anything relating to modification of the samples that are frozen. Uh, number two is that we, um, in terms of birth rates, so the way that we see it is most men won't need to use their deposits. But there will be maybe 1%, 2%, 5% that will be desperately trying to have a child, and we will be able, able to give them that opportunity back. So I don't think it'll significantly affect the birth rate. And just on your last point on societal changes, absolutely, but we're seeing more and more couples having children later. So the average age of a mother at first time in New York or San Francisco is 30 and 31. What that means is you have older fathers older mothers, and that has a compounding effect on your ability to have kids. What is your geographic target market? So yeah. where are you starting, and how do you want to expand? Because I assume it's you know, regulatory-wise different yeah. country by country. Yeah. So right now, our focus is very much on the United States. Mm -hmm. But actually, I see a lot of potential in terms of regional expansion. So the Middle East, where I grew up, it's a very sensitive topic, but one that is incredibly important. And actually, some theorize that the Middle East has the highest rates of male infertility in the world in a part of the world which actually cares a lot about passing on the family name, and we know that's sexist, but that is the case. Uh, and so there's, it's a very deeply emasculating component, which is why privacy is so important to us. It should be a client's decision to share that they're a legacy client. And where do you currently stand? So you launched already, or? Yes, we've launched. Yes. And how many customers do you yeah. have? So I don't want to talk about number of customers, but rather I want to talk about number of conversations, okay. because I have had I'm not exaggerating when I say over a thousand conversations about male fertility already. This is what I live and breathe. I won't say eat and drink because that'd be a little strange. Uh, but we have a lot of interest from men who are thinking about doing it. The challenge that I face, so if I think about the longer term, which is how do you turn legacy into a social norm? Something that you do by the time you do, by the time you turn 30, the same way you might buy life insurance or you know, house insurance, whatever that might be. Uh, and this is a multi-month process. So we have a huge pipeline of men who will get to this point. Isn't that the key, is to make it something people talk about? Because yes. mm. all other subscription yeah. businesses we've been involved in, people tell their friends, that's how it grows. Mm. Otherwise, the cost of marketing is too high. Yes. So you've got to really figure out how to make the privacy of that yeah. in one way positive, but also in one way something that you want to share. It's not easy. So I'm working on an idea right now, and maybe you can all give me collectively feedback. I would love to be able to categorize men's sperm if it's good quality. So if you have very fast swimmers, maybe you're the Michael Phelps of sperm. Uh, maybe they're very fast, maybe they're the Usain Bolt. And this is something that is a little funny, a little quirky, because otherwise the brand is really quite serious, but something where a guy might actually tell his friends, hey, did you know I'm the uh, Usain Bolt of sperm? Uh. <laughs> and on that note, yes. one more round of applause for Legacy. Thank you very much. And that wraps up the startup battlefield for today. Check on TechCrunch tonight. We're going to be announcing the finalists. Of course, before we do that, we have to choose the finalists. The judges are going to follow me backstage, and we're going to do that right now. Before we do, though, let's hear it one more time for our awesome judges. All right, thank you for an amazing day one. Uh, we have an amazing day two planned for you as well. And there is also an after party tonight at Watergate. The information should be on a screen shortly. There it is. Uh, hope to see you there. And I hope to just get a touch more enthusiasm from you tomorrow. I'm gonna come and bring it and lay it all on the floor for you. So let's just work on it. Cause I don't wanna feel disappointed again. Thanks again. <laughs> you guys are great. I lied.